Ashet Audio presents Hitch 22, a memoir, written and read by Christopher Hitchens, featuring a special conversation with the author. I open this memoir with three little epigraphs. The first is from W. H. Auden's poem, Death's Echo. The desires of the heart are as crooked as corkscrews. Not to be born is the best for man. The second best is a formal order. The dance's pattern. Dance while you can. Dance, dance, for the figure is easy. The tune is catching and will not stop. Dance till the stars come down with the rafters. Dance, 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 till you drop. Then, in some contrast, from Richard Dawkins's wonderful book, Unweaving the Rainbow. We are going to die, and that makes us the lucky ones. Most people are never going to die because they're never going to be born. The potential people who could have been here in my place, but who will in fact never see the light of day, outnumber the sand grains of the Sahara. Certainly those unborn ghosts include greater poets than Keats, Scientists greater than Newton. We know this because the set of possible people, allowed by our DNA, so massively outnumbers the set of actual people. In the teeth of these stupefying odds, it is you and I, in our ordinariness, that are here. And in closing, from John Clare's poem, Remembrances, just one line. Ah, words are poor receipts for what time hath stole away. Prologue with Premonitions What can the England of 1940 have in common with the England of 1840, but then what have you in common with the child of five whose photograph your mother keeps on the mantelpiece? Nothing, except that you happen to be the same person. That's from George Orwell, England, Your England, Socialism and the English Genius. Read your own obituary notice. They say you live longer. Gives you second wind. New lease of life. That's Leopold Bloom in James Joyce's Ulysses. Before me is a handsome edition of Face to Face, the smart magazine that goes out to the supporters of London's National Portrait Gallery. It contains the usual notices of future events and exhibitions. The page that has caught and held my eye is the one which calls attention to a show that starts on 10th of January 2009, titled Martin Amos and Friends. The event is to feature the work of a gifted photographer named Angela Gorgas, who was Martin's lover between 1977 and 1979. On the page is a photograph taken in Paris in 1979. It shows, from left to right, myself and James Fenton and Martin, ranged along a balustrade that overlooks the city of Paris. I remember the occasion well. It was after a decent lunch, somewhere in Montmartre, and we would have been looking over Angela's shapely shoulders at the horrible wedding cake architecture of Sacré-Cœur. Perhaps this explains the faintly dyspeptic expression on my features. In the accompanying prose, apparently written by Angela, is the following sentence about the time she first met the bewitching young Amos. Martin was literary editor of The New Statesman, working with the late Christopher Hitchens and Julian Barnes, who was married to Pat Kavanagh, Martin's then literary agent. So there it is, in cold print, the plain, unadorned phrase that will one day become unarguably true. It's not given to everyone to read of his own death, let alone when announced in passing in such a matter-of-fact way. As I write, in the dying months of the year 2008, having just received this reminder note from the future, that future still contains the opening of the exhibition and the publication of this memoir. But the exhibition and its catalogue references also exemplify still vital elements of my past. And now, rather abruptly, between the idea and the reality, between the motion and the act, falls the shadow. T.S. Eliot's hollow men do not constitute my cohort, or so I hope, even though one might sometimes wish to be among the Stoics who have crossed with direct eyes to death's other kingdom. The fact is that all attempts to imagine one's own extinction are futile by definition. One can only picture the banal aspects of this event, not in my case the mourners at the funeral, again excluded by the very rules of the game itself, 
but the steady thunk of emails into my inbox on the day of my demise and the way in which my terrestrial mailbox will also become congested until somebody does something to arrest the robotic electronic stupidity or until failure to pay up leads to an abrupt cancellation of the bills and checks and solicitations none of them ever in my lifetime arriving in the right proportions on the right day may it be that i gain a lifetime subscription to face to face and that this goes on forever or do i mean to say for all eternity the director of the national portrait gallery the excellent sandy nairn has written me an anguished letter in which he not only apologizes for having me killed off but tries to offer both explanation and restitution the display he writes also includes a photograph of pat kavanagh with kingsley amis a last minute change was made to the text and instead of it reading the late pat kavanagh it refers to yourself this kindly meant missive makes things more poignant and more eerie rather than less i have just opened a letter from pat kavanagh's husband julian barnes in which he thanks me for my note of condolence on her sudden death from cancer of the brain I had also congratulated him on the vast critical success of his recent meditation on death, sardonically titled "Nothing to Be Frightened of," which constituted an extended reflection on that undiscovered country. In my letter to Julian, I praised his balance of contrast between Lucretius, who said that since you won't know you're dead, you need not fear the condition of death, and Philip Larkin, who observes in his imperishable Obad. that this is exactly the thing about the post-mortem condition that actually does and must make one afraid the sure extinction that we travel to and shall be lost in always not to be here not to be anywhere and soon nothing more terrible nothing more true and specious stuff that says no rational being can fear a thing it will not feel not seeing that this is what we fear So it is at once a small thing and a big thing that I should have earned those transposed words the late, which had belonged editorially to Julian's adored wife, and then became accidentally adhered to myself. When I first formed the idea of writing some memoirs, I had the customary reservations about the whole conception being perhaps too soon. Nothing dissolves this fusion of false modesty and natural reticence more swiftly than the blunt realization that the project could become at any moment. ruled out of the question as having been undertaken too late but we are all dead men on leave as eugene levine said at his trial in munich for being a revolutionary after the counter revolution of 1919 there are still those often in india for some reason who make a living claiming land rents from the deceased from gogol to google if one now looks up the sodality of those who've lived to read of their own demise one strikes across the relatively good cheer of mark twain who famously declared the report to be an exaggeration to ernest hemingway whose biographer tells us that he read the obituaries every morning with a glass of champagne eventually wearing out the cheery novelty of this and unshipping his shotgun to the black nationalist marcus garvey who according to some reports was felled by a stroke while reading his own death notice Robert Graves lived robustly for almost 7 decades after being declared dead on the Somme. Bob Hope was twice pronounced deceased by the news media. On the second occasion I was called by some network to confirm or deny the report. And now wish I had not so jauntily said, having just glimpsed him at the British Embassy in Washington. That the last time I saw him he had certainly seemed dead enough. Paul McCartney, Pope John Paul, Harold Pinter, Gabriel Garcia Marquez The role of honor and embarrassment persists, but there is one striking instance that's more than whimsical. Alfred Nobel, a celebrated manufacturer of explosives, is alleged to have been so upset by the merchant of death emphasis that followed mistaken reports of his own extinction that he decided to overcompensate and to endow an award for peace and for services to humanity that, I would add, has been a huge bore and fraud ever since. Until you have done something for humanity, said the great American educator Horace Mann, you should be ashamed to die. Well, how is one to stand that test? In some ways, the photograph of me with Martin and James is of the late Christopher Hitchens. At any rate, it is of someone else or someone who doesn't really exist in the same corporeal form. 
the cells and molecules of my body and brain have replaced themselves and diminished, respectively. The relatively slender young man with an eye to the future has metamorphosed into a rather stout person who is ruefully but resignedly aware that every day represents more and more, subtracted from, less and less. As I write these words, I'm exactly twice the age of the boy in the frame. The occasional pleasure of advancing years, that of looking back and reflecting upon how far one has come, is swiftly modified by the immediately succeeding thought of how relatively little time there is left to run. I always knew I was born into a losing struggle, but I now know this in a more objective and more subjective way than I did then. When that shutter clicked in Paris, I was working and hoping for the overthrow of capitalism. As I sat down to set this down, having done somewhat better out of capitalism than I had ever expected to do, the financial markets had just crashed on almost the precise day on which I became fifty-nine and one-half years of age, and thus eligible to make use of my Wall Street managed retirement fund. My old Marxism came back to me as I contemplated the dead labor that had been hoarded in that account, saw it being squandered in a victory for finance capital over industrial capital, noticed the ancient dichotomy between use value and exchange value, and saw again the victory of those monopolists who make money over those who only have the power to earn it. It was decidedly interesting to have become actuarially extinct in the last quarter of the very same year that saw me written off in the more aesthetic and literary sense as well. I now possess another photograph from that same visit to Paris, and it proves to be even more of a Proustian prompter. Taken by Martin Amis, it shows me standing with the ravissant Angela outside a patisserie that seems to be quite close to the Rue Mouffetard, praise for which appears on the first page of A Movable Feast. Or could it be that that box of confections in my hand contains a madeleine? Again, the person shown is no longer myself, and until a short while ago, I would not have been able to notice this, but I now see very clearly what my wife discerns as soon as I show it to her. You look, she exclaims, just like Antonia. And so I do, or rather, to be fair, so now does she look like me, at least as I was then. At present fifteen years old, my younger daughter is asked to confirm this, to her, no doubt, rather alarming comparison. What you really look, she says after a pause, is Jewish. And so in many ways I am, and so in even more ways is she, as I shall be explaining. I shall also be explaining why it was that the boy in the frame did not know of his Jewish provenance. All this, too, is an intimation of mortality, because nothing reminds one of impending extinction more than the growth of one's children, for whom room must be made, and who are in fact one's only hint of even a tincture of a hope of immortality. And yet here I still am, and resolve to trudge on. Of the many once handsome and beautiful visages in the catalogue, a distressing number belong to former friends, the marvellous illustrator and cartoonist Mark Boxer, the charming but fragile Amschel Rothschild, the lovable socialite and wastrel and half-brother to Princess Diana, Adam Shand Kidd, who died well before they attained my present age. Of some other departures the news had not yet reached me. I had not thought death had undone so many. In my career, I have managed to undertake almost every task that the hack journalist can be asked to perform. From being an amateur foreign correspondent, to acting as stand-in cinema critic, to knocking out pieces of polemical editorial against the clock. Yet perhaps I have misused the word undertake above, because two jobs only I could not manage. Covering a sporting event, and writing an obituary of a still-living person. The former failing is because I neither know nor care anything about sports, and the second is because, in spite of my firm conviction that I am not superstitious, I cannot, not even for ready money, write about the demise of a friend or colleague until Minerva's owl has taken wing, and I know that the darkness has actually come. I dare say that somebody somewhere has already written my provisional death notice. Stephen Spender was staying with W. H. Auden when the latter received an invitation from the Times, asking him to write Spender's obituary. He told him as much at the breakfast table, asking roguishly, Should you like anything said? Spender judged that this would not be the moment to tell Auden that he'd already written his obituary for the same editor at the same paper. 
Various Death Watch desk managers at various times entreated me to do the same for Edward Said and Norman Mailer and Gore Vidal to drop some names that will recur if you stay with me. And I always had to decline. Yet now you find me trying to build my own bridge from, if not the middle of the river, at least some distance from the far side. Today's newspaper brings news of the death of Edwin Schneidman, who spent all his life in the study and prevention of suicide. He referred to himself as a thanatologist. The obituary, which is replete with the pseudo-irony so beloved by the near-moribund profession of daily print journalism, closes by saying, Dying is the one thing, perhaps the only thing in life, that you don't have to do, Schneidman once wrote. Stick around for long enough, and it will be done for you. A more polished obituarist might have noticed the connection to a celebrated piece of doggerel by Kingsley Amis. Death has this much to be said for it. You don't have to get out of bed for it. Wherever you happen to be, they bring it to you, free. And yet I can't quite applaud this admirable fatalism. I personally want to do death in the active and not the passive, and to be there, to look it in the eye, and be doing something when it comes for me. Surveying the list of all his friends, as they were snatched up in turn by the Reaper, the great Scottish bard William Dunbar wrote his Lament for the Makers in the early 16th century, and ended each stave of bereavement with the words, Timor mortis conturbat me. It's a near liturgical refrain. The fear of death distresses me, and I would not trust anyone who had not felt something like it. Yet imagine how nauseating life would become, and how swiftly at that, if we were told that there would be no end to it. For one thing, I should have no incentive to write down these remembrances. They will include some account of the several times that I could already have been dead, and very nearly was. Mention of some of the earlier names above makes me wonder if, without having known it at the time, I have now become retrospectively part of a literary or intellectual set. The answer seems to be yes, and so I promise to give some account of how it is that sets are neither deliberately formed nor made, but, as Oscar Wilde said about the arrangement of screens, simply occur. Janus was the name given by the Romans to the tutelary deity who guarded the doorway, and who thus had to face both ways. The doors of his temples were kept open in time of war, the time in which the ideas of contradiction and conflict are most naturally regnant. The most intense wars are civil wars, just as the most vivid and rending personal conflicts are internal ones. And what I hope to do now is give some idea of what it is like to fight on two fronts at once, to try and keep opposing ideas alive in the same mind, even occasionally to show two faces at the same time. Yvonne Graham Greene in The Power and the Glory says, There's always a moment in childhood when the door opens and lets the future in. Rudyard Kipling's poem Kim says, Something I owe to the soil that grew, more to the life that fed, but most to Allah, who gave me two separate sides to my head. I, of course, do not believe that it is Allah who determines these things. Salman Rushdie, commenting on my book God is Not Great, remarked rather mordantly that the chief problem with its title was a lack of economy, that it was, in other words, exactly one word too long. But whatever one's ontology may be, it will always seem tempting to believe that everything must have a first cause, or, if nothing quite as grand as that, at the very least a definite beginning, and on that point I have no vagueness or indecision. I do know a little of how I came to be in two minds, and this is how it begins with me. I am standing on a ferry boat that's crossing a lovely harbour. I have since learned many versions and variations of the word blue, but let's say that a brilliant if slightly harsh sunshine illuminates a cerulean sky vault and an azure sea and also limbs the way in which these two textures collide and reflect. The resulting tinge of green is in lambent contrast with the darker vegetation on the hillsides, and makes an almost blinding combination when, allied with those discrepant yet melding blues, it hits the white buildings that reach down to the edge of the water. As a flash of drama and beauty and seascape and landscape, it's as good an inaugural memory as one could wish. Since this little voyage is occurring in about 1952, 
and I've been born in 1949, I have no means of appreciating that this is the Grand Harbour at Valletta, the capital of the tiny island state of Malta, and one of the finest Baroque and Renaissance cities of Europe. A jewel set in the sea between Sicily and Libya, it has been for centuries a place of the two-edged sword between the Christian and Muslim worlds. Its population is so overwhelmingly Roman Catholic that there are, within the walled city, a great plethora of ornate churches, the cathedral being decorated by the murals of Caravaggio himself, that seductive votary of the higher wickedness. The island withstood one of the longest Turkish sieges in the history of Christendom, but the Maltese tongue is a dialect version of the Arabic spoken in the Maghreb, and is the only Semitic language to be written in a Latin script. If you happen to attend a Maltese Catholic church during Mass, you will see the priest raising the communion host and calling on Allah, because this, after all, is the local word for God. My first memory, in other words, is of a ragged and jagged, but nonetheless permeable and charming frontier between two cultures and civilizations. I am at this stage far too secure and confident to register anything of the kind. If I speak a few phrases of Maltese, it is not with a view to becoming bilingual or multicultural, but in order to address my priest-ridden nannies and the kitchen maids with their huge broods of children. This was the place where I first learned to see the picture of Catholicism as one of plump shepherds and lean sheep. Everything about Christianity is contained in the pathetic image of the flock. Its most heroic recent chapter, the withstanding of a hysterical aerial bombardment by Hitler and Mussolini, and it has remained a solid possession of the Royal Navy, in which my father proudly serves, ever since the Napoleonic Wars. Much more to the immediate point, I am standing on the deck of this vessel, in company with my mother, who holds my hand when I desire it, and also lets me scamper off to explore, if I insist. So, all things being considered, not too shaky a start. I am well-dressed and well-fed, with a full head of hair, and a slender waist, and operating in a context of startling architectural and natural beauty, and full of brio and self-confidence, and on a boat in the company of a beautiful woman who loves me. I didn't call her by this name at the time, but Yvonne is the echo with which I most piercingly and yearningly recall her memory to me. After all, it was her name, and it was what her friends called her and my shell-like ear detected quite early on a difference between this and the various comfortable Nancys and Jones and Ethels and Marjories, who, sterling types all, tended to be the spouses and helpmeets of my father's brother officers. Yvonne, a bit of class there, a bit of style, a touch or dash of garlic and olive and rosemary to sweeten the good old plain English loaf from which, the fact must be faced, I was also sliced but more of this when I come to Commander Hitchens. I mustn't pretend to remember more than I really do, but I am very aware that it makes a great difference to have had, in early life, a passionate lady in one's own corner. For example, noticing that I had skipped the baby talk stage and gone straight to speaking in complete sentences, even if sometimes derivative ones, such as, according to family legend, let's all go and have a drink at the club, she sat me down one day and produced an elementary phonetic reading book, or what used to be known to the humble as a speller. This concerned the tedious adventures of a woodland elf or goblin called Lobagob, his name helpfully subdivided. But by the time I was done with it, I was committed for life to having some sort of reading matter within reach at all times, and was always to be head of my class in reading age. By this period, however, our family had left Malta and been posted to the much more austere surroundings of Rosyth, another naval base on the east coast of Scotland. I think Malta may have been a sort of high point for Yvonne. All British people were a cut above the rest in a semi-colony, and there was that club for cocktails and even the chance of some local help. Not that she longed to wallow in idleness, but having endured a girlhood of scarcity, slump, and then war, she couldn't have minded a bit of colour and Mediterranean dash, and may well have felt she'd earned it. On our way back from Malta, we stopped for a few hours at Nice, her and my first taste of the Riviera. I remember how happy she looked. The greyness and drabness of married quarters in drizzle-flogged Fifeshire must have hit her quite hard. But she and my father had first been thrown together precisely because of drizzle and austerity and the grim, grinding war against the Nazis. 
He, a Korean Navy man, had been based at Scarpa Flow, the huge cold water sound in the Orkney Islands, which helped establish and maintain British control over the North Sea. She was a volunteer in the Women's Royal Naval Service, or in the parlance of the day, a wren. My most cherished photograph of her shows her in uniform. After a short wartime courtship, they'd been married in early April 1945, not long before Adolf Hitler had shoved a gun into his own apparently halitosis-reeking mouth. One young and eager girl from a broken Jewish home in Liverpool, wed to one man twelve years her senior, from a sternly united if somewhat repressed Baptist family in Portsmouth. Wartime was certainly full of such improvised unions in which probably both at first counted themselves fortunate. But I know for a fact that while my father never stopped considering himself lucky, my mother soon ceased to do so. She also decided, for a reason I believe I can guess, to engage in the not-so-small deception of not mentioning to anyone in the Hitchens family that she was of Jewish descent. She herself had wanted to pass as English, after noticing some slight unpleasantness being visited on my grandmother, who in the 1930s toiled in the millinery business. And Yvonne could pass, too, as a light brunette, with hazelish eyes and, always to my fancy and imagination, a French aspect. But more to the point, I now feel sure, she did not want either me or my brother to be taxed with die Judenfrage, the Jewish question. What I do not know is quite what this concealment or reticence cost her. What I can tell you something about is what it meant for me. The paradox was this. In post-war Britain, as in Britain at all other times, there was only one tried and tested form of social mobility. The first-born son, at least, had to be educated at a private school, with an eventual view to attending a decent university. But school fees were high, and the shoals of class and accent and social position somewhat difficult for first-timers to navigate. Neither of my parents had been to college. One of my earliest coherent memories is of sitting in my pyjamas at the top of the stairs, eavesdropping on a domestic argument. It was an easy enough one to follow. Yvonne wanted me to go to a fee-paying school. My father, the commander, as we sometimes ironically and affectionately called him, made the heavy but obvious objection that it was well beyond our means. Yvonne was having none of this. If there's going to be an upper class in this country, she stated with decision, then Christopher is going to be in it. I may not have the words exactly right. Could she have said ruling class or establishment, terms that would then have been opaque to me, but the purport was very clear, and from my hidden seat in the gallery, I silently applauded. Thus, a further paradox discloses itself. My mother was much less British than my father, but wanted above all for me to be an English gentleman. You, dear reader, be the judge of how well that worked out. And, though she wanted to keep me near, she needed to argue hotly for my sake that I be sent away. I registered this contradiction very acutely as alternating between the beams and smiles of maternal encouragement and the hot tears of separation. She escorted me to my boarding school at the age of eight. I shall always be slightly sorry that I didn't make more of an effort to pretend that I was desolated too. I knew I would miss Yvonne, but I suppose by then I'd had the essential experience of being loved without ever being spoiled. I was eager to get on with it, and at the school, which I'd already visited as a prospective boarder, there could be found a library with shelves that seemed inexhaustible. There was nothing like that at our house, and Yvonne had taught me to love books. The cruelest thing I ever did at the end of my first term away from home was to come home for Christmas and address her as Mrs. Hitchens. I shan't forget her shocked face. It was the enforced etiquette to address all females at the school, from master's wives to staff, in this way. But I still suspect myself of having committed a mean little attention-getting subterfuge. This perhaps helps explain the gradual diminution of my store of memory of Yvonne. From the ages of eight to eighteen, I was to be away from home for most of the year, and the crucial rites of passage, from the pains of sexual maturity to the acquisition of friends, enemies, and an education, took place outside the bonds of family. Nonetheless, I always somehow knew how she was, and could generally guess what I didn't know, or what was to be inferred from between the lines of her weekly letters. My father was a very good man, and a worthy and honest and hard-working one, 
but he bored her, as did much of the remainder of her life. The one unforgivable sin, she used to say, is to be boring. What she wanted was the metropolis, with cocktail parties and theatre trips and smart friends, and witty conversation, such as she had once had as a young thing in pre-war Liverpool, where she'd lived near Penny Lane, briefly known people like the madly gay Frank Hauser, later director of the Oxford Playhouse, and been introduced by a boyfriend to the work of the handsome Ulster poet Louis McNeese, contemporary of Auden and author of Autumn Journal and her favourite, The Earth Compels. What she got instead was provincial life in a succession of small English towns and villages, first as a Navy wife and then as the wife of a man who, let go by the Navy after a lifetime of service, worked for the rest of his days in bit-part jobs as an accountant or bursar. It's a terrible thing to feel sorry for one's mother or indeed father. And it's an additionally awful thing to feel this, and to know the impotence of the adolescent to do anything at all about it. Worse still, perhaps, is the selfish consolation that it isn't really one's job to rear one's parents. Anyway, I knew that Yvonne felt that life was passing her by. And I knew that the money that could have given her the occasional glamorous holiday or trip to town was instead being spent, at her own insistence, on school fees for me and my brother Peter, who had arrived during our time in Malta. So I resolved at least to work extremely hard and be worthy of the sacrifice. She didn't just sit there while I was away. She tried instead to become a force in the world of fashion. Perhaps answering the call of her milliner forebears, but at any rate determined not to succumb to the prevalent dowdiness of post-war Britain, she was forever involved in schemes for brightening the apparel of her friends and neighbours. One thing I do have, she used to say, with a slightly defensive tone, as if she lacked some other qualities, is a bit of good taste. I personally thought she had the other qualities too. On those official holidays when parents would visit my boarding school, and many boys almost expired in advance from the sheer dread of embarrassment, Yvonne never did or wore anything that I could later be teased about, and this was in the days when women still wore hats. She was invariably the prettiest and brightest of the mothers, and I could always kiss her gladly right in front of everyone else, without any fear of mushiness, lipstick stains, or other disasters. In those moments I would have dared anyone to tease me about her, and I was small for my age. However, the dress shop business did not go well. If it wasn't for bad luck, in fact, Yvonne would have had no luck at all. With various friends and partners she tried to float a store called Pandora's Box, I remember, and another called Susanna Monday, named for an ancestress of ours on the paternal Hampshire side. These enterprises just didn't fly, and I couldn't think why not except that the local housewives were just too drab and myopic and penny-pinching. I used to love the idea of dropping by as I went shopping, so that she could show me off to her friends and have a general shriek and gossip over some coffee. But I could always tell that business wasn't good. With what a jolt of recognition did I read years later, V.S. Naipaul's uncanny diagnosis of the situation in The Enigma of a Rival. He was writing about Salisbury, which was close enough to Portsmouth, a shop might be just two or three minutes' walk from the market square, but could be off the main shopping track. Many little businesses failed, quickly, visibly. Especially pathetic were the shops that, not understanding that people with important shopping to do, usually did it in London, aimed at style. How dismal those boutiques and women's dress shops quickly became, the hysteria of their owners showing in their windows. I might want to quarrel with the choice of the word hysteria there, but if you substituted quiet desperation, you might not be far off. Even years later, when the term struggle had become for me almost synonymous with the words liberation or working class, I never forgot that the petty bourgeois knew about struggling too. I am speaking of the time of my adolescence. As the fact of this development became inescapably evident in the early fall of 1964, according to my best memory, and as it came time to go back to school again, my mother took me for a memorable drive along Portsmouth Harbour. I think I had an idea of what was coming when I scrambled into the seat alongside her. There had been a few fatuous and bungled attempts at facts of life chats from my repressed and awkward schoolmasters, and some hair-raising speculations from some of my more advanced schoolmates, 
I myself being what was euphemistically called a late developer, and I somehow knew that my father would very emphatically not want to undertake any gruff moment of manly heart-to-heart -heart with his firstborn, as indeed my mother confirmed, by way of explanation for what she was herself about to say. In the next few moments, guiding the hillman smoothly along the road, she managed with a near-magical deafness and lightness to convey the idea that, if you felt strongly enough about somebody, and learned to take their desires too into account, the resulting mutuality and reciprocity would be much more than merely worthwhile. I don't know quite how she managed this, and I still marvel at the way that she both recognized and transcended my innocence, but the outcome was a deep peace and satisfaction that I can yet feel, and on some especially good subsequent occasions, have been able to call clearly in my mind. She never liked any of my girlfriends ever, but her criticisms were sometimes quite pointed. Honestly, darling, she's madly sweet and everything, but she does look a bit like a pit pony. Yet she never made me think that she was one of those mothers who can't surrender their sons to another female. She was so little of a Jewish mother, indeed, that she didn't even allow me to know about her ancestry, something that I do very slightly hold against her. She wasn't overprotective. She let me roam and hitchhike about the place from quite a young age. She yearned only for me to improve my education. Aha! She had two books of finely bound poetry, apart from the MacNeese, Rupert Brooke and Palgrave's Golden Treasury, which I will die to save, even if my house burns down. She drove me all the way to Stratford for the Shakespeare anniversary in 1966, and on the wintry day later that year that I was accepted by Balliol College, Oxford, I absolutely knew that she felt at least some of the sacrifice and tedium and weariness of the years had been worthwhile. In fact, that night, at a fairly rare slap-up dinner out, is almost the only family celebration of unalloyed joy that, perhaps because it was mainly, if not exclusively, about me, I can ever recall. It pains me to say that last thing, but the truth is that I can remember many nice country walks and even one epic game of golf with my father, and many good times with my brother Peter as well, and more moments with Yvonne than I can possibly tell about here. But like many families, we didn't always succeed in managing as a unit. It was better if there were guests, or other relatives, or at least a pet animal, to which we could all address ourselves. I'll close this reflection with a memory that I cannot omit. We had been for a family holiday. I think it may have been the last one we all had together. On the Devonshire coast, at the John Betjeman style resort of Budley Saucerton. I hadn't thought it had been too tense by Hitchin's standards, but on the last day my father announced that the men of the family would be going home by train. Yvonne, it seemed, wanted a bit of time to herself and was going to take the car and get home by easy and leisurely stages. I found I approved of this idea. I could see her cruising agreeably along in the old roadster, smoking the odd cigarette in that careless and carefree way she had, stopping as and when it pleased her, falling into casual and witty conversation at some of the better hostelries along the roads. Why on earth not? She was way overdue for a bit of sophistication and refinement, and a few days of damn the expense indulgence. She was home the next day, with her neck in a brace, having been painfully rear-ended by some idiot before she'd even properly embarked on the treat that was rightfully hers. My father silently and efficiently took charge of all the boring insurance and repair details, while Yvonne looked, for the first time I'd ever seen her, deflated and defeated. I've never before or since felt so utterly sorry for anybody, or so powerless to assist, or so uneasy about the future, or so unable to say why I was so uneasy. To this day I can't easily stand to hear the Danny Williams version of her favourite, Moon River, because it captures the sort of pining note that is the more painful for being inchoate. While shifting scenery at the Oxford Playhouse not long afterward, for one of the first wage packets I ever earned, I saw a production of the Cherry Orchard from the wings, a good point of vantage for a Chekhov play, incidentally, and felt a pang of vicarious identification with the women who would never quite make it to the bright lights of the big city, and who couldn't even count on the survival of their provincial idyll either. Oh, Vaughan, if there was any justice, you should have had the opportunity to enjoy at least one of these, if not both. She soon afterward gave me a black-tie dinner jacket as a present to take to Oxford. 
being sure that I'd need formal wear for all the union debates and other high-toned events at which I would doubtless be starring. I did actually don this garment a few times, but by the middle of 1968, Yvonne had become mainly used to reading about my getting arrested while wearing jeans and donkey jacket and carrying some insurgent flag. I have to say that she didn't complain as much as she might have done, though I do rather hate it, darling, when my friends ring up and pretend they're so sorry to see you on TV in that way. Her politics had always been liberal and humanitarian, and she had a great abhorrence of any sort of cruelty or bullying. She fondly thought that my commitments were mainly to the underdog. For my father's flinty and adamant Toryism, she had little sympathy. I do remember her once asking me why it was that so many professional revolutionaries were childless, a question which seemed beside the point at the time, but has recurred to me occasionally since. Unless the police actually came to the house with a warrant, which they did once, after I'd been arrested again while still on bail for a previous offence, she barely uttered a moan. And I, well, I was impatient to outgrow my family and fly the nest. And in the vacations from Oxford, as well as after I graduated, and moved impatiently and ambitiously to London, I didn't go home any more than I had to. Even after all these years, I find I could hardly bear to criticise Yvonne, but there was something about which I could and did tease her. She had a slight, actually a definite weakness, for new age and faddish and cultish attractions. When I was a boy, it was Gaylord Hauser's Stay Younger, Live Longer regime, a smirking charmer's catch-penny diet book that enthralled about half the lower middle-class women we knew. As time progressed, it was the bogus refulgences of Khalil Gibran and the sickly tautologies of the Prophet. As I say, she could take some raillery about this from me, at least when it was about unwanted poundage or unreadable verses, but, and this is very often the awful fate of the one who teases, I did not realize how much unhappiness was involved, and I did not remotely appreciate how much damage had been done until it was far too late. Allow me to relate this to you as it unfolded itself to me. Going back to Oxford one day, and after I'd moved to London and had begun working at the New Statesman, I was striding down the high street and ran straight into Yvonne just outside the Queen's College. We embraced at once. As I unclasped her, I noticed a man standing shyly to one side, and evidently carrying her shopping parcels. We were introduced. I proposed, stepping into the Queen's Lane coffee house. I don't remember how it went. I was in Oxford to keep some pressing political and sexual engagements that seemed important at the time. The man seemed nice enough, if a bit wispy, and had an engaging grin. He was called Timothy Bryan, which I also remember thinking was a wispy name. I felt no premonition. But next time I saw her, my mother was very anxious to know what I thought of him. I said, becoming dimly but eventually alert, that he seemed fine. Did I really, really think so? I suddenly understood that I was being asked to approve of something. And it all came out in a rush. Yvonne had met him on a little holiday she'd managed to take in Athens. He seemed to understand her perfectly. He was a poet and a dreamer. She'd already decided to break it all to my father, the commander, and was going to live with Mr. Bryan. The main thing I remember thinking, as the sun angled across our old second-floor family apartment, was, please don't tell me that you waited until Peter and I were old enough. She added at that moment, with perfect sincerity, that she'd waited until my brother and I were old enough. It was also at about that time, throwing all caution, as they say, to the winds, that she told me she had had an abortion both before my own birth and after it. The one after I could bring myself to think about with equanimity, or at least some measure of equanimity, whereas the one before felt a bit too much like a close shave or a near miss in respect of moi. This was the laid-back early 1970s, and I had neither the wish nor the ability to be judgmental. Yvonne was the only member of my family with whom I could discuss sex and love in any case. I was then informed that she and Timothy had another thing in common. He had once been an ordained minister of the Church of England, at the famous church of St. Martin in the Fields, off Trafalgar Square, as I later discovered, but had seen through organized religion. Both he and she were now devotees of the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, 
the sinister windbag who had brought enlightenment to the Beatles in the Summer of Love. I had to boggle a bit at this capitulation to such a palpable fraud. Have you given the perfect master any money? Has he given you a secret mantra to intone? But when the answer to the second question turned out to be a sincere and shy yes, I forgave her in a burst of laughter in which she, with a slight reserve, I thought, nonetheless joined. It was arranged that Yvonne and the ex-rev would come to dine with me in London. Feeling more loyal to my mother than disloyal to my father, I took the happy couple to my favourite Bengali restaurant, the Ganges, in Gerard Street. This was the heart of my culinary leftist Soho, and I knew that the management would be warmly hospitable to any guests of mine. All went well enough, and I could also affect to be cutting a bit of a figure in my novice years as a scribbler in the capital. A hint of Bloomsbury and Fitzrovia and Soho was, I knew, just the sort of spice that Yvonne would appreciate. I dropped an author's name or two, ordered that second carafe with a lazy flick of the hand, paid the bill carelessly, and wondered how I would conceal it on my expense account the next day. The former priest, Mr. Bryan, was not a bad conversationalist, with a fondness for poetry and the quotation of same. Outside in the street, importuned by gypsy taxi drivers, I used the word fuck for the first time in my mother's presence, and felt her both bridling a bit and shrugging amusedly at the inevitability of it. At any rate, I could tell that she was happy to be in the metropolis, and happy, too, that I liked her new man well enough. And I still have a rather sharp pang whenever I come to that corner of Shaftesbury Avenue, where I kissed her goodbye, because she had been absolutely everything to me in her way, and because I was never, ever going to see her again. I think that I must have talked to her after that, though, because the curry supper had been in the early fall of 1973, and she telephoned me in London, and this is certainly the last time that I was to hear her voice, at around the time of what some people call the Yom Kippur War, and some the Ramadan War, which was in October of that year. This call was for the purpose of advising me that she intended to move to Israel. I completely misinterpreted this as another quasi-spiritual impulse. Oh, mummy, honestly, I did still sometimes call her mummy. And my impatience earned me a short lecture about how the Jews had made the desert bloom and were exerting themselves in a heroic manner. We were perhaps both at fault. I ought to have been less mocking and dismissive. And she might have decided that now, if ever, was the moment to tell me what she'd been holding back about our ancestral ties. Anyway, I counselled her against removing herself to a war zone, let alone taking someone else's bleeding holy land on top of her other troubles, and though I didn't know it, we bid farewell. I would give a very great deal to be able to start that conversation over again. For my father to call was almost unheard of. His taciturnity was renowned, and the telephone was considered an expense in those days. But call he did and not that many days later, and came to the point with his customary dispatch. Do you happen to know where your mother is? I said no, with complete honesty, and then felt that slightly sickened feeling that comes when you realise that you are simply but politely not believed. Perhaps this emotion was the late residue of my own recent complicity with Yvonne and Timothy. But my father did sound distinctly sceptical of my truthful answer. Well, he went on evenly enough, I haven't seen or heard from her in days, and her passport isn't where it usually is. I quite forget how we left it, but I shall never forget how we resumed that conversation. What it is to be twenty-four, and fairly new to London, and cutting your first little swathe through town. I had had a few Fleet Street and television jobs and gigs, and had just been hired by one of the best-known literary political weeklies in the English-speaking world. Anne was lying in bed one morning with a wonderful new girlfriend when the telephone rang to disclose, as I lifted the receiver, the voice of an old girlfriend. Bizarrely, or so it seemed to my pampered and disordered senses, she asked me the very same question that my father had recently asked. Did I know where my mother was? I've never quite known how to ask forgiveness, but now I wish I'd been able to repress the irritable thought that I was getting just a bit too grown up for this line of inquiry. Melissa, in any case, was as brisk and tender as I would have wanted to be if our situations had been reversed. Had I listened to that morning's BBC News? No. Well, there was a short report about a woman with my surname having been found murdered in Athens. 
I felt everything in me somehow flying out between my toes. What? Perhaps no need to panic, said Melissa sweetly. Had I seen that morning's London Times? No. Well, there was another brief print report about the same event. But listen, would there have been a man involved? Would this woman called Hitchens, not that common a name, I dully thought, have been travelling with anybody? Yes, I said, and gave the probable or presumable name. Oh dear, then I'm very sorry, but it probably is your mum. So, the rather diffident and wispy ex-Reverend Brian, so recently my guest at dinner, had bloodily murdered my mother and then taken his own life. Beneath that scanty exterior had lain a raving psycho. That was what all the reports agreed in saying. In some hotel in Athens, the couple had been found dead, separately but together, in adjoining rooms. For my father, who was the next person to ring me, this was especially and particularly devastating. He was not far short of his 65th birthday. He had also had to reconcile himself to the loss of his adored wife's affection, in a day when divorce was still considered scandalous and had reluctantly agreed that she would spend much of her private time at the house of another man. But at the respectable boys' prep school where he kept the books, and in the surrounding society of North Oxford, the two of them had had a pact. If invited to a sherry party or a dinner, they would still show up together, as if nothing had happened. Now, and on the front pages at that, everything was made known at once, and to everybody. I do not know how he bore the shock, but there was no question of his coming to Athens, and I myself, in any case was already on my way there, and honestly preferred to face it alone. This lacerating, howling moment in my life was not the first time that the private and the political had intersected, but it was by some distance the most vivid. For many people in my generation, the seizure of power in Greece by militaristic fascists in April 1967 had been one of the definitive moments in what we were retrospectively to call the 60s. That a Western European country the stock phrase, cradle of democracy, was seldom omitted, could have been hijacked by a dictatorship of dark glasses and torturers and steel helmets and yet remain within NATO. The whole idea made a vulgar satire of the Cold War propaganda about any free world. I had spoken at the Oxford Union alongside Helen Vlakos, the heroic publisher of the Athens daily paper, Kathimerini, which had closed and padlocked its doors rather than submit to censorship. I had taken part in protests outside the Greek embassy and passed out numberless leaflets echoing Byron's line that Greece might yet be free. And then, almost as my mother lay dying, the Athens junta had in fact been overthrown, but only from the extreme right, so that its replacement was even more vicious than its predecessor. Thus it was that when I first saw the city of Pericles and Phidias and Sophocles, its main square was congested with dirty grey American-supplied tanks, and its wine-dark sea at Phaleron Bay and Sunion, full of the sleek shapes of the U.S. Sixth Fleet. The atmosphere of that week at the end of November 1973 is instantly accessible to me and in an almost minute-by-minute -minute way. I can remember seeing the students yelling defiance from behind the wrecked gates of the Athens Polytechnic after the broad daylight and undisguised massacre of the unarmed anti junta protesters. I can remember meeting friends with bullet wounds that they dared not take to the hospital. I recall, too, a party in a poor student's crummy upstairs apartment, where those present made the odd gesture of singing the International almost under their breath, lest they attract the attention of the ever-prowling secret police. My old notebook still contains the testimony of torture victims, with their phone numbers written backwards, in my clumsy attempt to protect them if my notes were seized. It was one of my first forays into the world of the Death Squad and the Underground and the Republics of Fear. With Yvonne lying cold? You're quite right to ask. But it turns out, as I've found in other ways and in other places, that the separation between personal and public is not so neat. On arrival in Athens, I had, of course, gone directly to meet the coroner in my mother's case. His name was Demetrius Kapsaskis. It rang a distinct bell. This was the man who had, without wishing to do so, taken a starring part in that greatest of all 60s movies, Z. In this filmic political masterpiece by Konstantin Kostogavras, Kapsaskis testified that the hero, Gregory Lambrakis, had broken his skull accidentally in a fall rather than having had it smashed by a secret police operative. 
sitting opposite this shabby official villain and trying to talk objectively about my mother while knowing what was happening to my friends outside on the street was an education of a kind. It was the same when I had to go to the local police station for other formalities. Captain Nicholas Balaskas faced me across a desk in a forbidding office on Lekas Street, which displayed the blazing phoenix, the compulsory logo and insignia of the dictatorship. At the British Embassy, which was then run by a genial old diplomat whose son had been with me at Balliol, I had to sit through a lunch where a reactionary creep of a Labour MP named Francis Nell Baker gave a lecture about the virtues of the junta and, the first but not the last time I was ever to hear these two arguments in combination, both denied that it tortured its prisoners while asserting that it would be quite justified if it did do so. I then had a strange moment of shared mourning which helped remind me of what I obviously already knew, namely that my own bereavement was nothing unique. In a rundown restaurant near Sintagma Square, I endured a melancholy lunch with Chester Coleman. This once golden boy, who W. H. Auden had feared might be the wrong blonde when they first met in 1939, had since been the life partner and verse collaborator of the great poet, the source of much of his misery, as well as much of his bliss, and the dedicatee of some especially fervent and consecrated poems. He was fifty-two and looked seventy, with an almost grannyish trembling and protruding lower lip, and a quivering hand that spilled his avgolemino soup down his already well-encrusted shirt front. Difficult to picture him as the boy who had once so insouciantly compared himself to Carol Lombard. I had only a few weeks previously gone to Christchurch Cathedral in Oxford to attend Auden's memorial, my dear friend James Fenton, who had been a protégé of Auden's and a sometime guest at the Auden Coleman home in Kirchstetten, Austria, had just won the Eric Gregory Award for Poetry and decided to invest the prize money in an intrepid voyage to Vietnam that was to yield its own poetic harvest. So I had gone back to Oxford in part to represent him in his absence, as well as to witness a gathering of poets and writers and literary figures, from Stephen Spender to Charles Monteith, discoverer of Lord of the Flies, who were unlikely ever to gather in one place again. Corman, who had about two years left to live, was not especially desirous of hearing about any of this. I do not wish, he said slurringly, to be thought of as Weston's relict. Uncharitably, perhaps, and even though I knew he had done some original work of his own, I wondered if he seriously expected to be much or long remembered in any other way. Even this minor moment of pathos was inflected with politics. Carmen had done his level best over the years to seduce the entire rank and file of the Hellenic armed forces, and had once been threatened with arrest and deportation by a certain Brigadier Sumbas. Sumbas. I can still hear his knell-like pronunciation of the dreaded name. The recent swerve from the extreme right to the even more extreme fascist right was threatening to bring the vile Sumbas into high office and Chester was apprehensive and querulous, with his own safety, naturally enough, uppermost in mind. I was going through all of these motions while I awaited a bureaucratic verdict of which I was already fairly sure. My mother had not been murdered. She had, with her lover, contracted a pact of suicide. She took an overdose of sleeping pills, perhaps washed down with a mouthful or two of alcohol, while he, whose need to die must have been very great, took an overdose with booze also, and to make assurance doubly sure, slashed himself in a hot bath. I shall never be sure what depth of misery had made this outcome seem to her the sole recourse. On the hotel's switchboard record were various attempted calls to my number in London, which the operator had failed to connect. Who knows what might have changed if Yvonne could have heard my voice even in her extremity. I might have said something to cheer or even tease her, something to set against her despair and perhaps give her a momentary purchase against the death wish. A second-to-last piece of wretchedness almost completes this episode. Whenever I hear the dull word closure, I am made to realize that I, at least, will never achieve it. This is because the Athens police made me look at a photograph of Yvonne as she had been discovered. I will tell you nothing about this, except that the scene was decent and peaceful, but that she was off the bed and on the floor, and that the bedside telephone had been dislodged from its cradle. 
it's impossible to read this bit of forensics with any certainty, but I shall always have to wonder if she had briefly regained consciousness, or perhaps even belatedly regretted her choice, and tried at the very last to stay alive. At all events, this is how it ends. I am eventually escorted to the hotel suite where it had all happened. The two bodies had had to be removed and their coffins sealed before I could get there. This was for the dismally sordid reason that the dead couple had taken a while to be discovered. The pain of this is so piercing and exquisite and the scenery of the two rooms so nasty and so tawdry that I hide my tears in my nausea by pretending to seek some air at the window and there, for the first time, I receive a shattering, full-on view of the Acropolis. For a moment, and like the Berlin Wall and other celebrated vistas when glimpsed for the first time, it almost resembles some remembered postcard of itself. But then it becomes utterly authentic and unique. That temple really must be the Parthenon, and almost near enough to stretch out and touch. The room behind me is full of death and darkness and depression, but suddenly here again, and fully present, is the flash and dazzle and brilliance of the green, blue, and white of the life-giving Mediterranean air and light that lent me my first hope and confidence. I only wish I could have been clutching my mother's hand for this, too. Yvonne, then, was the exotic and the sunlit when I could easily have had a boyhood of stern and dutiful English grey. She was the cream in the coffee, the gin in the Campari, the offer of wine or champagne instead of beer, the laugh in the face of boars and purse-mouths and skinflints, the insurance against bigots and prudes. Her defeat and despair were also mine for a long time. But I have reason to know that she wanted me to withstand the woe, and when I once heard myself telling someone that she'd allowed me a second identity, I quickly checked myself and thought, no, perhaps with luck she had represented my first and truest one. And here I have a coda on the question of self-slaughter. I have intermittently sunk myself over the course of the past four decades or so into dismal attempts to imagine or think or feel myself into my mother's state of mind, as she decided that the remainder of her life would simply not be worth living. There is a considerable literature on the subject, which I have made an effort to scrutinize, but all of it has seemed to me too portentous and general and sociological to be of much help. Suicide writing in our time, moreover, has mainly been produced long after the act itself ceased to be regarded as ipso facto immoral or as deserving an extra round of post-mortem pain and punishment in the afterlife. I was myself rather astounded when dealing with the Anglican chaplain at the Protestant cemetery in Athens, which was the only resting place consistent with her wishes, to find that this epoch had not quite ended. The sheep-faced reverend didn't really want to perform his office at all, he muttered a bit about the difficulty of suicides being interred in consecrated ground, and he may have had something to say about my mother having been taken in adultery. At any rate, I shoved some money in his direction, and he became sulkily compliant, as the priesthood generally does. It was fortunate for him, though, that I couldn't feel any more dislike and contempt for him and for his sickly religion than I already did. If I had been a red-blooded Protestant of any conviction— he would soon enough have found out what a boot felt like when it was planted in his withered backside. On my way out, through the surrounding Greek Orthodox precincts, I paused to place some red carnations on the huge pile of tribute that surmounted the grave of the great George Seferis, national poet of the Greeks and foe of all superstitions, whose 1971 funeral had been the occasion for a silent mass demonstration against the junta. To an extraordinary degree, Modern suicide writing takes its point of departure from the death of Sylvia Plath. When I myself first read The Bell Jar, the phrase of hers that most arrested me was the one with which she described her father's hometown. Otto Plath had originated in Grabau, a dull spot in what used to be called the Polish Corridor. His angst-infected daughter had described this place as some manic depressive hamlet in the black heart of Prussia. Her poem, Daddy, must be the strictest verdict passed by a daughter on a male parent since the last reunion of the House of Atreus, with its especially unsettling opinion that, as a result of paternal ill-use, 
Every woman loves a fascist, the boot in the face. The feminist school is often looked in a manner of marked disapproval at her husband, Ted Hughes. I find it difficult to imagine him actually maltreating Sylvia physically, but there's no doubt that he could be quite stupendously wanting in sensitivity. I once went for some drinks with him at the apartment of my friend and editor Ben Sonnenberg, who was by then almost completely immobilized by multiple sclerosis. Hughes droned on for an agonizingly long time about the powers of a faith healer in the, perhaps somewhat manic depressive, Devonshire hamlet where he lived. This shaman, it seemed, was beyond praise for his ability with crippled people. On and on went the encomium. I could not meet Ben's eye. But from his wheel he event that an entire hamlet can be manic depressive. However, I can forgive La Plath, her possibly subconscious metaphor, because with an account of how this quack could cure disabled farm animals as well. My mother's ancestors did in fact come from a small and ultimately rather distraught small town in German-Polish Prussia, and her father had given her mother a truly ghastly time before dematerializing in the fog of war. But Yvonne was not one of those who, having ill died, it turned rather fall to shield from she hoped rather that it would fall to her to shield others from such pain. I myself don't think, striking though the image may be, that an entire hamlet can be manic depressive. However, I can forgive La Plath, her possibly subconscious metaphor, because most of what I know about manic depression I first learned from Hamlet. I have of late, the Prince of Denmark tells us, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth. Everyone living has occasionally experienced that feeling, but the lines that accompany it are the best definition of the blues that was ever set down. Tired of living, scared of dying is the next best encapsulation, offered in Old Man River. Who would carry on with the unending tedium and potential misery if they did not think that extinction would be even less desirable, or, as it is phrased in another of Hamlet's mood-swing soliloquies, if the everlasting had not set his cannon against self-slaughter? There are fourteen suicides in eight works of Shakespeare, according to Giles Romilly Fedden's study of the question, and these include the deliberate and ostensibly noble ones of Romeo and Juliet and of Othello. It's of interest that only Hamlet's darling Ophelia, whose death at her own hands is not strictly intentional, is the object of condemnation by the clergy. My own indifference to religion and refusal to credit any babble about an afterlife has, alas, denied me the hearty satisfaction experienced by Ophelia's brother Laertes, who whirls on the moralizing cleric to say, I tell thee, churlish priest, a ministering angel shall my sister be while thou liest howling. Memorable, to be sure. But too dependent on the evil and stupidity of the heaven-hell dualism, and of scant use to me in deciding how it was that a thoughtful, loving, cheerful person like Yvonne, who was in reasonable health, would want to simply give up. I thought it might have something to do with what the specialists call anhedonia, or the sudden inability to derive pleasure from anything, most especially from the pleasurable. Al Alvarez, in his very testing and demanding study of the subject, The Savage God, returns often to the suicide of Cesare Pavese, who took his own life at the apparent height of his powers. In the year before he died, he turned out two of his best novels. One month before the end, he received the Strega Prize, the supreme accolade for an Italian writer. I have never been so much alive as now, he wrote, never so young. A few days later he was dead. Perhaps the sweetness itself of his creative powers made his innate depression all the harder to bear. This is almost exactly what William Styron once told me, in a greasy diner in Hartford, Connecticut, about a golden moment in Paris, when he had been waiting to be given a large cash prize, an emblazoned ribbon and medal of literary achievement, and a handsome dinner to which all his friends had been bidden. I looked longingly across the lobby of the street, and I mean longingly. I thought, if I could just hurl myself through those heavy revolving doors, I might get myself under the wheels of that merciful bus, and then the agony could stop. At this diner we were served by a pimply and stringy-haired youth of appallingly dank demeanour. Bringing back Bill's credit card, he remarked that it bore a name that was almost the same as that of a famous writer. Bill said nothing. Tonelessly, the youth went on, he's called William Stryon. I left this up to Bill, who again held off until the kid matter-of-factly said, Anyway, that guy's book saved my life. At this point, Styron invited him to sit down, and he was eventually persuaded that he was at the same table as the author of Darkness Visible. 
It was like a transformation scene. He told us brokenly of how he sought and found the needful help. Does this happen to you a lot? I later asked Styron. Oh, all the time. I even get the police calling up to ask if I'll come on the line and talk to the man who's threatening to jump. But my poor Yvonne had never suffered from an excess of reward and recognition of the kind that sometimes does make honest people feel ashamed or even unworthy. However, what she had done was to fall in love, as she had pined so long to do, and then find out that it was fractionally too late for that. In theory, she had everything she might have desired, a charming man who adored her, an interval in which her boys were grown and she need not guard a nest, a prospect of leisure, and a non-vengeful husband. Many English married women of her class and time would have considered themselves fortunate. But in practice, she was on the verge of menopause, had exchanged a dutiful and thrifty and devoted husband for an improvident and volatile man, and then discovered that what volatile really meant was manic depression. She may not have needed or wanted to die, but she needed and wanted someone who did need and did want to die. This is beyond anhedonia. Examples like hers are also outside the scope of Emile Durkheim's sweeping account of the place of self-slaughter in alienated and deracinated and impersonal societies. I have always admired Durkheim for pointing out that the Jewish people invented their own religion, as opposed to the preposterous and totalitarian view that it was the other way about. But his categorization of suicide doesn't include the Yvonne-sized niche that I have so long been trying to identify and locate. He classified the act under the three headings of the egoistic, the altruistic, and the anomic. The egoistic is misleadingly titled because it really refers to suicide as a reaction to social fragmentation or atomization, to periods when old certainties or solidarities are decomposing, and people feel panic and insecurity and loneliness. Thus, a corollary to it is the observable fact that suicide rates decline during wartime, when people rally round a flag and also see their own small miseries in better proportion. The altruistic also has a wartime connotation, in that it signifies the willingness to lay down one's life for the good of the larger collective, or conceivably even the smaller collective such as the family, or, Captain Oates on Scott's doomed expedition, the group. Of this phenomenon, Albert Camus provided a nice précis by saying what is called a reason for living is also an excellent reason for dying. Alvarez extends Durkheim's tropes to include religious and tribal fanaticism, such as those kamikaze pilots or those Hindus who were ecstatically willing to hurl themselves under the wheels of the divinely powered juggernaut. The anomic suicide, finally, is the outcome of a sudden and jarring change in the person's social position. A searing divorce or a death in the family are among the examples Alvarez gives as typical. It's of interest that this taxonomy appears to say nothing about the so-called suicidal type. From experience, I should say that there is perhaps such a type, and that it can be dangerously frivolous to say that attempted suicides are only crying for help. I've known several who, after some apparently half-hearted bid, or even bids, made a decisive end of themselves. But Yvonne was by no imaginable measure the type she abhorred self-pity and suspected anything that was too ostentatious or demonstrative. However, she had fallen in with someone who very probably was bipolar or in other ways the type, and she'd certainly undergone the wrenching and jarring and abrupt loss of social position and security and respectability that had always been of such importance to her. Couple this with the gnawing fear that she was losing her looks. Anyway, for me, a searing marital separation had indirectly led to the death in the family. Durkheim's categories seem almost too grandiose to take account of her suicide, how we all would like our deaths to possess a touch of meaning. The egoistic doesn't really cover it at all, nor did the altruistic when I first read about it. And anomie to my Marxist ear used to be what mere individuals had, instead of what, with a better understanding of their class position, they would have recognized as alienation. Yvonne's was anomic then, but with a hint of the altruistic also. Of the two notes that she left, one, which, pardon me, I do not mean to quote, was to me. The other was to whoever had to shoulder the responsibility of finding her, or rather them. I was quite undone by the latter note as well. 
It essentially apologised for the mess and inconvenience. Oh, mummy, so like you. In her private communication, she gave the impression of believing that this was best for all concerned and that it was in some way a small sacrifice from which those who adored her would benefit in the long run. She was wrong there. For the anomic, Cesare Pavesi almost certainly provided the best text by observing dryly enough that no one ever lacks a good reason for suicide. And Alvarez furnishes self-slaughterers with the kindest epitaph by writing that, in making death into a conscious choice, some kind of minimal freedom, the freedom to die in one's own way and in one's own time, has been salvaged from the wreck of all those unwanted necessities. I once spoke at a memorial meeting for an altruistic suicide, the Czech student Jan Palak, who set himself on fire in Wenceslas Square in Prague to defy the Russian invaders of his country. But since then I have had every chance to become sickened by the very idea of martyrdom. The same monotheistic religions that condemn suicide by individuals have a tendency to exalt and overpraise self-destruction by those who kill themselves and others with a hymn or a prayer on their lips. Alvarez, like almost every other author, gets Masada wrong. He says that hundreds of Jews put themselves to death there rather than submit to the Roman legions. In fact, religious fanatics who had been expelled even by other Jewish communities, first murdered their own families and then drew lots for the exalted duty of murdering one another. Only the very last ones had to settle for killing themselves. So, divided in mind once more, I often want to agree with Saul Bellows Augie March, who, when rebuked by his elders and enjoined to conform and to accept the data of experience, replies, It can never be right to offer to die. And if that's what the data of experience tell you, then you must get along without them. Yet my next subject is a man who for a long time braved death for a living and would have been perfectly willing to offer to die in a cause that he considered to be, and that was, larger than himself. The Commander Arthur Custer, in his memoir Arrow in the Blue, says of his own father, He loved me tenderly and shyly from a distance and later on took a naive pride in seeing my name in print. And you'll remember that the Beatles, singing A Day in the Life on the album Sergeant Pepper, say, I heard the news today, oh boy, the English army had just won the war. An ancient piece of Judaic commentary holds that the liver is the organ that best represents the relationship between parents and child. It is the heaviest of all the viscera, and accordingly the most appropriate bit of one's guts. Only two of the 613 Jewish commandments or prohibitions offer any reward for compliance, and both are parental. The first is in the original Decalogue, when those who honor thy father and thy mother are assured that this will increase their days in the promised or stolen Canaanite land that is about to be given them. And the second involves some convoluted piece of quasi-reasoning whereby a bird's egg can be taken by a hungry Jew, as long as the poor mother bird isn't there to witness the depredation. How to discern whether it's a mother or father bird is not confided by the sages. Commander Eric Ernest Hitchens of the Royal Navy, my middle name is Eric, and I've sometimes idly wondered how things might have been different if either of us had been called Ernest, was a man of relatively few words, would have had little patience for Talmudic convolutions, and was not one of those whom nature had designed to be a nest builder. But his liver, to borrow a phrase from Gore Vidal, was that of a hero, and I must have inherited from him my fondness, if not my tolerance, for strong waters. I can remember perhaps three or four things of the rather laconic and diffident sort that he said to me. One, also biblically derived, was that my early socialist conviction was founded on sound. Another was that while one ought to beware of women with thin lips— this was the nearest we ever approached to a male-on-male -male conversation. Those with widely spaced eyes were to be sought out and appreciated. Excellent advice both times, and no doubt dearly bought. Out of nowhere in particular, but on some unusually bleak West Country day, he pronounced, I sometimes think that the Gulf Stream is beginning to weaken, thereby anticipating either the warming or else the cooling that seemingly awaits us all. When my first-born child, his first grandson, arrived, I got a one-line card. Glad it's a boy. Perhaps you are by now getting an impression. 
But the remark that most summed him up was the flat statement that the war of 1939 to 1945 had been the only time when I really felt I knew what I was doing. This, as I was made to appreciate while growing up myself, had actually been the testament of a British generation. Born in the early years of the century, afflicted by slump and depression after the First World War in which their fathers had fought, then flung back into combat against German imperialism in their maturity, starting to get married and to have children in the bleak austerity that succeeded victory in 1945, they all wondered quite where the years of their youth and strength had gone and saw only more decades of struggle and hardship still to come before the exigencies of retirement. As Bertie Wooster once phrased it, they experienced some difficulty in detecting the bluebird. It could have been worse. My father's father, the stern Alfred Ernest Hitchens, was a mirthless Calvinist patriarch who took a dim view of everything from music to television. The old man's forebears hailed from the backlands of Thomas Hardy's Wessex and perhaps even further west, Hitchens being in its origin a Cornish name, and my brother possesses ancestral birth and marriage certificates that are signed with an X by the peasants who were most probably recruited into Portsmouth to help build the historic dockyards. Portsmouth, the true home port of the Royal Navy, and nicknamed Pompey, as is its soccer team, by those locals for whom no other town will do. It is one of the world's most astonishing natural harbours, rivalling even Valletta in the way that it commands the channel approaches to the Atlantic and the North Sea, and it looms over the French coast while sheltering in the lee of the Isle of Wight, which the conquering Romans once named Vectis, the last place that Horatio Nelson set foot on dry land, and to this moment the home of his flagship, the Victory. The birthplace of Charles Dickens, and the home of Rudyard Kipling and Arthur Conan Doyle. Here I drew my first squalling breath on the 13th of April 1949, and here my male ancestors embarked time and again to slip down the channel and do the king's enemies a bit of no good. My grandfather had been a ranker in the army in India, and was to the end of his days only softened, in his general Puritan harshness, by his warm affection for that country expressed in a collection of Benares brasses that competed for space in his home with the biographies of forgotten missionaries. I still have an oil painting, almost my only family heirloom, which depicts a blue-eyed, rosy-cheeked ten-year-old boy in a white collar and blue bow-tied suit. This promising lad is looking into the distance and arguably being instructed to think of his country's destiny. In my own youth I was made to stand next to this frame, while older relatives remarked on the distinct resemblance I bore to Great Uncle Harry. The boy in the frame was indeed my great-uncle, acting as the model for an exhibition called Young England in 1900. Fifteen years later, his cruiser was shattered and sunk at the Battle of Jutland. There seems to be something wrong with our bloody ships today, as Admiral Beatty commented on seeing yet another vessel burst its boilers and go sky-high. Yet he survived in the bitter North Sea waters and is said to have saved the shivering Maltese mess steward while quietly letting the bar bills sink unpaid to the bottom. I don't quite remember how old I was before I met anybody who wasn't concerned with the Navy, or at least with some branch of the armed forces of which ours was always the senior service. I was christened on a submarine, urinating freely as the Reverend made me the first Hitchens to eschew baptism and Judaism and become a member of the more middle-class Church of England. I came to understand the difference between a destroyer and a cruiser and a corvette, and could tell someone's rank by the number of gold rings worn on the sleeve. When we moved to Malta, it was for the Navy. When we migrated to Scotland, it was to the base at Rosyth, quite near the Dunfermline birthplace, of Admiral Cochrane, liberator of Chile, and model for Patrick O'Brien's Jack Aubrey. When we were transferred again to Plymouth, I went to a boys' boarding school in the Devonshire town of Tavistock, birthplace of Sir Francis Drake. Every dormitory at the school was named for an admiral who had vanquished England's and later Great Britain's enemies at sea. I have mentioned the disagreement between my mother and my father as to whether they could afford that school, and I should now give another instance of the ways in which they did not think alike. We were living in the Dartmoor village of Crapstone, a name for which I didn't much care, because it could get me roughed up at school. Where did you say you lived, Hitchens? In due time we moved away, but to a village in Sussex called Funtington, which somehow was still not quite the improvement for which I had been quietly hoping. 
At all events, at the age of about nine, I was listening to a bit of gossip about one of our next-door neighbours, a marine officer of lugubrious aspect and mien, and his all-enduring wife. Daphne was telling me, said my mother to my father about this man, that his temper is so foul that she's taken to diluting his gin bottle with water when he's not looking. There was a significant pause. If the woman is watering Nigel's bloody gin, said the commander, then I'm not surprised he's always in a filthy temper. From this exchange I learned quite a lot about the different manner in which men and women, or at any rate married couples, can reason. I also added to my store of knowledge about the commander's attitude to gin, which was a relatively devout one. Alcohol for me has been an aspect of my optimism, the mood caught by Charles Ryder in Bradshaw Revisited when he discourses on aspects of the Bacchic and the Dionysian, and claims that he at least chooses to drink in the love of the moment and the wish to prolong and enhance it. I dare say some people have seen me the worse for wear in less charming ways, but I know I have been true to the original as well. The commander was not a happy drinker. He didn't actually drink all that much, but he imbibed regularly and determinedly, and it was a reinforcement to his pessimism and disappointment, both personal and political. As I was beginning to say, my whole boyhood was overshadowed by two great subjects, one of them majestic and the other rather less so. The first was the recent and terribly costly victory of Britain over the forces of Nazism. The second was the ongoing and consequent evacuation by British forces of bases and colonies that we could no longer afford to maintain. This epic and its closure were inscribed in the very scenery around me. Portsmouth and Plymouth had both been savagely blitzed, and the scars were still palpable. The term bomb site was a familiar one, used to describe a blackened gap in a street or the empty place where an office or pub used to stand. More than this, though, the drama was inscribed in the circumambient culture. Until I was about 13, I thought that all films and all television programs were about the Second World War, with a strong emphasis on the role played in that war by the Royal Navy. I saw Jack Hawkins with his binoculars on the icy bridge in the cruel sea, the movie version of a heart-stopping novel about the Battle of the Atlantic by Nicholas Montserrat, but by then I knew almost by heart. The commander, who had seen action on his ship HMS Jamaica in almost every maritime theatre, from the Mediterranean to the Pacific, had had an especially arduous and bitter time, escorting convoys to Russia over the hump of Scandinavia to Mamansk and Archangel, at a time when the Nazis controlled much of the coast and the air. And on the day after Christmas 1943, Boxing Day, as the English call it, proudly participating as the Jamaica pressed home for the kill and fired torpedoes through the hull of one of Hitler's most dangerous warships, the Scharnhorst. Sending a Nazi convoy raider to the bottom is a better day's work than any I have ever done. And every year on the anniversary... The commander would allow himself one extra tot of Christmas cheer, or possibly two, which nobody begrudged him. To this day, I observe the occasion myself. But he would then become glum, because he had most decidedly not taken the king's commission in order to end up running guns to Joseph Stalin. He had loathed the glum, graceless reception he got when his ship docked under the gaze of the Red Navy. And because almost everything since that great boxing day had been headed downhill. The Empire and the Navy were being wound up fast. The colours were being struck from Malaya in the east to Cyprus and Malta near a home. The senior service itself was being cut to the bone. When I was born in Portsmouth, my father was on board a ship called the Warrior, anchored in a harbour that had once seen scores of aircraft carriers and great grey battleships pass in review. In Malta, there had still been a shimmer or scintilla of greatness to the Navy, but by the time I was old enough to take notice, the commander was putting on his uniform, only to go to a stone frigate, a non-seagoing dockside office in Plymouth, where they calculated things in ledgers. Every morning on the BBC until I was six, I would hear the newscaster utter the name Sir Winston Churchill, who was then Prime Minister. There came the day when this stopped, and my childish ears received the strange name Sir Anthony Eden, who had finally succeeded the old lion. Within a year or so... Eden had tried to emulate Churchill by invading Egypt at Suez and pretending that Britain could simultaneously do without the UN and the United States. International and American revenge was swift, 
and from then on the atmosphere can't even be described as a long, withdrawing roar. Since the tide of empire and dominion merely and sadly ebbed. We won the war, or did we? This remark often accompanied by a meaning and shooting glance and an air of significance was a staple of conversation between my father and his rather few friends as the decanter went round. Later in life, I'm very sorry to say, it helped me to understand the stab-in-the-back mentality that had infected so much of German opinion after 1918. You might call it the politics of resentment. These men had borne the heat and burden of the day, but now the only chatter in the press was of cheap and flashy success in commerce. Now the colonies and bases were being mortgaged to the Americans, who, as we were invariably told, had come almost lethargically late to the struggle against the Axis. Now there were ridiculous, posturing, self-inflated leaders like Kenyatta and Makarios and Nkrumah, where only very recently the Union Jack had guaranteed prosperity under law. This grievance was very deeply felt, but was also, except in the company of fellow sufferers, rather repressed. The worst thing the Navy did to the commander was to retire him against his will sometime after Suez, and then, and only then, to raise the promised pay and pension of those officers who would later join up. This betrayal by the Admiralty was a never-ending source of upset and rancor. The more wartime service and action you'd seen, the less of a pension you received. The commander would write letters to Navy ministers and members of Parliament, and he even joined an association of on-the-beach ex-officers like himself. But one day, when tiring of his plaintiveness, I told him that nothing would change until he and his comrades marched in the phalanx to Buckingham Palace and handed back their uniforms and swords and scabbards and medals, he was quite shocked. Oh, he responded, we couldn't think of doing that. Thus did I begin to see, or thought I began to see, how the British Conservatives kept the fierce, irrational loyalty of those whom they exploited. He's a Tory, I was much later to hear of some dogged loyalist, but he's got nothing to be Tory about. My thoughts immediately flew to my father, whose own devotion and brave loyalism had been estimated so cheaply by what I was by then calling the ruling class. When I say that we didn't hold much converse, I suppose that I should blame myself as well as him. But in some ways I don't blame myself that much. At the age of ten or so, I turned from the newspaper to ask him why the paratroopers from Algeria were threatening to occupy Paris and proclaim a military coup d'etat in mainland France. His typical two-word response, Gallic temperament, rather dried up my interest in pursuing the subject any further. But I disappointed him, too, I know. He would have liked me to be good at games and sports, as he was. I couldn't even pretend to care about cricket or rugby or any of that. Convinced that I might want to earn my colours instead as some kind of scout, he went to a huge amount of trouble to send me, at my prep school, miniature versions of complicated knots executed in string and pipe cleaner and neatly diagrammed. Had I bothered to master these, I could perhaps later have made better headway with the nautico-literary descriptions of the vessels and ropes of Hornblower and Aubrey, and their halyards and bowlins and main braces, the most alarming of the latter being the cunt splice, demanded by Captain Aubrey from his boatswain in a heated moment, about which I could certainly never have asked Commander Hitchens. He was quite a small man, and when he took off his uniform, or had it taken away from him, and went to work as a bookkeeper, looked very slightly shrunken. For as long as he could, he took jobs that kept him near the sea, especially near the Hampshire-Sussex coast. He would work for a boat builder here, a speedboat manufacturer there. We finally drifted inland, nearer to the centre of my mother's beloved Oxford, where there was a boy's prep school that needed an accountant, and he seized the chance to acquire a dog. I hadn't realised until then quite how much he preferred the predictability and loyalty of animals to the vagaries and frailties of human beings. Late in life, the landlords of the apartment building where he lived were to tell him that he couldn't keep his red setter retriever mix, a lovely animal named Beckett. The now-beached commander couldn't afford to move house again, so instead of protesting, he meekly gave the dog away, but not before mooting with me a plan to establish Beckett somewhere else, so that I could go and visit him from time to time. Again I had the experience of a moment of piercing pity of the sort I could only now imagine feeling for a child of mine 
who it was beyond my power to help. I do have a heroic memory of him from my boyhood, and it happens to concern water. We were at a swimming pool party held at the local golf and country club that was almost but not quite out of our social orbit. When I heard a splash and saw the commander fully clothed in the shallow end, pipe, still clamped in his mouth, I remember hoping that he'd not fallen in, in front of all these people, because of the gin. Then I saw that he was holding a little girl in his arms. She'd been drowning, quietly, just outside her depth, until someone had squealed an alarm, and my father had been the speediest man to act. I remember two things about the aftermath. The first was the commander's no fuss, anyone would have done it, attitude to those who slapped him on the back in admiration. That was absolutely in character and to be expected. But the second was the glare of undisguised rage and hatred from the little girl's father, who should have been paying attention, and who had instead been quaffing and laughing with his pals. That hateful look taught me a lot about human nature in a short time. Otherwise, I'm rather barren of paternal recollections, and shall have to settle for the memory of a few walks and for the strange cult of golf. Seafarer though he was, my father loved the downlands of Hampshire and Sussex, and later Oxfordshire and could stride along with his trusty stick, pointing out here a steading and there a ridgeway. He was a Saxon in his own way, and still had the attitude, now almost extinct, that there had been such a thing as the Norman yoke imposed upon this ancient landscape and people. A favourite joke on his side of the family concerned the Hampshire yeoman in dispute with his squire. "'I suppose you know,' observes the squire loftily, "'that my ancestors came over with William the Conqueror.' Yes, responds the yeoman, we were waiting for you. In an alternative version once offered by the rogue Marxist Welshman Raymond Williams, the yeoman tries to be witty and says, Oh yes, and how are you liking it over here? I mention this because a certain kind of British conservatism is quite closely connected with this folk memory of populism and ethnicity, and because it became important for me to comprehend this later on. The golf game must have taken place when I was about thirteen, I had taken up the sport and even got myself a few clubs with the idea that I ought to have something in common with my reticent old man, who loved golf and treasured a pewter mug he had once won in a Navy tournament held on the deck of an aircraft carrier. My effort paid off, if only once. We had a round of nine holes that somehow went well for both of us, and then he treated me to a heavy tea in the clubhouse where, if nothing much got said, there was no tension or awkwardness either. It was the closest I ever came or felt to him. There was a very soft and beautiful dusk, I remember, as we drove slowly and quietly home through the purple and yellow gorse of the moors. Once I'd left home for university and then for London, and once my mother had been taken from us, and once he had had to hear, and from his son at that, that Yvonne had not been murdered but had slain herself while distraught about another man, a very slight but definite coolness replaced the respectful distance that had developed between me and the commander. More than anything, this chill consisted of a subject, the prior existence of his wife and my mother, that he simply would not and could not discuss with me. Over time, all the same, there was the occasional thaw. He disliked coming to London on principle, and had enraged me when I was younger by refusing to take a job as the secretary of Brooks's club. I could have been living in London, in Mayfair, for heaven's sake, and when I was a teenager. But I did once lure him to the detested city to see a musical about Fats Waller, an uncharacteristic favourite of his, called Your Feet's Too Big, and he once astonished me by asking, in the late 1970s, if I'd care to come with him to the reunion of his old shipmates. Turning up at some down-at-heel Navy Veterans Club on the appointed night, I was quick to realise that this late muster was almost certainly going to be the last one, for the fine company that had once crewed the good ship Jamaica. But how brave and modest and honest and unassuming they were, these men who had bucketed through icy storms and every kind of peril in order to sweep Hitler from the seas. An oddly touching detail stays with me. Instead of referring to my father as Eric or the commander, they all called him Hitch, which was what my close friends were beginning to call me. At around this time... I was starting to turn my thoughts and ambitions toward America, which the grizzled veteran showed no interest in visiting. In uniform, at any rate, he'd been everywhere from China to Chile to Cyprus to Ceylon. But the New World held no charms for him, 
and at our infrequent meetings he never evinced any curiosity about the place. If he asked a question on another topic, it would be of the rhetorical kind. Don't you think Northern Ireland could do with a good stiff dose of martial law? Almost as if force had never yet been tried in the black record of British rule in Ireland. And if he made a statement, there might very well be a rhetorical element there too. If they build this bloody channel tunnel and join us to France, he once said in what I'd call the classical statement of his worldview, I shall never vote Conservative again. I sometimes used to wonder if he was saying these things for effect, or even because of the gin, but if challenged, he would restate things even more decidedly. A tendency I have since come to notice, and sometimes to deplore, in myself. He must have known that he had some kind of a red for a son, but he seemed to manage to talk to me as if I still had elementary Saxon common sense, and I was very affected when I discovered that by stealth to his small circle of friends, he was giving Christmas gift subscriptions to my Pinko magazine, The New Statesman. Rather interesting piece by my son in that last issue. Don't know if you noticed it. Did this make up for my failures as a sportsman? I doubt it, but then I had to ask myself if I had chosen the field of journalism to compensate for other shortcomings on the field of valour. On this point, too, he administered more of a shock to me than he can have intended. After I had returned from a visit to Lebanon in the mid-1970s, and a trip to the war zone in the south of that country that I'd later written up for the magazine. I was sitting at my desk one afternoon when the telephone rang, and it was the commander. This occurrence was rare enough in itself to make me worry that something might be amiss. But he was calling to say that he'd admired my article, and while I was still searching for the words in which to respond, he in effect doubled the stakes by saying he thought it had been rather brave of me to go there. And then, as I grappled with that rather vertiginous development, he said goodbye and replaced the receiver. A man of few words, as I believe I have said. At the time, I couldn't make any definite connection between my own visits to the places where he'd been stationed, from the South Atlantic to the Eastern Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean, and the commander's earlier presence there. I myself could not picture how these one-time colonies must have looked when viewed through a massive ship's gun sight or from the deck of a superbly engineered war machine. In truth, when in Cyprus or in Palestine, or southern Africa or elsewhere, I generally felt myself so much in sympathy with those who had resisted British rule that I thought it better for the commander and myself to avoid the subject. If you had asked me then about the likelihood of the Union Jack flying again over Basra or the Khyber Pass, I would have both mocked and scorned the idea. Yet when the Argentine fascist junta invaded the Falkland Islands in the early days of 1982, just after I'd emigrated to New York, I felt a sudden stab of partisanship for the Royal Navy as it sailed out to reverse the outcome. I even wrote to the commander in fairly gung-ho terms, hoping for a hint of common ground. His response surprised and even slightly depressed me. I don't know if it frightens the enemy, he wrote, about Britain's last war footing fleet as it found its inexorable way to the South Atlantic, but it certainly frightens me. This slightly hackneyed borrowing from what the Duke of Wellington had said of his infamous army of drunken and homicidal riffraff on the eve of Waterloo, left me feeling flat. Waterlooville was the name of a suburb of Portsmouth, and there was a celebrated pub called the Heroes of Waterlooville, whose inn sign showed the redcoats smashing Bonaparte's old guard. So he had to know that I would find his historical allusion slightly trite. On reflection, though, I'm able to see what I did learn from my father. I had once thought that he'd helped me understand the Tory mentality, all the better to combat and repudiate it. And in that respect, he was greatly, if accidentally, instructive. But over the longer stretch, I've come to realize that he taught me, without ever intending to, what it is to feel disappointed and betrayed by your own side. He had a certain idea of England, insular to a degree, and conservative for sure, but not always, or not necessarily, reactionary. In this England... Patient merit would take precedence over the insolence of office, and people who earned their money would be accorded more respect than people who merely had it or made it. The antiquity and tranquility of the landscape and the coastline would likewise have earned their share of deference. Those who wanted to uproot or to develop an area would have to make a case for change, rather than be permitted the glib and clever assumption that change was a good thing in itself. And yet the post-war Conservative Party had become the agent of hectic and greedy modernistic metamorphosis, tearing up the old railway lines and cutting new swathes of motorway through hill and forest and dale, 
licensing the commercial principle in everything from television to elections, contemptuous of tradition, handing the skylines and harbours of our grand and blitz seaports to builders and speculators, who swiftly made them unrecognisable to the veterans who had made those place names honoured and famous. And this was just in the time of Harold Macmillan. If the commander had lived to see the full impact of Thatcherism, he would have felt that there was almost nothing left worth fighting for, or rather having fought for. I have so few vivid memories of him that one may do duty for many. We had gone as a family into Portsmouth for the opening night of The Longest Day. This epic film about the D-Day landings would, I knew from experience, be almost certain to annoy or disappoint the commander in at least one of two ways. The movie would either understate the role of Britain in the historic storming of the beaches of occupied Europe, reversing an ancient verdict by having us invade Normandy, or it would underplay the part of the Royal Navy in this hinge event. In the event it was grudgingly agreed in the car on the way home that fairness had at least been attempted. There were a few laughs at the expense of the Yanks and their gadgets, and a few reminiscences of the Dieppe raid that had raised the curtain on Normandy, a hellish fiasco in which the commander had helped land the doomed Canadian forces on bullet-swept beaches, with Lord Mountbatten, an especially vain member of the British royal family, as part of his ship's company. But this effort at good cheer was all aimed at erasing what had occurred before the cinema's curtains had parted. My father had come back from the box office with the news that only the most absurdly expensive or the most abjectly cheap seats were now available. He looked quite put out at this. Didn't the throng for this film understand that he'd practically been there? Yvonne attempted modification. Who snapped up the tickets, then? The affluent society, I suppose. You have that right, said the commander, with bitterness. He'd done so much for the Empire, and it had done so little for him in return. If I had had my way, he would have been respectfully escorted to a front row seat or perhaps a box. But I also admired him for his lack of guile and his dislike for anything that was surreptitious or underhand. While in the Royal Navy, he had indignantly refused any advances from the Freemasons, even though this mafia of the mediocre might, had he but joined them, have swung the difference between being promoted and otherwise. One loyalty was enough for him. His candor and modesty once almost caused me to weep. He told of a senior officer who had asked him if he'd come and help out at a cocktail party on the base. It was explained to him in confidence by his superior that the event was meant to soak up all the bores who hadn't been invited to anything yet. Thank you, sir, he had replied, but I believe I have already received my invitation. Yvonne's face, when he told this story in company, was a frozen study that I never forgot. The commander lost his last proper job in a similarly naive way, feeling himself obliged to tell the boys' school in Oxford, the place which had furnished his last and only economic security, that he had reached the statutory retirement age. Honestly, Eric, the somewhat shambolic headmaster later informed me he had told him, you didn't have to do that. Nobody was going to make anything of it. Nobody ever even thought of asking. But now that you have bloody well told us, the Board of Governors has no legal option but to give you a gold watch or something and let you go. And so he went, quietly and uncomplainingly as ever. Strangely, though, the matter of his age was also the only thing in which I ever caught him out in a petty dishonesty. He used to tell us that he had been born in 1912. My brother Peter and I were both amateur numismatists in boyhood, and these were the days when hoop-sized pennies from the Victorian and Edwardian era could still turn up in your small change. If we found a 1912 coin, we would show him, and then proudly hoard and sometimes even mount and display it. It was somehow deflating to discover, as he must have known we would, that he had been born in 1909. I still cannot be sure why he practiced this uncharacteristic deception, conceivably to attenuate the difference in years between himself and Yvonne. But she could not possibly have been fooled, as his sons pointlessly were. In his last years, in enforced semi-retirement, he did some very small-time bookkeeping work for a medical man of sorts in the out-of-the-way Oxfordshire village of Sutton Courtney, where George Orwell is buried and where, when I once visited, the vicar led me to the spot and then said, Oh, sorry, wrong grave. This one says Eric Blair. 
Eric Ernest Hitchens's own grave is on Portstown Hill, overlooking what Arthur Conan Doyle used to call the Narrow Sea. This historic stretch of water was decidedly and historically ours. I do not say, Lord St. Vincent is supposed to have told Parliament in the Napoleonic Epoch, that our enemies cannot come. I only say that they cannot come by sea. Here is the chapel where General Eisenhower said a prayer for fine weather and victory the night before the D-Day landings in Normandy. A stained-glass window commemorates the modest warrior who later became President of the United States. Commander Hitchens had once assured me after a visit to my long bedridden grandfather that he would not make a protracted business of dying, and he was as good as his word. He died in 1987, aged 78. Having never spent a day in bed in his life, he went very speedily from diagnosis of an inoperable cancer in his esophagus to a hammer blow heart attack that gave his hostess, his sister Ina, barely time to rush to his side. My aunt Ina had also landed on the beaches of Normandy as a nurse in the second wave, another excellent day's work, and got all the way to Germany before they told her to stop. The commander's funeral took place on a day of bitter and extreme cold. I dismounted from the train at what had once been my homebound station for the school holidays. By a macabre coincidence, as I walked through the freezing station yard, I saw workmen painting out the faint storefront sign, Susanna Monday, on what had once been my mother's sad attempt at a dress shop. I was able to see my father in his last repose before the screwing on of the lid, and later to do for him what he had once done for me, and carry him on my shoulders. We laid the coffin in the chancel of the D-Day chapel. My brother had made all the liturgical and musical arrangements with a clear eye to tradition and dignity. I rather pity those Anglo-American families to whom the Navy hymn is not a part of the emotional furniture. Its words and music are impossibly stirring even to one who finds the opening words Eternal Father doubly problematic. The tune is actually called Melita, after the old name of the island of Malta where St. Paul was shipwrecked, and was written for someone who was about to take ship across the Atlantic for the United States. My own text was from that same Paul of Tarsus and from his epistle to the Philippians which I selected for its non-religious yet high moral character. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Try looking that up in a modern version of the New Testament. It's Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and see what a ration of bland doggerel you get. I shall never understand how the keepers and trustees of the King James Version threw away such a treasure, but that very thought, if you like, is partly taken from my father's legacy of suspicion of change and of resistance to the rude shock of the new. The commander had no surviving friends to speak of, and in the misty churchyard there were only a few gaunt Hampshire faces with that Hitchens look the look of the tough South English peasant that one can sometimes also see in Georgia and the Carolinas. These distant kinsmen gave a hasty clasp of the hand and faded back into the chalky landscape. It was all stark enough to have pleased my father at his most downbeat. An absence of fuss could be noted. I suddenly remembered the most contemptuous word I'd ever heard the old man utter. Discovering me lying in the bath with a cigarette, a book, and a perilously perched glass— I must have been attempting some adolescent version of the aesthetic. He almost barked. What is this? Luxury? That this was another word for sin, drawn from the repertory of antique Calvinism, I immediately understood. That my mother would have approved, though perhaps languidly preferring a chaise longue to a bath, I also knew. So, here you have my two much opposed and sharply discrepant ancestral stems, two stray branches that only war and chance could ever have caused to become entwined. I ought not to overstate the contradictions. One of the two apparently stern and flinty and martial and continent and pessimistic, the other exotic and beseeching and hopeful and tentative, yet the first one very much less sturdy than it should by rights have been. Even though it has left me with a strong sense of fight or flight on family occasions, and a real dread of clan occasions such as birthdays and Christmas and other moments of mandatory gaiety, I am grateful enough for the blessed anxiety and unease that it has bequeathed to me.
Fragments from an education. Here's what Anthony Pohl says in his Infants of the Spring. Orwell, Connolly, War, Betjeman, to name only a few, have pungently described the disenchantments of school days. I do not wish to appear less competent than my contemporaries in making creep the flesh of the epicure of sadomasochistic school reminiscence. And here's how Evelyn War puts it in Brides Every Visited. That stoic red-skin interlude which our schools intrude between the fast-flowing tears of the child and the man. I now claim Stanford, California as a part of my own turf, but I was extremely apprehensive and feeling very junior when I first glimpsed the campus in 1987. The impression of first day at school in its grand quads was only enhanced by the effort of my old friend Edward Said, with whom I was visiting the campus for a conference, to encourage me to feel more at home. Come on, he said, we'll go and take a cocktail from Ian Watt. I was made additionally nervous by the thought of introduction to this dry, wry, and donish figure, the world's expert on Joseph Conrad and the author of The Rise of the Novel. On greeting, he caused me to feel even more uneasy by drawing attention to the unusual number of Japanese students who could be seen from his windows. I know it's silly to say so, but it still makes me feel odd sometimes. Nobody could have been less chauvinistic than Ian Watt, but then... He was one of the few survivors of the bridge on the River Kwai, the Burma Railroad, Changi Jail in Singapore, and other Hirohito horrors that I still capitalize in my mind. He admitted later that, detecting other people's reserve after returning home from these wartime nightmares, he developed a manner of discussing them apotropaically, as it were, so as to defuse them a bit, and he told me the following tale, which I set down with the hope that it captures his memorably laconic tone of voice. We were in a cell that was probably built for six, but was holding about 16 of us. There wasn't much food, and we hadn't been given any water for quite a while. The heat was absolutely ferocious. Dysentery had begun to take its toll, which was distinctly disagreeable at such close quarters. Added to this unpleasantness, we could hear one of our number being rather badly beaten by the Japanese guards, with rifle butts, it seemed, in their guardroom down the corridor. At this rather trying moment, one of my young subalterns, who'd managed to fall asleep, started screaming and flailing and yelling. He was shouting, No, no, don't, please don't, not any more, not again. Oh, God, please, no. Hideous noises like that. I had to take a snap decision to prevent panic, so I ordered the sergeant to slap him, wake him up. When he came to, he apologized for being a bore, but brokenly confessed that he dreamed he was back at Tunbridge. My laughter at this, for all its brilliant timing and understatement, was very slightly awkward. Watt went on to recall an interview with that other old Asia hand, E. M. Forster, in which he'd been asked as an old boy of Tunbridge School whether he would ever agree to write an article for the school magazine. Only, said the author of A Passage to India, if it could be against compulsory games. The very phrase, compulsory games, had automatic resonance for me, bringing back not merely the memory of freezing soccer and rugby pitches, and of the gloating sadists who infested the changing rooms that were the aftermath of these pointless contests, but also W. H. Auden's suggestive line in one of his greatest poems, the 1st of September 1939, and helpless governors wake to resume their compulsory game. It was indeed Auden, who had been a master at such a school, as well as having been a pupil at one, who had said that the experience had given him an instinctive understanding of what it would be like to live under fascism. He had also said, when told by the headmaster, that only the cream attended the school. Yes, I know what you mean. Thick and rich. But this is where I must very slightly disappoint you. The three great subjects of beating, bullying, and buggery, the junior or cadet equivalent of Winston Churchill's naval triptych of rum, sodomy, and the lash, are familiar enough to me in their way, and I've often been closely questioned, usually by girls, about their influence on my formation. I was subjected to a certain amount and to a certain extent to the first two of the big Bs, but not, my italics, to the third. I should perhaps add that I was never big or strong or desperate enough to inflict any of the above procedures on anyone else. In fact, in the annals of British boarding school trauma, I scarcely count even as walking wounded. This is because, at the very last moment, I was saved from having to go to Tunbridge. Have you ever walked away from a car smash without a scathe? 
or had that other experience so well evoked by Winston Churchill, the sheer perfect relief of being shot at by someone who's missed you. I have, in fact, had both these experiences, but neither approximates to my sense of deliverance from the Tunbridge Inn. It was once again a matter of my mother versus my father, neither of them knowing anything about the upper reaches of the education system. It had been decided when I was born to put my name down for the only school with which we had contact, run by someone who had once been on the same warship as the commander. This seemed an efficient rather than a random way of doing things. However, and just before I was due to take the entrance exam at the age of 13, my mother bethought herself that it might be worth taking a look at the place where I was due to be conscripted for the next five formative years. You would not, gentle reader, be scanning these pages had it been otherwise. Tunbridge was a synonym for those Spartan schools, where the empire, the church, the cricket field, the war memorial, and the monarchy were, well, sovereign. The blue-eyed boy, small for his age and with rather feminine eyelashes, who is indifferent to sports and happiest in the library, is buggered, not to say beaten and bullied. All this Yvonne saw, or I suppose I should say she somehow intuited, at a glance. My poor parents. During my infancy in Scotland, I had had to be taken away from one school with the forbidding name of Inch Keith, when it had been noticed at home that I cowered and flung up a protective arm every time an adult male came near me. Investigation showed the place to be a minor hell of flagellation and abuse, such a pathetic euphemism for the real thing. So I was taken away and put in a nearer establishment named Camdean. On my first day there, I was hit between the eyes with a piece of slate, during an exchange of views with the Catholic school across the road, with whom our hardened Protestant gangs were at odds. Innocent of any interest in this quarrel, I nonetheless bear the faint scar of it, above the bridge of my nose, to this day. For the next five years, by now removed southward to Devon, where my Fifeshire accent was duly knocked out of me, I underwent an experience that was once commonplace, but has now become as remote and obscure in its way as travel by steam train. Indeed, I often have difficulty convincing my graduate students that I really did go off to prep school at the age of eight, from station platforms begrimed with coal dust and echoing to the mounting womp, womp, woof, woof of the pistons beginning to turn, as my own trunk and tuck box were loaded into a luggage car. Not only that, but that I wore corduroy shorts in all weathers, blazers with a school crest on Sundays, slept in a dormitory with open windows, began every day with a cold bath, followed by the declension of Latin irregular verbs, wolfed lumpy porridge for breakfast, attended compulsory divine service every morning and evening, and kept a diary in which, in a special code, I recorded the number of times when I was left alone with a grown-up man, perhaps four times my weight and five times my age, and bent over to be thrashed with a cane. The strange thing, or so I now think, was the way in which it didn't feel all that strange. The fictions and cartoons of Nigel Millsworth, of Paul Pennyfeather in Wars, Decline and Fall, and numberless other chapters of English literary folklore, have somehow made all this mania and ritual appear normal, even praiseworthy. Did we suspect our schoolmasters, not to mention their weirdly etiolated female companions or wives, when they had any, of being in any way odd, not to say queer. We had scarcely the equipment with which to express the idea, and anyway, what would this awful thought make of our parents, who were paying, as we were so often reminded, a princely sum for our privileged existences? The word privilege was indeed employed without stint. Yes, I think that must have been it. If we had not been certain that we were better off than the oafs and jerks who lived on housing estates and went to state-run day schools, we might have asked more questions about being robbed of all privacy, encouraged to inform on one another, taught how to fawn upon authority and turn upon the vulnerable outsider, and subjected at all times to rules which it was not always possible to understand, let alone to obey. I think it was that last point which impressed itself upon me most, and which made me shudder with recognition when I read Auden's otherwise overwrought comparison of the English boarding school to a totalitarian regime. The conventional word that's employed to describe tyranny is systematic. The true essence of a dictatorship is, in fact, not its regularity, but its unpredictability and caprice. Those who live under it must never be able to relax, must never be quite sure if they have followed the rules correctly or not. The only rule of thumb was, whatever is not compulsory is forbidden. 
Thus, the ruled can always be found to be in the wrong. The ability to run such a system is among the greatest pleasures of arbitrary authority. And I count myself lucky, if that's the word, to have worked this out by the time I was ten. Later in life, I came up with the term micromegalomaniac to describe those who are content to maintain absolute domination of a small sphere. I know what the germ of the idea was, all right. Hitchens, take that look off your face. Near instant panic. I hadn't realized I was wearing a look. Face crime. Hitchens, report yourself at once to the study. Report myself for what, sir? Don't make it worse for yourself, Hitchens. You know perfectly well. But I didn't. And then... Hitchens, it's not just that you've let the whole school down. You've let yourself down. To myself, I was frantically muttering, now what? It turned out to be some dormitory sex game from which, though the fools in charge didn't know it, I had in fact been excluded. But a protestation of my innocence would have been, as in any inquisition, an additional proof of guilt. There were other manifestations, too. There was nowhere to hide. The lavatory doors sometimes had no bolts. One was always subject to invigilation, waking and sleeping. Collective punishment was something I learned about swiftly. Until the offender confesses in public, a giant voice would intone, all your privileges will be withdrawn. There were curfews where we were kept at our desks or in our dormitories, under a cloud of threats while officialdom prowled the corridors in search of unspecified crimes and criminals. Again I stress the matter of sheer scale. The teachers were enormous compared to us, and this lent a Brobdingnagian aspect to the scene. In seeming contrast, but in fact as reinforcement, there would be long and jolly periods where masters and boys would join in scenes of compulsory enthusiasm, usually over the achievements of a sports team, and would celebrate great moments of victory over lesser and smaller schools. I remember years later reading about Stalin that the intimates of his inner circle were always at their most nervous when he was in a good mood, and understanding instantly what was meant by that. And yet it still wasn't fascism, and the men and women who ran this bizarre microcosm were dedicated in their own weird way. The school was on the edge of Dartmoor, the site of the famously grim prison in War's Decline and Fall, and haggard, despairing escaped convicts were more than once recaptured after hiding in the sheds on our cricket grounds. Yet the natural beauty of the region was astonishing, and our teachers were on hand all day and at weekends, many of them conveying their enthusiasm for birds and animals and trees. We were, all of us, compelled to sit through lessons in the sinister fairy tales of Christianity as well, and nature was sometimes enlisted as illustrating God's design. But I can't pretend that I hated singing the hymns or learning the psalms, and I enjoyed being in the choir, and was honoured when asked to read from the lectern on Sundays. In fact, as you have perhaps guessed, I was getting an early training in the idea that life meant keeping two separate and distinct sets of books. If my parents knew what really went on at the school, I used to think, not being the first little boy to imagine that my main job was that of protecting parental innocence, they'd faint from the shock. So I would be staunch and defend them from the knowledge. Meanwhile, and speaking of books, the school possessed its very own library, and several of the masters had private collections of their own to which one might be admitted, not always without risk to these men's immortal souls, as a great treat. This often feels as if it happened to somebody else, yet I can be sure it did not because I can recall the element of sadomasochism so well. Awareness of this is no doubt innate in all of us, and I suppose a case could be made for teaching it to children as part of sex education or the facts of life, but I had to sit in a freezing classroom at first light at a tender age and hear my silver-haired Latin teacher, Mr. Witherington, approach the verge of tears as he digressed from the study of Caesar and Tacitus and told us with an awful catch in his voice of the way in which he had been flogged at Eastbourne School. And that same brutish academy, we thought, as we squirmed our tiny rears on the wooden benches, was one of those to which we were supposed to aspire. I think I wish I had not been introduced, so early, to the connection between obscure sexual excitement and the infliction or the reception of pain. Again come the two sets of books. I would escape to the library and lose myself in the adventure stories of John Buchan and Sapper and G. A. Henty and Percy Westerman, and acquaint myself with imperial military values, just as, unknown to me in the England of the late 1950s that lay outside the school's boundary, these were going straight out of style. Meanwhile, and on the other side of the ledger, I would tell myself that I wasn't really part of the hierarchy of cruelty, either as bully or victim. 
I wasn't any use at sports. I didn't have the kind of keenness that made one even a junior prefect. But on the other hand, I did need to protect myself from being a mere weed and weakly and kickback. Sometimes there was a fatso or freak toward whom I could divert the attention of the mob, but I can honestly claim to have become ashamed of this tactic. There came a day when, without exactly realizing it in a fully conscious manner, I understood that words could function as weapons. I don't remember all the offenses and hurts that had been inflicted on me, but I do recollect exactly what I said as I whirled on my playground tormentor, an especially vile boy named Welshman, who was a snitch and a stool pigeon, as well as the embodiment of the not invariably reliable maxim that all bullies are cowards at heart. You, I said, in fairly level but loud tones through my split lips, are a liar, a bully, a coward, and a thief. It was amazing to see the way in which this lummox fell back, his face filling with alarm. It was also quite something to see the tide of playground public opinion turn so suddenly against him. Looking back, it is the masochistic element that impresses me more than the sadistic one. It's relatively easy to see why people want to exert power over others, but what fascinated me was the way in which the victims colluded in the business. Bullies would acquire a personal squad of toadies with impressive speed and ease. The more tyrannical the schoolmaster, the more those who lived in fear of him would rush to placate him and to anticipate his moods. Small boys who were ill-favoured or out of favour with authority would swiftly attract the derision and contempt of the majority as well. I still writhe when I think how little I did to oppose this. My tongue sharpened itself mainly in my own defence. The commander by now not being a huge figure in my universe, the substitute father figures of school authority took up correspondingly more space. Years later, Alexander War, inspired biographer of his own father and grandfather, showed me Franz Kafka's letter to my father. I didn't find this fascinating document, which old man Kafka never read, reminding me at all of my domestic pater, but I know exactly what came to me when I read Kafka's recollection of the many occasions on which I had, according to your clearly expressed opinion, deserved a beating, but was let off at the last moment by your grace. I again accumulated only a huge sense of guilt. On every side I was to blame. I was in your debt. Well, my memory of how that felt was as vivid as possible. Gratitude for having been spared. Vague guilt, at an offence I had not known about or guessed at. Thought crime. Strong fear of a repeat offence that I could not predict or avoid. The emotion of relief colliding with the feeling of unworthiness. And fear of the all-powerful boss, too combined with an awareness of all the blessings and forgiveness which it was in his almighty power to bestow. One of the most awful reproaches in the school's arsenal of psychological torture, Orwell catches it very well in his essay, Such, Such Were the Joys, was the one about one's sickly ingratitude, the selfish refusal to shape up after all that had been done on one's behalf. Of course I now recognize this as the working model drawn from monotheistic religion, where love is compulsory, and must be offered to a higher being whom one must necessarily also fear. This moral blackmail is based on a quintessential servility. The fact that the headmaster held the prayer book and the Bible during the services also drove home to me the obvious fact that religion is an excellent reinforcement of shaky temporal authority. Hugh Wortham, my huge and dominating headmaster and introducer to the dark arts of corporal punishment, was a lifelong bachelor, but some of the local mothers found him handsome, and Yvonne gaily said that he put her in mind of Rex Harrison. His huge brawny furry arms and his immense horseshoes of teeth made him seem almost gorilla-like to me, and a bold contrast to the rather slight figure of the commander. His rages would shake the windows and make small boys turn white. His good moods were a hell to endure and a challenge to manipulate. Heaven knows what he'd been through sexually, he himself didn't stoop to fiddling with any of us, but if you were occasionally favoured, as I occasionally was, you would be given a copy of David Blaze or one of the Jeremy novels and asked if you'd care to read it in your free time. Though I didn't have the vocabulary for this in those days, I now know quite a lot about E.F. Benson and Hugh Walpole, and I sensed even then that this was the world of the smouldering and yearning and repressed adult homosexual fixated on his own school days, and probably most attracted to those who are themselves blithely unaware of the intensity of the attention. 
There were also some masters, twitchy and sad, and at the end of their tethers and the close of their careers, who, by the same herd instinct, we knew to be fair game. Poor old Mr. Robertson. Rubber guts. With his decrepit Austin car and his equally decrepit wife Lydia. Couldn't keep order and made the fatal mistake of trying to curry favour with the boys by little acts of kindness and bribery with sweets. He was childless and pathetic, and he taught the unmanly subject of geography, and we somehow knew that the real authorities in the school didn't respect him either, so we felt free to make his life a misery. There was more satisfaction to be had in teasing and torturing a feeble member of the establishment than there was in cornering some hapless and pustular bedwetter of our own cohort. Rubber Guts eventually left the school and, for all I know, died in poverty in some seaside boarding house. But before we broke him, the poor childless chap swooped on me one day in the changing rooms, caught me out of the armpits, held me up, and gave me, or to be exact, my forehead, the most chaste possible kiss. Then he put me down and silently, sadly, mooched away. At first I thought I had a good tale to share with my fellow gloating little beasts, but then I found myself admitting that there had been nothing so creepy about it. Merely something melancholy, and I never said a word to a soul. It's strange how the boundary between the knowing and the innocent is subconsciously patrolled. One may be apparently quite wised up, while being in reality quite naive, or entirely unaware of the grosser aspects of existence, while yet possessing some intuition of what lies on the other side of the adult veil. I couldn't make this encounter seem dirty, while there were boys more advanced than myself who could make even the word clean sound suggestive. I suspected that they sometimes pretended to know more than they really did. I was also pretending, but I was bluffing in a different way, about my aptitude in English literature and history. Backward in hormonal development, I could show precocity when it came to longer words and harder books. The best plan here is to bite off more than you can chew. At the age of twelve, I'd summoned the nerve to borrow from the headmaster and to read War and Peace. Emboldened by the sheer bulk of the thing, I swerved into Prescott's History of the Conquest of Mexico. Of these, I retained for a long time, apart from the fascinating family trees of the Rostovs and the Balkonskis, the memory of the Battle of Borodino and of the military alliance between the people of Tlaxcala and the Spaniards against the Aztecs. In other words, I was inhaling these classics essentially as adventure stories, but when I later had to take an examination on Henry V, I was able to make a comparison between King Henry the Knight before Agincourt and Pierre Bazukov before Borodino, which made me feel that I hadn't just been showing off to myself or indeed to others. Nonetheless, I was probably insufferable until one very observant master, a man named Eyre, who was later sacked after a horrific lapse into pederasty, instilled in me a sense of proportion— you might try this, he said diffidently, slipping into my hand the first novel of Evelyn War. The headmaster followed up with some P.G. Woodhouse. How can I forget the moment when, in the company of Paul Pennyfeather and Mr. Mulliner, I learned that to be amusing was not to be frivolous, and that language, always the language, was the magic key as much to prose as to poetry. Perhaps two or three times a year I receive a questionnaire from some writer's organization or some writerly magazine asking me to name my formative books. The temptation to inflate the currency of the past is always present. It was when perusing the immortal Gustave Flaubert at the tender age of X that my eyes were open to. In fact, I suspect that it doesn't very much matter what one reads in the early years, once one has acquired the essential ability to read, for pleasure alone. My parents were less quick than my teachers to get this point. I had an erratic godmother who, on one of her visits, decided to make up for all her previous lapses, and actually to provide me with a present. I was accordingly taken by the whole family to a fine bookshop in Plymouth and told to pick any six books that I liked. It didn't take long. I wanted a garish series of the adventures of Billy Bunter. I was sternly told by my seniors that this wouldn't do at all, and provided instead with a very handsome set of Arthur Ransom's uplifting stories about enterprising English children in the great outdoors. In revenge, these remained mouldering on my top shelf, never even opened, until I contrived to leave them behind in one of our many family moves. Thus, all unknowingly, I passed up the chance of introduction to an author who, as Manchester Guardian corresponded in Moscow in 1918, 
had exposed the secret treaties that were behind the First World War, and had a fling with Trotsky's secretary into the bargain. It shocked me to discover that later on, as it would most certainly have shocked the relatives who pressed ransom on me. My mother was out of sorts for a whole day. Silly boy, she said. Aunt Pam was in such a good mood that you could easily have had a nice wristwatch if you'd asked for it. But I didn't want a bloody wristwatch. I wanted to be left alone, with a pile of books of my own choice. And very gradually, and as it does, omnivorous reading began to become a little more discriminating. I spent a long time wallowing in the pleasures of the good-bad book, as G. K. Chesterton, later plagiarized by George Orwell, was to term this tempting genre. John Buchan's Richard Hannay romances and colonial yarns, and then Neville Shute's stories about Australia, Malaya, engineering, and with his masterpiece On the Beach, The Foretaste of Nuclear Anxiety. Dennis Wheatley's melodramas of Satanism and the Occult, spiced with a very heavy dash of reactionary politics, gave me a brief interest in numerology and then helped to inoculate me against superstition in general. C.S. Forrester's Hornblower stories had a perhaps unintended effect, in that they showed me that a British naval hero could simultaneously be a martyr to doubt and introspection, as well as be aware of the slave trade, which up until then I thought the Royal Navy had aided only in putting down. On a seemingly parallel track, I was still being educated for an order of things that, without my fully realizing it, was very rapidly passing away. Hearing something about fighting in far-off British-run Malaya, I would ask a boy whose father served there what the Malays were like. Jolly loyal, was his reply. Even at the time, this struck me as cryptically unsatisfactory. The situation in the Central African Federation sometimes seeped into the news. When I inquired about southern Rhodesia, one of the masters instantly said that the native inhabitants were only just down from the trees. The first, but not at all the last time, that I was to hear that loathsome expression. The only mentionable problem with the existing Conservative government of Harold Macmillan was that it was too liberal and had given in to the wogs and jippos, Egyptians, over the Suez Canal. On Guy Fawkes night, that wondrous evening of roast chestnuts and fireworks and mellow fruitfulness, the ceremonial pyre was often surmounted by a symbolically unpopular figure of a later vintage than 1605. One year the headmaster decreed that the immolated carcass be that of Sir David Eccles, then a blamelessly mediocre Minister of Education. He'd allowed himself to make some remarks that were critical of the public, or rather, private schools, the essential rampart of English educational hierarchy. Hitchens, said the terrifying Mr. Wortham, you have a sense of history, or so it seems. If our great public schools were to be swept away, it would be worse even than the dissolution of the monasteries. Having at that stage only cropped and grazed on the lower slopes of Wordsworthian verse, I could not quite visualize the proportions of this world historical calamity, but I seemed to see an epoch passing, and the roofs of great palaces suddenly opened to the pitiless sky. It was, to a lesser degree, a version of the same crisis that I saw my parents facing. In the grander houses in the villages where we lived, you could still see signs saying, Tradesman's Entrance, directing the vulgar to a side door. We could not aspire to that sort of standing, but it was considered essential, by my mother in particular, that the Hitchenses never sink one inch back down the social incline that we had so arduously ascended. That way led to public or council housing, to the rough boys who would hang around outside cinemas and railway stations, to people who went on strike and thus held the country to ransom, and to people who dropped the H at the beginnings of words and used the word toilet when they meant to refer to the lavatory. In Fifeshire, we had briefly had a babysitter called Jeannie, a large, ruddy, motherly proletarian, whose husband was a crane driver in the Navy dockyard. She once took my brother to her council house for tea, by which she meant dinner, or at least early supper. A meat and potato fest rammed home with a mug of hot and sweet brown nectar. Peter was fascinated above all by the way her husband ate with his knife. Ate off his knife, that is to say. I swear that my mother went chalk-white when she heard of this. All I ever had to do if I wished to tease her was to wield my knife as if it were a fork, or to hold it as if it were a pen, or to mouth the word toilet. Lesser prohibitions and anxieties, note-paper for writing-paper, mirror for looking-glass, 
were not as absolute. Phone for telephone was, however, considered distinctly vulgar. My first introduction to the Mitford sisters and their impossible glamour and charm was by way of Nancy's guide to the pitfalls of class and the fashion in which all English people are branded on the tongue, either by their accent or by their vernacular. The durability of this upstairs-downstairs ethos is remarkable in point of both time and place. I was to become very close to Jessica Mitford, who was almost a sorceress in her ability to use her upper-class skills for American leftist purposes. Told once by a white southerner at a cocktail party that it don't seem possible that school integration could work, she icily replied, To me it do, and turned on her heel, leaving him wilted like a salted snail. During the McCarthy period, when her fellow communists became very timorous, she discovered that the Oakland branch was advising its black members when turning up for a meeting at the home of a well-to-do comrade to avoid FBI attention by pretending to be house servants and using the back door. Well, I mean to say, I sail right round, told them I thought that was an absolute stinker. In this unending social battle, in which private education was a necessary but not sufficient condition for victory, the Hitchens' chin was barely above the ever-rising floodwaters. At any moment my father might lose his latest job, and we had no capital of any kind on which to fall back. He himself had relatives who, I find I have to confess this, bought a china plaque with the word toilet and helpfully screwed it to the outside of their lavatory door. To the door of the actual room with a bath and wash basin in it, they also fixed a plaque saying bathroom. Their house was a five-room bungalow where it was hard to get lost. Thank heaven for the Englishman who invented the saving term loo. My mother's exquisite pain at this sort of thing was further accented by deep reticence about her own family background, and all this strain was being undergone so that I, the firstborn, could become an English gentleman at precisely the time when the market for such a finished product was undergoing a steep decline. Thus I have to be honest and say that the single book that most altered my life was How Green Was My Valley. One day I took up a tattered paperback copy of Richard Llewellyn's classic, it was a Pan or Penguin edition, proclaiming it the best seller of the war years, which meant that it seemed kosher to me, and then sat as if snared by an enchantment till I'd finished it. Then I read it again. In the next few years I inhaled and imbibed it dozens of times and could, at any moment, have sat for an examination on its major and minor themes. The world and experience of its boy narrator, Hugh Morgan, became more real to me than my own. It was an earthquake, a climacteric, a revelation. I was one of those rural and suburban boys who, like Ruskin when taking the railway across North London, would feel the impulse to pull down the blinds as my train went through scenes of ugliness and misery and desolation in places called Hackney Downs and London Fields. Once after staying with a school friend on the Mumbles Peninsula of South Wales, I had been as distressed as William Blake by my brief glimpse of the hell-mouth scenes of the steelworks and coal pits around Port Talbot. But now I realised that just on the other side of the bright Bristol Channel from the lovely moors and uplands of my upbringing, there was a world as remote from my own as the moon, or as Joseph Conrad's Congo. Several aspects of this hitherto occluded other Britain lodged in the mind. First of all, its inhabitants worked mostly under the ground, like the Morlocks in H.G. Wells. Second, they spoke a non-English language at home and at church and considered themselves conquered and dispossessed as a nation as well as suppressed as a class. Third, they thought of going on strike as an act of unselfish solidarity and emancipation, rather than as holding the country to ransom. Fourth, though I do not know why I'm placing this last on my list, they conceived of education and learning as the avenues to a better life for their fellows as well as themselves and not as an expensively bought means of declaring themselves superior to others less fortunate. This was a jolt to my system, and no mistake. Indeed, it was a severe and seismic shock to all the other systems that had undergirded my own little position. In the annals of good-bad, then, I would put How Green Was My Valley in the same class as Uncle Tom's Cabin, a work that leaves an ineradicable scratch on the mind, to borrow Harold Isaacs's useful phrase. There was another element as well. At a certain point on some springy turfed Welsh hillside far above the scenes of alienation and exploitation that lay below, young Hugh contrived to part with his irksome virginity. Richard Llewellyn handled this transition with very slightly too much quasi-poetic euphemism, his crucial error being 
to my fevered imagining, the idea that the inflamed heat of young manhood could be assuaged only by the relative coolness of a feminine interior. One had had a vague hope that the ardency would be appeased by an even greater heat, rather than sizzled like a red-hot horseshoe dipped in water, but at this stage I would have been willing to settle for anything that offered incandescence in either direction. It interested me very much later on to discover that Hugh's creator, Richard Llewellyn, was not at all the fire-eating partisan of the coal miners' struggles that I had taken him to be, but rather a conservative and old-fashioned type who had been setting down a world he had lost. It only goes to show, if you spend a certain amount of every day memorizing the following incantations, the effects may not always be the ones that are intended. Teach us, good Lord, to serve thee as thou deservest, to give and not to count the cost, to fight and not to heed the wounds, to toil and not to seek for rest, to labor and to ask for no reward, save that of knowing that we do thy will. That's from Ignatius Loyola, or this from Sir Francis Drake himself. O Lord God, when thou hast given thy servants to endeavor any great matter, grant us also to know that it is not the beginning but the continuing of the same, until it be thoroughly finished, which yieldeth the true glory through him that for the finishing of thy work laid down his life. Even when you have learned later about Loyola's fanaticism, or Drake's piracy, verses like these have the faculty of recurring to one at apt or critical moments. Years later I read Lionel Trilling on George Orwell's attachment to traditional and martial values. Trilling guessed that Orwell esteemed these supposedly conservative virtues because he thought they might come in handy later on as revolutionary ones. And this is partly why I can't entirely second or echo his own great memoir of prep school misery. For me, the experience of being sent away at a tender age was, at any cost, finally an emancipating one. I knew I hadn't been dispatched to boarding school to get me out of the way, an assurance that I don't think the young or well shared. I knew it was my only eventual meal ticket for a decent university, that undiscovered country to which no Hitchens had yet travelled. I knew that I owed my parents the repayment of a debt. True, I did get pushed around and unfairly punished and introduced too soon to some distressing facts of existence. But I would not have preferred to stay at home or to have been sheltered from these experiences, and it was probably good for me to be deprived of my adoring mother and taught, I can still remember the phrase, that I wasn't by any means the only pebble on the beach. Why, I once inquired, was the school boxing tournament into which I had been entered against my will, called the 90%. Because, Hitchens, the fight involves only 10% skill and 90% guts. This seemed even then like a parody of a Tom Brown story. And I had the socks knocked off me in the ring, but why do I remember it after half a century? The school motto was, Ut prosim, that I may be useful. And when one has joined in the singing of I Vow to Thee, My Country, especially on November the 11th by the War Memorial, or The Day Thou Gavest, Lord, is ended, to sing is to pray twice, as St. Augustine put it, then one may in fact be very slightly better equipped to face that Japanese jail or Iraqi checkpoint. I have just looked up the gleaming new website of Mount House and realized that if I have set all this down in my turn, it is because I was among the last generation to go through the old-school version of Englishness. The site speaks enthusiastically of the number of girls being educated at the establishment. Good grief! Of the availability of vegetarian diets and caterings for other special needs. And of its sensitivity to various sorts of learning disability. Now, I cannot say I am completely sorry to think that there will be no more eat that mutton, Hitchens, or bend over that chair, Hitchens, or... Shall we call him Christine Boys? He's so feeble. But something in me hopes that it hasn't all become positive reinforcement, with high marks constantly awarded for mere self-esteem. Cambridge My mother, having decided that Tunbridge was out of the question for her sensitive Christopher, some swift work had to be done to reposition me in the struggle, the whole aim and object of the five years at Mount House, to make me into a proper public schoolboy. Mr. Wortham proved adept at the string-pulling of the system. It was quite rapidly decided that I should instead apply to go to the Lees School in Cambridge. The atmosphere there was more intellectual, and the headmaster, Alan Barker, was a friend of Mr. Wortham's. 
Since I was being taken as a late applicant, I would still sit the same exam, the common entrance that has been the fate of the English prep school boy since records were kept, but would have to achieve a scholarship mark at it. This I was able to do without much of a strain. For many years I kept the telegram, ah, those days of the telegram, which was received by my proud parents. Passed for Lee's congratulations were them. This also enabled me to score a bit over my 13-year-old playmates. English public schools have names like Radley and Repton and Charterhouse and Sherborne and Stowe, not to mention the Eton and Harrow, to which we knew we could not aspire. And it was quite the done thing to debate the relative merits of these status-conscious destinations. Ha! Huh. Pew is going to Sedbur, mouldy old prison. Oh yes, well you're going to Sherburne, which is full of snobs. When my turn came, I would portentously say, I'm going to Cambridge. That shut them up. Cambridge, these little bastards had heard of. They just didn't have anything sarcastic to say about it. I was bluffing, of course, but I still liked the look of things. My new school was in town, and in the ancient town of Cambridge at that, instead of out on some blasted heath, where long and muddy cross-country runs could be inflicted on you. And even the nearest manic-depressive hamlet was many furlongs or versts or miles away. Most English public schools are affiliated with the national absurdity of the Anglican or Church of England confession, as if there could be a version of Christianity specifically linked to a group of northerly islands, whereas the Lees was Methodist, which put it in the dissenting or nonconformist tradition, founded by that admitted maniac and demagogue John Wesley, but still better than the alliance between a state church, the monarchy, the armed forces, and the Tory party. Many of the teachers and masters were part-time dons at the university. I was, by the age of thirteen, manumitted from provincial and rural life and enforced infancy, and put at last into long trousers and allowed in sight of the great libraries and quadrangles that had nurtured Chaucer and Milton and Newton and Cromwell. For many people, the Oxford-Cambridge dichotomy is an either-or proposition, like Jack Spratt and his wife, or Harvard versus Yale, or Army versus Navy. In days gone by, plebeian Londoners, who had been to neither university, would get into loud public disputes every year, about which eight they favoured in the annual Oxford-Cambridge boat race from Putney to Mortlake, one of the great who-cares events of any epoch. For me, the similarities outdistance the distinctions. Both towns show the unoriginality of the English when it comes to names. There used to be a ford for oxen by the Thames, and there was once a place where it was possible to bridge the cam. Both have colleges rather than a university. Both took a long time to recognize the existence of the railway, so that the station is too far from the centre. Some say that Cambridge is more austere and Oxford more louche and luxurious, but could even all souls be more exotic and languid and exclusive than the Apostles' Club or the Courts of Kings and Trinity? Nursery of such ripe and gorgeous plants as E. M. Forster and John Maynard Keynes, to say nothing of the coterie of Stalinist traitors from Kim Philby to Sir Anthony Blunt. At least Oxford spies for us, as one portly academic once put it to me, while Cambridge seems to prefer to spy for the other side. They used to say that Cambridge was better at science, the deceptive word scientist, as opposed to the superior word natural philosopher, not having been coined until the 1830s. Very well, it was at least true that Isaac Newton had operated here, his frantic experiments in bogus alchemy more than once igniting his own rooms, and that Charles Darwin had occupied the very same chambers as William Paley, author of Natural Theology and Supreme Bard of the Quixotic Argument from Design. More intriguing to me and my young contemporaries, restlessly modern as we aspired to be in the early 1960s, was the chance to walk past the Cavendish laboratories and see where the atom had first been split, or to pass by the Rose and Crown pub, into which Crick and Watson had strolled with exaggerated nonchalance one lunchtime, to announce that with the double helix they had uncovered the secret of existence. My encounter with all this liberating knowledge and inquisitive atmosphere was very nearly over before it had begun. In my very first term, in October 1962, President Kennedy went to the brink, as the saying invariably goes, over Cuba. I shall never forget where I was standing and what I was doing on the day he nearly killed me. It was on the touchline, being forced to watch a rugby game, that I overheard some older boys discussing the likelihood of our annihilation. At the close of the BBC's programming that night, Richard Dimbleby enjoined all parents to please act normally and send their children to school in the morning. This didn't apply to those of us boarders who were already at school. 
we were left to wonder how the adult world could be ready to gamble itself, and the life of all the subsequent and, for that matter, preceding generations, on a sordid squabble over a banana republic. I wouldn't have phrased it like that then, but I do remember feeling furious disgust at the idea of being sacrificed in an American quarrel that seemed largely to be of Kennedy's making in the first place. I have changed my mind on a number of things since, including almost everything having to do with Cuba. But the idea that we should be grateful for having been spared, and should shower our gratitude upon the supposed Galahad of Camelot, for his gracious lenience in opting not to commit genocide and suicide, seemed a bit creepy. When Kennedy was shot the following year, I knew myself somewhat apart from this supposedly generational trauma, in that I felt no particular sense of loss at the passing of such a high-risk narcissist. If I registered any distinct emotion, it was that of mild relief. If politics could force its way into my life in such a vicious and chilling manner, I felt, then I'd better find out a bit more about it. At Mount House I had enjoyed the current affairs class and taken part in a few school debates, forcing myself to speak in public because for a short while I'd developed a stutter. Who knows where this originated in my psyche? My mother later told me that I'd also stuttered a bit when my baby brother was born, no doubt in another cynical bid for attention. But it was certainly made worse by teasing, and I once made the huge mistake of trying to say the name of my railway destination at Term's End, Chichester, in front of a large group. The driveling ch 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 Chichester noise that resulted was to follow me around for a bit anyway. The main position I can remember taking was in opposition to the Tory attempt to ban coloured immigration from the West Indies. I was to get over my speech impediment and now find that I can speak perfectly contentedly, often or preferably without interruption, for hours at a time. Let this be an inspiration to all those who contend with childhood disabilities. Two aspects of the Lees combined to change not just what I thought, but always much more important, how I thought. The first pressure was negatively charged, so to speak, and the second more positively so. To begin with the negative, I was highly conscious of being very fortunate to be at the school and of having parents who were willing to sacrifice to get me there and keep me there. It offended me in an almost aesthetic way to find that the bulk of my contemporaries took this immense good fortune as no more than their due. Methodism is a trade like any other, and the majority of the boys were the sons of solid Lancashire and Yorkshire businessmen, who thought it entirely natural that they need not attend the sort of school where they might have to consort with the children of their employees. I found myself immensely disliking this mentality and the accents in which it was expressed. On the positive side, the Lees was in Cambridge, and if your father was a don at the university, you could be a home boarder. In other words, come to the school daily and go home at night. This meant that there was a certain leaven in the lump and many lifelines to the outside world. There were boys with names like Huxley and Keynes, who really were from those distinguished families, and there was the son of a Jewish Nobel Prize winner named Perutz. As the general election of 1964 approached, a number of Labour bumper stickers were to be seen on our teachers' cars. Then there was one of Methodism's many paradoxes, which was its historic identification with the working class. This has been overstated and often distorted. The historian Eli Halevy had a memorable debate with Eric Hobsbawm over whether it was Methodism that had defused revolution among the lower orders in the 19th century, but it meant in practice that some of the visiting preachers on Sunday were unpolished ministers from tough working-class parishes who gave us some idea of how the other half, actually very much more than half, lived. Donald Soper, the best-known Methodist in the country, was an announced socialist with a column in Tribune, George Orwell's Old Weekly. His visit to address us in assembly was a sensation. The country's other leftist weekly, The New Statesman, was kept in the library, along with a specially displayed copy of the Fabian Society pamphlet that called for the abolition of the public school system. The great J.G. Ballard, who had had the reverse of the Ian Watt experience, in that he'd been interned by the Japanese, as related in his novel Empire of the Sun, as a small boy, before being sent to the same house in the same boarding school as me, once did jokingly say that the food at the Lees was inferior to the Lunghua camp in Shanghai, but was later to admit that he'd been agreeably surprised by how comparatively little torture there had been. This duality in the life and mind of the Lees was beautifully captured for me by an incident in my first year. I was cornered in some chilly recreation room by a would-be bully named E.A.M. Smith, a brainless and cruel lad, a year or so my senior. 
This tough and tasty dunce excelled at games and was a member of a highly exclusive Christian crackpot sect named the Glanton Brethren, which in its own disordered mind constituted an elect of God's anointed. Hitchens is being gassy, he said, using the school's argo for people like me who talk too much. The cure for being gassy is a bit of a beating. I wasn't completely sure that he couldn't deliver on this threat. And the uncertainty must have shown on my features, because suddenly a voice cut in. Oh, please, don't give a damn about Smith. The moron's grin began to fade, and the few who would probably have sided with him lost interest at once. In an excellent instance of the revenge is sour rule, I was to meet Smith again many years later. It was on the London Underground one morning. He was an abject tramp, carrying two heavy bags of rotting old newspapers and declaiming aloud to the unheeding world around him. He chose to sit down just next to me. I pondered for a moment and couldn't resist. E. A. M. Smith, I said into his ear. He jumped like a pea on a hot shovel. How do you know my name? Cruelly, I replied. We've had our eye on you for some time. His face betrayed the animal fear of the hopeless paranoid, and so I couldn't bear to continue. It's all right. I just remember you from school. It's Hitchens here. He said dully, I remember you. You were a sinner. I used to pray for you. That seemed about right. My rescuer was a tall, thin boy with a certain presence to him. Who was this chap who could make a muscular thug shrivel? His name, it turned out, was Michael Prest. He was in the next house to me, but was a home boarder because his father was an economics don at Jesus College. I recognized him without knowing his name, because every morning in chapel, when the rest of us bent forward at the call to pray, he remained sitting up and unbowed. There was nothing the prefects and teachers could do about this. The law said we had to be in chapel every day, but they couldn't force us to pray on top of that, or even compel us to pretend to do so. I admired his stand without emulating it. Within a few days I had made a new and fast friend, and then one morning, as everyone else but Michael crashed lazily forward in their pews, I took a deep breath and held myself upright. It felt very lonely for a moment, but soon there was nothing to it. I started bringing books to read during the sermons and the prayers in order to improve the shining hour. R. H. Tawney on religion and the rise of capitalism was, I remember, an early choice. The lexicographer Wilfred Funk was once invited to say what he thought was the most beautiful word in the English language, and nominated mange. If asked, I would, without hesitation, give the word library. The Lees not only had a fine library of its own, but my house, North B, the other houses, since shamed by the magnificence of Hogwarts, being unimaginatively named North A, East, West, and School, also had its own mini-version. From this hoard, I one evening borrowed a life-changing book called Hanged by the Neck, a penguin paperback issued as part of the growing national debate over the death penalty. It had two authors. One was Arthur Kerstler, and the other, C. H. Rolfe. The latter was the crime correspondent for the New Statesman. The name concealed the identity of Inspector Bill Hewitt of the City of London Police, whom I was later to meet. Between them, these two simply demolished the case for capital punishment and gave some hair-raising examples of cold, hideous miscarriages of justice. This had two effects on me. It drew me further into the then-raging argument over the historic British institution of the gallows, which eventually culminated in its abolition in 1967, and it decided me that I would read anything by Arthur Kerstler. Before long, I was rereading Darkness at Noon, for what felt like, and quite possibly was, the third time in a month. Things were quickening with me, in other words. I was in a sophisticated city with a great treasure house of culture. One evening I found myself sitting in King's College Chapel, listening as Yehudi Menuhin played, just in front of the newly acquired Rubens, Adoration of the Magi. I recall thinking that this was almost too rich a mixture for a navy brat. The Lees, if anything, favoured sciences over the arts. Its old boys tended to be quietly eminent, as one newspaper article rather devastatingly phrased it. But we could boast of having produced James Hilton, Mr. Chips having been based upon a veteran master of the school named W. H. Balgani, as well as Malcolm Lowry and J. G. Ballard. The book Goodbye, Mr. Chips like the several movies that bear its name, has become a synonym for old-school Thai values and general mushy sentiment about the dear old days. In fact, Mr. Chipping's lovely wife, Cathy, is a socialist and a feminist who wins all hearts. 
She forces him to be honest about homosexual play among the boys. He ends up sympathizing with the railway strikers, opposing the British Empire in the Boer War, and insisting on decent respect for Germans after 1914. I became too omnivorous in my reading, trying too hard to master new words and concepts, and to let them fall in conversation or argument with sometimes alarming results. I gained a reputation among the sporting types, and perhaps to be fair, not only among them, as a pseudo-intellectual. I recall two diagnoses from this period. The first, from some school counsellor with a psychologist's bent, awarded me an Aladdin's Cave complex. This was flattering in a way, since it suggested that I had an embarras de choix, but it also suggested that I was too brittle to decide among so many possible treats. The second blunter verdict came from my fairly genial, if unillusioned, housemaster. He informed me in the course of one of several harangues about my character that I was in some danger of ending up as a pamphleteer. It was one of those moments that one knows instantly will always be retained in the memory. At last I had a word for it, and a word that had been applied to Defoe at that. By the time that I was fifteen or so then, I had acquired some precocious knowledge of the Cambridge-related worlds of Bloomsbury and the Fabians, symbolized by the figure of Bertrand Russell, whose books I was also smuggling into the chapel. I knew enough to know that my next stop ought to be Oxford, which furnished the other half of this socio-intellectual equation. I even had a clear notion that the ideal Oxford College would be Balliol, and the desired course of study, philosophy, politics, and economics, or the famous PPE. I was doing well enough at the LIT, the Literary and Debating Society, run by one of the more urbane classics masters. My stutter almost vanished. I even did a little acting and made a small success of the part of Taplow in Terence Rattigan's classic, The Browning Version. And I was beginning to try some writing. I had known for years that this was what I really wanted to do. Indeed, in my grander moments, I would want to claim that I'd always understood that it was what I had to do. But I had no real concept of writing as a living, let alone as a life. At prep school and in the holidays, I'd filled little exercise books with chiefly historical efforts, including a soon-abandoned grand narrative of the Napoleonic Wars. At the Lees, there was an annual thing called the Thomas Essay Prize, with a book token at the end of it, and a handshake from the headmaster on the school's open speech day every summer for the doting parents to witness. I entered myself for this prize in my first year and was runner-up, and I won it in one form or another every subsequent year. The only set topic that I can now remember, because there was always a set topic, and it always was a worthy and elevated one, was Martin Buber's homely maxim that true living lies in meeting. How was I to know that this pious old hypocrite, the author of I and Thou, had after 1948 moved into the Jerusalem house from which the family of my one-day-to-be friend Edward Said had been evicted? Cacoethia scribendi, says Paul Cavafi somewhere, the itch to scribble. If I could be moved to write by the banalities of Buber, I was plainly a bit more than just itchy. The eclectic urge struck me in every department of scribbling, and I flung myself into verse parodies, short stories, for some reason very often about animals, and in one especially regrettable episode which involved brooding, meaning of life, moody walks along the river that led from Cambridge to Grantchester, a project for a libretto to be co-written with a musically inclined boy named Spratling. This could all have ended very badly indeed, with wilting affectation and high self-indulgence. But then I discovered something that I have struggled ever since to convey to my own students. In writing and reading, there is a gold standard. How will you be able to detect it? You will know it all right. I got full marks for an essay on Chaucer's wonderful prologue to the Canterbury Tales. And how fortunate I was to have Colin Wilcoxon, one of the world's experts on Langland, as my instructor. I couldn't sleep for two nights after first reading Crime and Punishment. Yet never did I breathe the pure serene, as I might fetchingly have tried to say in those days, until my little craft crashed on the reefs of first Wilfred Owen and then George Orwell. It can be good to start with a shipwreck. Your ideal authors ought to pull you from the foundering of your previous existence, not smilingly guide you into a friendly and peaceable harbour. Just as Llewellyn's tale of Hugh Morgan had upended my sense of the social scale, so the words of Owen's Dulce et Decorum Est 
went off like a landmine under my concept of history and empire. The moment came in class. It was the turn of a very handsome boy named Sean Watson to read. As he stumbled his bored and boring way through the lines, I was consumed first by a sense of outrage, as if seeing somebody take an axe to a grand piano. How could anybody be so brutish and insensitive? I wanted to wrench the book from his hands and declaim the poem. But then I found that this would not in fact be possible because my eyes were blinded with stinging tears. To this day I have difficulty reciting the poem out loud without a catch in my throat. I became consumed with the subject and got hold of a revisionist history of the First World War, In Flanders Fields, by Leon Wolfe, as well as All Quiet on the Western Front, and an anti-war British novel of the trenches called Covenant with Death, by John Harris, the neglect of which I would still define as a huge injustice. Its action follows a group of workers from Sheffield, from the day they enlist as friends to the day their lives are callously thrown away. I read all the other war poets, from Siegfried Sassoon to Edmund Blunden to Robert Graves. I could feel all the ballast in my hold, turning over, as I came to view the Great War, not as an episode of imperishable valour, celebrated every year on the 11th of November with the jingoistic verse of Rupert Brooke and Lawrence Binion, but as an imperialist slaughter that had been ended on such bad terms by such stupid statesmen that it necessitated an even more horrible second round in 1939. Even Winston Churchill and the finest hour, in this perspective, seemed open to question. And if there was one thing that was not open to question to somebody brought up in a British military atmosphere in the 1950s, it was Winston Churchill and the finest hour. When allied with my socialist and Fabian readings in other areas, this soon had me thinking of the Spanish Civil War as the only just war there had probably ever been. And so I was fairly soon immersed in homage to Catalonia. I actually couldn't make head or tail of this book in those days because the ideological battles within the left were still opaque to me, and I'd come to Orwell by an unusual path anyway. We were all expected to read Animal Farm in 1984, which had been placed on the syllabus as part of the curriculum of the Cold War. I took the opportunity to show off and to compare and contrast Animal Farm to Darkness at Noon, which I alone in the class had read. But I had chanced on Orwell's social novels first, and had consumed Keep the Aspidistra Flying and The Clergyman's Daughter, as well as Coming Up for Air. In these pages I found some specimens of exactly the low-middle-class family that was familiar to me from life, the insecure and anxious layer of old England that strove to keep up appearances and, as Orwell put it, had nothing to lose but their H's. I understood that Miss Austin and Mr. Dickens and even George Eliot had written with sympathy about folk of the middling sort, but I still hadn't quite appreciated that actual fiction could be written about morose, proud but self-pitying people like us, and was powerfully struck by the manner in which Orwell mimicked and caught the tone. If he was reliable on essentials like this, I reasoned, I could trust him on other subjects as well. Soon enough I was following Orwell to Wigan Pier. James Hilton, creator of Shangri-La, as well as Mr. Chips, also came, it may interest you to know, from Wigan, and shadowing him in mind on his other expeditions to the lower depths. Highly derivative in my approach, I began writing grittily polemical and socially conscious essays and fiercely anti-militarist poems when these were turned down by the school magazine, which was not every time but often enough to inspire bold thoughts of revolt, Michael Prest and I, and a few kindred spirits, set up a magazine of our own, cautiously and neutrally called Comment, to avoid too much official attention, and actually learned to operate a manual printing press in the basement of one of the school buildings. Ink-stained pamphleteer. Very heaven. Cambridge again, both gown and town, came to my aid. I coolly informed my housemaster that I would no longer be donning the uniform of the school's combined cadet corps with its queen and country ethos. He at first opposed this on the usual grounds that it would set a precedent, but yielded to my argument that no, it would do no such thing, since none of the other boys in fact wanted to follow suit. At about this time I read Catch-22, and was thrilled when Yossarian, confronted by Major Danby's version of the old official trick question, suppose everybody felt that way, replied, then I'd certainly be a damn fool to feel any other way, wouldn't I? I already knew there would be no precedent, because instead of reporting for rifle parades, 
I had to volunteer to do the alternative, which was social service in the back streets of the town, and I knew for damn sure that my schoolfellows would want no truck with any of that. I, however, as the budding socialist, positively enjoyed going into the homes of the poor and helping them fill out questionnaires about their needs. Joining the high-toned United Nations Association and becoming the school's representative on its Cambridge Schools Committee was a shrewd move and an easy one, given that nobody else wanted the job. It meant that I was allowed to go to meetings with reps from other little academies, which in turn meant the chance to meet girls at the famously intellectual Purse School. Here I had the huge luck to encounter Janet Montefiore, a dauntingly brilliant girl who has since emerged as a distinguished professor of literature. She invited me to come and hear Edmund Blunden read his poetry at the Purse, and I sat almost numb with emotion, having shaken the hand of someone who'd been a contemporary of Wilfred Owen. She did better than that. Her father, Hugh, a Jewish convert to Christianity, was the vicar of Great St. Mary's, the university church, and ran a famous program for visiting speakers. One night at her invitation, it seemed like a good enough use for a church, I crammed myself into a pew to hear W. H. Auden read from his poetry, and again was spellbound at the thought of seeing a man who had been in Spain at the same time as Orwell. I didn't know of their bitter quarrel and wouldn't then have understood it. I use conventional form when I say that Auden read from his poems. Actually, he recited them with great aplomb, and I recall hearing from Hugh Montefiore, long after he himself became a bishop, that he was astounded at how much Auden had been able to drink at dinner beforehand and still perform this great live act. I can also distinctly remember hearing Auden say that he'd reached a stage where his leathery and runnelled face looked like a wedding cake that's been left out in the rain. This was before the release of the horror song MacArthur Park. So that was another version of doomed youth and of once epicene but now departed beauty. Perhaps now is the moment at which I should make my own confession here. We were taught the poetry of Owen and Auden at school, and allowed to ruminate on the obsession of Owen with wounded and bleeding young soldiers, as well as on the cunning way in which Auden opened Lay Your Sleeping Head, My Love, Human on My Faithless Arm. The master who introduced this was dexterous enough to point out that the words could easily be arranged to make it faithless on my human arm, and ambidextrous enough to instruct us also in the subtleties of Catullus and his Vivamus Mea Lesbia. But I don't think any instructor was sufficiently phlegmatic to break the news that the two great English poets of the preceding two generations had been quite so gay. Lytton Strachey once summarized the boarding school hothouse dilemma very aptly. How odd the fate of pretty boys, who, if they dare to taste the joys that so enchanted classic minds, get whipped upon their neat behinds. Yet should they fail to construe well the lines that of those raptures tell, it's very odd, you must confess, their neat behinds get whipped no less. There were two ways in which this hottest of all subjects could come up in an all-male school, featuring communal showers, communal sleeping arrangements, communal lavatories, and the ever-present threat of an official thrashing on the rear. The first was unambiguously physical. Most boys decided quite early on that, since their penises would evidently give them no rest at all, they would repay the favour by giving their penises no respite in return. The night was loud with the boasts and the groans that resulted from this endless and fairly evenly matched single combat between chaps and their cocks. To even the dullest lad, furthermore, it would sometimes occur to think that self-abuse was slightly wasted on the self and might be better relished in mixed company. Some were choosy about the company, and some less so, but I can only remember a very few boys who abstained from, or, to put it more cruelly, were so unappetizing as to be left out of, this compensation for the general hellishness of male adolescence. It was quite possible to arrange a vigorous session of mutual relief without a word being spoken, even without eye contact. It's very important to understand that 90% of these enthusiastic participants would have punched you in the throat if you suggested there was anything homosexual or queer about what they were doing. When I later read Gore Vidal's distinction between homosexual persons and homosexual acts, I saw the point at once. The unstated excuse was that this was what one did until the so far unattainable girls became available. And there were related etiquettes to be observed. A senior boy might well have some sort of pash on a much junior one, but any action taken by him would be very strongly deplored. You couldn't actually treat a boy like a girl, in other words. 
Yet the very word pash somehow gives the name away. In a minority of cases, another word for it, often represented by the equals sign between two names, written up as graffiti, things were infinitely more serious as well as more ridiculous, because what appeared to be involved was, of all ludicrous things, the emotions. The routines of the day, from stolen glimpses across the chapel in the morning to a longing glance across the quadrangle as the bells tolled for lights out, could be utterly consumed by the presence of him. One such episode came close to ruining my life, or so I thought and believed at the time. I had one advantage and one disadvantage in this ongoing monastic sex drama, and the problem was that the advantage and the disadvantage were the same. I was a late developer physically, was quite girlish in my prepubescent years, and then later, if I do say so myself, not all that bad-looking, once boyishness had, so to speak, kicked in. This meant that I didn't lack for partners when it came to the everyday, well, not everyday, business of sheer physical relief, but it also meant that I could become the recipient of attention from older males, attention that could sometimes be very sudden and quite frightening. This perhaps made me additionally vulnerable to the fantasy of the romantic idyll. Mr. Chips's feminist socialist wife had phrased it in a no-nonsense way by saying, that official disapproval of public school homosexuality was the equivalent of condemning a boy for being there in the first place. She was chiefly right about the sheer physical aspect. I knowingly run the risk of absurdity if I offer the spiritual or the transcendent in opposition to this, but actually it was my first exposure to love as well as to sex, and it helped teach me, as vividly as anything could have done, that religion was cruel and stupid. One was indeed punishable for one's very nature, Created sick, commanded to be sound. The details aren't very important, but until this moment I've doubted if I would ever be able to set them down. He was a sort of strawberry blonde, very slightly bow-legged, with a wicked smile that seemed to promise both innocence and experience. He was in another house. He was my age. He was quite right-wing, which I swiftly decided to forgive, but also a rebel in the sense of being a cavalier elitist. His family had some connection with the louche Simon Raven, whose Fielding Grey novels of schoolboy infatuation and later versions of decadence furnished, for me at any rate, a sort of cheap-rate anteroom to the grander sequences of Antony Pole. The marvellous boy was more urbane than I was, and much more knowing, if slightly less academic. His name was Guy, and I still sometimes twitch a little when I run into someone else who's called that, even in America, where in a way it's every boy's name. Were poems exchanged? Were there white-hot and snatched kisses? Did we sometimes pine for the holidays to end, so that, unlike everybody else, we actually yearned to be back at school? Yes, yes, and yes. Did we sleep together? Well, dear reader, the straight answer is no, we didn't. The heated yet chaste embrace was exactly what marked us off from the grim and turgid and randy manipulations in which the common herd, not excluding ourselves in our lower moments with lesser beings, partook. I won't deny that there was some fondling. However, when we were actually caught, it must have looked bad, since we had finally managed no small achievement in a place where any sort of privacy was rendered near unlawful to find somewhere to be alone. The senior boy who made the discovery was a thick-necked sportocrat with the unimprovable name of Peter Raper. He had had his own bulging eye on my guy for some time, and this was his revenge. The usual thing would have been public disgrace followed by expulsion. But things were made more cruel and more arbitrary and also less so. Various of my teachers persuaded the headmaster that I was a good prospect for passing the entrance exam for Oxford, a statistic on which the school annually prided and sold itself. The same could be said of Guy, though he didn't eventually make it. Accordingly, having been coldly exposed to public shame, we were allowed to stay on but forbidden to speak to each other. At the time, I vaguely but quite worriedly thought that this might have the effect of killing me. Yet there was something so stupid, as well as so intricate in the official sadism, that I managed to surmount most of its effects. After all, this was a time when not only was all homosexual conduct illegal in the rest of society, but all contact with members of the female sex was punishable by beating, within the rules of my school. You could not win. Perversion, so often invoked from the pulpit and the podium, was the very word that I personally employed for this sick mentality on the part of the authorities. 
Of the reaction of my parents, I remember almost nothing. The luckless commander was summoned, and we had a way-faced interview in some study or other, until I realized that he was far more embarrassed than I was. And this was a man whose regular standby of stoicism was to intone, unvaryingly, worse things happen in big ships. My mother wisely said nothing and wrote nothing. At the end of the term, I didn't go home, but went rock climbing in North Wales with a school group where there was considerable free and emotionless sex among the tents and cooking fires. When I finally did get back, not having advertised my arrival time in advance, I was lucky to find my mother alone in the kitchen. She brilliantly rose and greeted me, as if I'd been expected for some brittle and glamorous cocktail party of the sort that she always planned and never quite gave. Looking back on this, I once again have the feeling that it all happened to somebody else, and yet I can be sure it was to me. Hoping to profit by a lesson or two, even from the most dismal and sordid moments, I could nominate perhaps more than a couple. The first is that, though I am generally glad not to be gay, I learned early on that most debates on this question are vapid or worse, since what we are discussing is not a form of sex, or not only a form of sex, but a form of love. As such, it must command respect. Then, and from having been the object of homosexual attention and predatory jealousy, this went on happening to me until I was almost out of university. I believe that the whole experience gave me some sympathy for women. I mean by that to say that I know what it's like to be the recipient of unwanted or even coercive approaches, or to be approached surreptitiously under the guise of friendship. Assaulted once by a truck driver when I was hitchhiking, and quite lucky to have broken away from him unharmed, I can never listen to any excuses about how the victims of such attacks in some way invited. I always take it for granted that sexual moralizing by public figures is a sign of hypocrisy or worse, and most usually a desire to perform the very act that is most being condemned. From King Lear, Thou rascal beadle hold thy bloody hand, why dost thou lash that whore? Thou hotly lusts to use her in that kind for which thou whips her. This is why, whenever I hear some big mouth in Washington or the Christian heartland banging on about the evils of sodomy or whatever, I mentally enter his name in my notebook and contentedly set my watch. Sooner rather than later, he will be discovered down on his weary and well-worn old knees in some dreary motel or latrine with an expired visa card, having tried to pay well over the odds to be peed on by some Apache transvestite. I understand in retrospect that this was my first introduction to a conflict that dominates all our lives, the endless, irreconcilable conflict between the values of Athens and Jerusalem. On the one hand, very approximately, is the world not of hedonism, but of tolerance of the recognition that sex and love have their ironic and perverse dimensions. On the other is the stone-faced demand for continence, sacrifice and conformity, and the devising of ever crueler punishments for deviants, all invoked as if this very fanaticism did not give its whole game away. Repression is the problem in the first place. So, even at the cost of some intense momentary pain, I suppose that I might as well have learned this sooner rather than later. It was Guy, now dead for some time, but in his later years an amazingly successful seducer of girls, who first insisted that I read the Greek classical novels of Mary Reynold. If this was all he had done for me, I would still be hoarsely grateful to him. While other boys ploughed their way across the puerile yet toilsome pages of Narnia, or sunk themselves into the costive innards of Middle-earth, I was following the thread of Ariadne and the tracks of Alexander. The king must die, the bull from the sea. Athens has seldom trumped Jerusalem with greater style or panache. In the autumn of 1964, Michael Preston and I managed the Labour campaign in the school's mock version of the general election. No boy at the Lees had any memory of any government except that of the Tories, who had been in power with four successive prime ministerships since Sir Winston Churchill's victory in 1951. But the apparent grandeur of this had sunk into the farcical, as the Profumo affair, allied to an infinite number of other scandals, from missile procurement to rack-renting in London slums, made the term the establishment, then newly coined by my future friend Henry Fairley, a byword for stink. Boldly, Michael and I marched into the town and went to Labour HQ. We got hold of some leaflets to distribute and some posters to nail to the school's trees. We invited a local Labour member of the council, his name I remember was Alderman Ramsbottom, to come and speak at lunchtime outside the school's cafeteria or tuck shop. 
I was afraid that the snobs and yobs, then synonymous in my mind, would sneer at him for his name, and so they did, but not for long. With great patience he outlined the achievements of previous socialist administrations, and then asked the assembled boys if they could think of anything the Tories had done that could match the establishment of the National Health Service and the granting of independence to India. Satirically I shouted, Suez. Of course, on the day itself, the Tories got an easy majority of the school vote, in fact an overall majority, and I saw my own slender total being cut into by an effective and popular and charismatic communist boy named Bevis Sale. Still, the Tories lost nationally, and I have to set down the fact that the school's own establishment was committed to fair play. The local Tory MP, Sir Hamilton Kerr, came to respond to my plebeian Ramsbottom and made himself look a complete weed and drip by comparison. Pompous little ponce, I heard my Scots housemaster distinctly say. An even more grotesque figure named Sir Percy Rugg, who had been at the school and was the Conservative leader on the London City Council, came to lunch after chapel one Sunday, and the headmaster's wife made sure that, as opposition spokesboy, I was invited. The headmaster himself, a man somehow aptly named Alan Barker, sat on the Cambridge City Council as an independent, being too right-wing for the official Conservatives, and his wife Jean has since become a national treasure in the massive and flesh-pink form of Lady Trumpington. So, I say again that I believe I benefited more from my public school than many boys who took it for granted. There came a day when the plummy-voiced reactionary Barker called me to his headmaster's library and handed me, one, a copy of Lytton Strachey's Eminent Victorians, and two, a copy of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels's Communist Manifesto. He went on to instruct me in the elementary mechanics of dialectical materialism. I'm sure that his intention was to inoculate me. The term, tremendously wrong-headed, was certainly used. But just as Arthur Kerstler had given so many good lines to his brutish but shrewd interrogator Gletkin in Darkness at Noon, so the dialectic in my churning mind took on a life of its own. It was certainly rather broad-minded of old Barker to give me a demolition job on high Victorian reputations that had been written by a notorious old Fabian socialist queen. And with Marx and Engels I realized that I was reading a superb paean to revolutionary properties and qualities, but to those of capitalism, not just of the working class. Before long, I was peeling off the compulsory wear school tie that made us easily identifiable in the streets of the town and joining undergraduates at lectures in the history faculty. I heard Herbert Butterfield of Peterhouse, a famous Methodist and critic of the Whig interpretation of history, talk on Machiavelli. I went to Walter Ullman's inaugural lecture on theocratic states. It became possible in a town with many jovially blind-eyed landlords to join people for drinks and disputation in pubs afterwards. While I was little more than a schoolboy, I was more than ready to be that relatively new thing, a student. Other noises coming from just off the tiny stage of school had begun to reach me, sometimes by transistor radio. At the Poetry Society one evening, a boy named Mannering interrupted our sedate discussion to urge forward a new name that I first registered mentally as Bob Dylan, D-I-L-L-O-N. I was fairly soon hooked, though, on what Philip Larkin called Dylan's cawing, derisive voice, and felt almost personally addressed by the words of Masters of War and Hard Rain, which seemed to encapsulate the way in which I had felt about Cuba. Then there were the loving and less cawing strains of Mr. Tambourine Man, She Belongs to Me, and Baby Blue. I've since had all kinds of differences with Professor Christopher Ricks, but he is and always has been correct in maintaining that Dylan is one of the essential poets of our time, and it felt right to meet him in the company of Shelley and Milton and Lowell, and not in one of the record shops that were then beginning to sprout alongside the town coffee bars. A more exotic name was also being wafted through the ether and into my head, the name Vietnam. This did not come freighted with fear like the word Cuba. It arrived rather as a summary and combination of everything one had ever learned, from Goya to Wilfred Owen, about the horrors of war. There was something profoundly, horribly shocking in the odds and the proportions of the thing. To all appearances, it seemed as if a military-industrial superpower was employing a terrifying aerial bombardment of steel and explosives and chemicals to subdue a defiant agrarian society. I had expected the newly elected Labour government to withhold British support for this foul war and for the amazingly coarse and thuggish-looking American president who was prosecuting it. And when this expectation was disappointed, I began, along with many, many of my contemporaries, 
to experience a furious disillusionment with conventional politics. A bit young to be so cynical and so superior, you may think. My reply is that you should fucking well have been there and felt it for yourself. Had the study of life and literature and history merely domesticated me to waste and betray my youth, and to gape at a spectacle of undisguised atrocity and aggression, as if it should be calmly received, I hope never to lose the access to outrage that I felt then. At Easter 1966, my brother and I joined the annual march of Britain's stage army of the good, the yearly pilgrimage of pacifists and anarchists and ragtag reds that tramped from the nuclear weapons factory at Aldermaston to the traditional centre of radical protest in Trafalgar Square. I donned the universal symbol of peace and wore in my lapel its broken cross or imploring outstretched arm logo. I also read Bertrand Russell's appeal to forget about the insipid slogan of peace and take the side of the fighting Viet Cong. I began to take part in the hot arguments that were latent in these two positions. Singing to the Trafalgar Square crowd, along with various folk moaners like Julie Felix, was the dynamic, sexy Paul Jones of Manfred Mann. Patrolling the fringes of the demonstration were blue uniformed figures whom I'd been brought up to view as friends and protectors. The first real kick he gets from a cop is often a huge moment of truth to a young member of the middle class. One should not postpone the raising of a curtain. In my own case, the revelation of curtain up was more of a sudden vivid peak from the wings, but no less memorable for that. I was back at boarding school and gritting my teeth to do well in my exams so that I might shed the schoolboy carapace and pupate as a full-fledged student at Balliol. It must have been the late summer of 1966 and probably towards the end of term because otherwise the headmaster wouldn't have given permission for our very own homegrown school pop group, harmlessly enough named The Saints, to give a concert on the cricket field. It was one of those warm and still evenings that in ancient Cambridge stay in the memory for a long time. Boys and masters sat or stood as they would have done for a cricket match, the more senior in comfy seats in the pavilion, the others on benches, the rest on the grass. After taking us through a fairly tame Buddy Holly-style repertoire, the respectable saints switched to a possibly potent and twanging version of House of the Rising Sun. The amplifiers must have been good, and as I said, the night was soft and still. At any rate, the sound must have carried because very suddenly and very quietly the cricket ground of our exclusive public school was overrun by a huge crowd of boys and even girls from the town. They had heard the strains of rock, even of mild rock, and they knew about Eric Burden and the animals. And they also knew by now that there was nothing much their parents or the police could do about it or about them. They crossed a social and geographic boundary that they'd never transgressed before and suddenly found it to be delightfully easy. Nonetheless, they were civil and quiet and curious, which meant that even my most awful contemporaries were embarrassingly polite and broad-minded in return, as well as nervously aware of being surprised and outnumbered. There was even some mild fraternization before the school authorities saw the way things might go and pulled the plugs that had animated the drums and guitars. Then, but too late, the traditional police constables made their belated appearance. As one who had already been employing the town against the school, for all kinds of private and public purposes. I was still rather slow to see what had just happened to Old Britain in front of my very eyes. The first thought I had was derived from my traditional and classical half. Surely this was like those other animals of the forest who had been shyly drawn to sit, forgetting their own wildness, when Orpheus began to pluck his lute. It was quite some while later that I thought, no, you sentimental fool, what you were seeing and hearing was the opening of the Sixties. The Sixties. Revolution in the Revolution, and Brideshead regurgitated. Contradiction, said Gustave Flaubert, is what keeps sanity in place. I suppose you know, said the most careful and elegant and witty English poet of my generation, when I first took his hand and accepted a Bloody Mary, financed from his slight but always open purse, that you are the second most famous person in Oxford. We were in the unswept front room of the King's Arms, a celebrated but grim pub, which allowed one to wear out the intervals of the day between the drably utilitarian Bodleian Library, open to the public and across the road, and the soaringly beautiful Codrington Library, which was for private members only, and formed a part of the sort of upper-crust game reserve that was All Souls. 
The year was 1969, and I had spent a good deal of time failing to study seriously in either library. I also detected, in James Fenton's rather pointed, if not indeed barbed hello, a sort of reproach that I should have squandered so much of my studentship, and still ended up as only the second most notorious person at the university. Time spent on a second-class degree, it was often said, was time wasted, even if it was an upper second. For this to be said of one's degree was perhaps understandable, even forgivable. But of one's thus far career? I think that you are going finally to displace me, as the most hated man in American life, wrote Norman Mailer to William F. Buckley in April 1965. And of course that position is bearable only if one is number one. To be the second most hated man in the picture will probably prove to be a little like working behind a mule for years. Of course I knew without asking who had won the laurel as the most famous person. This was Mike Rosen, a tall and rangy and bushy and charismatic Jewish communist, who could draw all eyes and who had already had a theatrical piece performed at the Oxford Playhouse. It was said that this same play, its name was Backbone, might have a season at the Royal Court in Sloane Square, which, at that date, still possessed the frisson that attached to Look Back in Anger and countless other dramas that had unsettled London's theatre-going bourgeoisie. So everybody knew who Mike Rosen was. The experts in children's literature, that most exacting form of all writing, to which he has contributed whole shelves, still do. But I bridled nonetheless. Rosen was of the old left. His family was fatally compromised by Stalinism. During the Oxford Playhouse version of Gunter Grass's play, the plebeians rehearsed the uprising, where the actors in a Bertolt Brecht drama become the sudden participants in real events. Rosen had been more or less compelled to go along with the play within the play that satirized the ghastly East German regime and celebrated the workers' revolt against it that had taken place in 1953. At an early age, then, we all got to know Brecht's mordant line about East German communism, that if the people had indeed let down the party, as had actually been said in a communist leaflet distributed on the Stalin Allee or Stalin Street, then the party might have to dissolve the people and elect a new one. I went to the play and was impressed to see Rosen take the part of the Berlin worker who, in a premonition of November 1989, ripped the red flag off the Brandenburg Gate. It was said that Mike's old father had been very distressed to learn of his son betraying the proletariat in this way. You may ask what kind of Oxford it was in which an ex-Stalinist and a post-Trotskyist vied for the celebrity that had once belonged to Oscar Wilde and Kenneth Tynan, or, more fictionally, Zuleika Dobson and Sebastian Flight, or, more realistically, the supposedly serious politicians who'd been at my own college and then gone on to be Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary, and all the rest of it. The clue, at least in this decade, lay in a very small distinction. There were people of the 60s, and then there were the 68ers, or, if you wanted to be more assertively Marxist and internationalist about it, Les Soissons Tuitards. I was one of those who desired to be a bit more assertively Marxist and internationalist about it. After all, to be a mere 60s person, all you needed was to have been born in the right year, and to be available for what I once heard called the most contemptible solidarity of all, the generational. Without quite knowing it, I'd been rehearsing for 1968 for some time. I attended every demonstration that I could against the war in Vietnam. I joined the Labour Party as soon as I was eligible to do so and went to branch meetings to agitate against the Labour government's craven support for President Johnson. At that stage, I would have described myself as a left social democrat or LSD in the jargon of the moment. Anyway, I know that this was my frame of mind when I went to a meeting at Oxford Town Hall one evening in the winter of 1966. The main speaker was John Berger, the art critic and novelist who was still then a member of the Communist Party. He spoke with some verve about the suffering and the resistance of the Vietnamese. Then we heard from some moon-faced pacifist priest and a Labour local councillor or two, and finally a man who I distinctly remember was called Henderson Brooks. He was evidently a Maoist of some kind, and spoke with the sort of sloganized hysteria that I instantly recognized from Orwell's description of the left book club meeting in Coming Up for Air. It was fascinating to see that some people still talked like that. Did I dream it, or did he actually say, running dogs of capitalism? Anyway, I was getting better at this sort of thing, 
and in the question period got up and said some satirical things about the great helmsmen of the Chinese people, people who were then floundering wretchedly in bankruptcy, famine, and mass murder under the state's sponsorship of Mao's great proletarian cultural revolution. I don't remember what was said in repost, but as the meeting was breaking up, I was approached by a rather terrier-like man who said he'd admired my remarks and asked me if I'd like to go with him to the pub. If a pint of tepid British beer can be said to have acted as a catalyst, then this encounter changed my life. My host was named Peter Sedgwick. He was a short, slightly misshapen fellow, I mean by the unkind but indispensable word misshapen to convey that his back was slightly hunched. With penetrating blue eyes and thinning wiry curls, he was a specialist in psychiatry. After some general chat, he rather diffidently handed me some of the literature. The left always used to speak of its pamphlets and leaflets in this exalted way, of a group called the International Socialists. I promised to take a look. We made an appointment to meet again, and my education in left opposition Marxism began. I had been impressed by the essays of Marx, to which my headmaster had prophylactically, or so he thought, introduced me. But when applied to the English scene, there seemed scant relevance in these texts. Had not the post-war social changes in Britain rendered the idea of class somewhat obsolete? Were the trade unions not a self-serving interest block? And wasn't the failure of communism in Russia and Eastern Europe a demonstration in practice of the failure, to put it no higher, of the communist idea? Only in countries like apartheid South Africa, whose goods I was already boycotting, could anything so dogmatic have a residual appeal. These were among my objections to moving any further to the left than I already had. From Peter I heard, and read, because he liked to write me letters as well, that by no means was class a dead issue, and that in the workshops and factories of Britain there was a growing shop floor movement which sought to democratize the act of labor itself and put an end to the wasteful inequalities of capitalist competition. In contrast, the Labour government was building a corporate state, an alliance between big capital, union bureaucrats and the government, from which an impermeable hierarchy would emerge. This had some force in my ear. The car industry was the lifeblood of non-university Oxford, and the Labour government had just spent an immense sum of public money to finance a merger of the two main automobile manufacturers the tendency of capitalism toward monopoly seemed not to have abated. Then, Peter inquired searchingly, what about this same capitalism's tendency to war? Much of the full employment surge that had followed 1945 and made the Great Depression seem so far away was based on a sort of militarized Keynesianism, an arms economy that kept the assembly lines going and the wage packets full, but exposed us all to an unelected and uniformed authority and ultimately to the sheer barbarism that would follow a nuclear exchange. Still reeling as I was from the Cuban Missile moment, and horrified as I had become by the high-tech assault on Vietnam, I was perhaps especially susceptible to persuasion here. Most important, though, it was from Peter that I acquired a grounding in the alternative history of the 20th century. Yes, it was true that the Soviet Union and its satellites were a tyrannical empire, in point of fact a state capitalist system, according to the theoreticians of the International Socialists. But did I know what Rosa Luxemburg had written to Lenin, warning him of the tyranny to come, in 1918? Did I know about the epic struggle of Leon Trotsky to mount an international resistance to Stalin? Was I aware that in mutated and isolated forms that magnificent struggle was still going on? I knew nothing of this, but I became increasingly fascinated to learn of it and to read more of it. I was slowly being inducted into a revolution within the revolution, or to a left that was in and yet not of the left, as it was generally understood. This perfectly suited my already acquired and protective habit of keeping two sets of books. Thus, by the time that I enrolled as an undergraduate at Balliol College, Oxford, I was already a militant student member of the International Socialist Group of Skill, as such factions were to become known after the momentously imminent events in France. That winter of 1967, I doubt that our Oxford branch contained more than a dozen members, perhaps three from the Cowley factories, and the rest drawn from the student-teacher, stray intellectual classes. In a year, we'd grown to perhaps a hundred, with a periphery of many more and an influence well beyond our size. This was because we were the only ones to see 1968 coming, I mean really coming.
I can still remember the feelings of mingled exhilaration and vindication that accompanied this. Some premonitory birth pangs have been felt throughout 1967, even as I was learning from Peter Sedgwick how to try and trace the red thread of the anti-Stalinist left through the bloody labyrinth of the century. In the spring of 1967 had come the atrocious military coup in Greece, making free world NATO complicit in a filthy dictatorship. At about this time, it was becoming clear that the American forces in Vietnam had no chance of repressing the southern insurgency and keeping the country partitioned, unless they were prepared to redouble their troop presence, or else resort to methods of wholesale cruelty and destruction, on which it often seemed that they had decided already. The same was becoming self-evident for another NATO dictatorship, Salazar's bankrupt and odious regime in Portugal, trying in vain to frustrate the forces of liberation in its colonies in southwestern and western Africa. In Prague, the Czechoslovak Communist Party was morally and intellectually disintegrating, purely because people had been permitted to raise the most elementary questions about whether they could read Franz Kafka, for example. In a way most stirringly of all, and with that exemplary dignity and courage that truly has passed into history, black America had quietly and simply folded its arms and said, enough, and was prepared to dare and outface any bully who took up the challenge. There did not seem enough hours in the day or days in the week with which to take part in the different movements of solidarity, but I was no longer a boarding school boy, so I could afford the time. In addition, and rather seductively at that age, one seemed somehow to have become equipped with a special set of spectacles with which to read the newspapers and thereby make unique sense of them. Events in Vietnam and Selma clearly discredited the vaunted new frontier of American pseudo-liberalism, just as the stirrings in Poland and Czechoslovakia demonstrated the historic bankruptcy of Stalinism. While it went without saying that a British Labour government that could not even put down a white settler racist revolt in colonial Rhodesia we all proudly called it by its true name of Zimbabwe, was showing in practice that social democratic reformism had exhausted itself. Soon all humane people would understand the need for a revolution from below, where those who worked and struggled and produced would be the ruling class. Those with eyes to see could detect this with ease, while those whose eyes had yet to be opened could always... Well, it was thought that events would also assist in persuading them. I realized that this may sound slightly as if I had joined a cult, there actually was a rival Trotskyist group, later to make itself notorious by recruiting Corin and Vanessa Redgrave, whose depraved leader, Jerry Healy, did in fact teach us all we needed to learn about cultism and the mental and sexual and financial exploitation of the young and the credulous. I learned a lot about faith-based movements from this early instruction. But the IS, as our group was known, had a relaxed and humorous internal life, and also a quizzical and critical attitude to the 60s mindset. We didn't grow our hair too long because we wanted to mingle with the workers at the factory gate and on the housing estates. We didn't do drugs, which we regarded as a pathetic, weak-minded escapism, almost as contemptible as religion, as well as a bad habit, which could expose us to a plant from the police. Rock and roll and sex were okay. Looking back, I still think we picked the right options. The general atmosphere of intellectual promiscuity and third-world romanticism didn't grab us all that hard, either. If there were any two pseudo-intellectuals who really defined moral silliness in that period, they were Herbert Marcuse and R.D. Lang. The first had come up with the lazy concept of repressive tolerance to explain how liberalism was just another mask for tyranny, and the second was a would-be shrink who believed schizophrenia to be, rather than a nightmarish yet treatable malady, a social construct imposed by the ideology of the family. It so happened that the best critiques of both these frauds, as well as a stringent essay against the marijuana culture, entitled Flowers of Decay, had been written for the annual Socialist Register by my new comrade Peter Sedgwick, who was a qualified expert in mental health, as well as in the difference between frantic Frankfurtian illusion and stubborn material reality. So how lucky I was to have been initiated if that's the word I want, by someone who was a trained and hardened sceptic about the worst of the left, as well as an advocate for the best of it. I can't say that we didn't have to deal with our own cognitive dissonance. The British working class was for the most part entirely unmoved by our exertions. I do remember a demonstration, assiduously prepared for by mass factory gate leafleting, to which exactly no workers showed up. My theoretician friend David Rosenberg, confronting this daunting result, said to me, 
It rather confirms our analysis that the Union bureaucrats can no longer truly mobilise their rank and file. True enough as far as it went, but also true that those who bang their heads against history's wall had better be equipped with some kind of a theoretical crash helmet. It was to take me some time to doff my own. Three major names survive for me from this period when, so solemnly and suddenly history conscious, I had not yet ceased to be a teenager. The first is that of Jacek Kuran, who, with his colleague, Karol Modulewski, had newly written a socialist manifesto from within the forbidding walls of a prison in Poland. These two hardy intellectuals had been members of a Trotskyist group before being abruptly jailed for their work, and it was one of my jobs to see that their pamphlet got a wide circulation, and that our version of anti-communism was heard as loudly as the commonplace Cold War variety. The Polish workers, said this argument, should understand that the Communist Party was their exploiter and not their representative. Did we know that in our tiny way we were assisting at the inception of Polish Solidarność? The second name is that of C.L.R. James, one of the moral titans of 20th century descent. In the 1930s, he'd managed to combine two very attractive positions. He was the main spokesman for the independence of his native Trinidad and the chief cricket correspondent of The Guardian. His book on the latter subject, Beyond a Boundary, elucidates this recondite sport for the uninitiated and also suggests that in several ways it's not really a sport at all but more of a classical art form that prepares young men for social grace as well as for chivalric heroism. James, whose early short stories, collected as Minty Alley, were plainly influential on the early writings of V.S. Naipaul, managed to do without Naipaul's combination of rancor and racial ethnic resentment. He was an internationalist to his core. His monumental work is Black Jacobins, a history of Toussaint Louverture and the slave insurrection in Haiti. This rebellion, taking the slogans of the French Revolution to be universal, ran up against the disagreeable fact that the France of Bonaparte regarded the noble words of 1789 as being, at best, for whites only. James's book, exactly the sort of history that was left out of the school and university syllabus, had a lasting effect on me. So did its author, when I helped arrange a meeting for him at Ruskin College, Oxford, on the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution. He chose to speak largely about Vietnam, putting it squarely in the context of imperialism and the resistance to it, and his wonderfully sonorous voice was as enthralling to me as his very striking carriage and appearance. He was getting on by then, but the nimbus of white hair only accentuated his hollow-cheeked, almost anthracite face. One had heard of his legendary success with women, all of it gallant and consensual, unlike that of some other masters of the platform. But for me, a little crackle of current was provided by the reflection that here stood a man who had, in real time, publicly broken with Stalin and associated with Trotsky, actively taken part in an anti-colonial revolution, and been present, before being hastily deported, in the very early stirrings of the American Civil Rights Movement. Another important thing about CLR, as he was known in our little movement, was his disdainful opposition to any third-world fetishism or half-baked negritude. He had schooled himself in classical literature and regarded the canon of English as something with which every literate person of any culture should become acquainted. He had a particular love for Thackeray, and it was said that he could recite chapters of Vanity Fair by heart. This commitment was important then, and was to become much more so, as the 1960s fashion turned against Eurocentrism. I visited CLR on his deathbed in London, on the corner of Shakespeare Avenue and Railton Road, in the late 1980s. He was still quite lucid, but hard of hearing. I asked him to inscribe a new edition of Black Jacobins, and when he inquired what I'd like him to put on the flyleaf, simply suggested that he use the old left salutation and put yours fraternally. He fixed me with a piercing look. I do not, he said sternly, believe in eternity. For a moment I was confused, and then thought how apt it was that in mishearing me but repudiating the afterlife, CLR could get fraternity and eternity entangled with one another. The third name from the esoteric historical and cultural dimension with which I was becoming so enamoured was that of Victor Serge. This Belgian-born proletarian rebel had graduated from embroilment in the politics of Barcelona and harsh experience of the inside of many European jails, episodes which were to help him produce two excellent books in the shape of Birth of Our Power and Men in Prison, to direct participation in the upheavals of the First World War and the Bolshevik seizure of power. 
During his work with the Third International, he had had the opportunity to see the monstrosity of Stalinism in detail and as it was actually taking shape. It seems possible that he was the first person to use the word totalitarianism. In any event, he was early in apprehending the whole implication of the concept. He had to get out of the Soviet Union in a big hurry, having backed the left opposition, and might well have died in the gulag if it had not been for the intercession of a few of those European intellectuals who had not capitulated to the Red Tsar. His precious papers were all stolen from him by the secret police at the frontier. He was able to republish his poems from memory, and that capacious memory, too, was strong enough to enable him to produce a novel, The Case of Comrade Tulayev, which many good judges regard as the earliest and best fictional representation of the show trials and the Great Terror. Ending up in exile in Mexico, like some others who had survived what we Luxembourgists and Trotskyists used to call the midnight of the century, the dire moment of explicit collusion between Stalin and Hitler, Serge died there, but not before producing one of the finest autobiographies of that same century, Memoirs of a Revolutionary. As it happened, none other than Peter Sedgwick had, when I met him, just edited and introduced a fine edition of this book for Oxford University Press. My headmaster, Alan Barker, had produced a potted history of the American Civil War, and my English master, Colin Wilcoxon, had edited Langland and Piers Plowman, and in my budding bibliophile way I did possess signed copies of these volumes. But I'd never before had a friend who was in so many ways an actual author and critic, and of the books I've lost in the various moves and mess-ups of my life, the one I regret most keenly is the one that Peter Sedgwick gave me. I shall not forget the inscription, though. To Chris, it said, in friendship and fraternity. This was my official induction into the comradely manners and addresses of the left, but it also presented a problem which I didn't particularly like to raise, as we invariably said when mounting an objection. The awkward fact was, I simply couldn't bear or stand to be called Chris. Chris or Christopher? Here's Terry Eagleton, trying to be funny while describing himself accurately in Reason, Faith and Revolution. Perhaps I should add that when Christopher Hitchens was still a humble Chris, he and I were comrades in the same far-left political outfit. But he has gone on to higher things, discovering in the process a degree of political maturity as a naturalized citizen of Babylon, whereas I have remained stuck in the same old political groove, a case of arrested development, if ever there was one. There was a little more to this dislike of having my name circumcised or otherwise amputated than may at first appear. Chris, it seemed to me, was too matey and pseudo-friendly as an abbreviation, even had it gone with another kind of surname. Chris Price, an old comrade of mine and a Labour member of Parliament, almost preferred it. But then his second name began with a P, whereas mine began with an H. And the next thing after Chris Hitchens, itself a dreary sound, would be, given this incentive to ditch the aspirate, Chris Hitchens. All other aesthetic considerations to one side, I knew that this would be more than Yvonne could bear. What she wanted was to see me represent Balliol on the University Challenge team, where I did actually make my first ever television appearance. I can still remember the name of the captain of St. David's Lampeter, a theological college in North Wales, for heaven's sake which trounced us in the very first round and demolished the complacent Balliol myth of effortless superiority. He was called Jim Mellican. My mother had not nurtured her firstborn son in order to hear him addressed as if he were a taxi driver or a pothole filler. And yet, to that son's chosen brothers and sisters of the Labour and Socialist movement, it was a part of the warmth and fraternity, part of one's very acceptance, that the informal version be adopted without any further permission or ado. Could I tell Yvonne that so many of my dearest associates were now called names like Harry or Norm? I couldn't see it softening the blow. She swallowed a bit when someone did call me Chris in her presence, and shuddered when I myself used one of the movement's favourite nouns and verbs, the key word concern, with the accent on the first syllable. So help me, I can plead that I hadn't quite known I was doing it. Oddly enough, as the English say on so many occasions when there's nothing in the least bit odd to relate, as in, I saw old Jorkins the other day, oddly enough, I hadn't ever had to face this problem before. At English boarding schools you are known by your last name, or by your initials if you're very lucky or extremely unlucky. 
Yvonne had been vigilant about this too, understanding that one's initials had often to be stenciled on luggage or briefcases, and deploring the thoughtless parents who baptised their sons with life-threatening initials like B.D. or B.O. There were always nicknames, but these were mostly infantile, such as Jumbo for a fatso. If another boy was addressing you by your actual first name, it often heralded some doomed or farcical romantic proposal. And the time when all my best friends would solve the problem by calling me Hitch lay well in the future. Meanwhile, this Chris Christopher business was a torment, and, as I say, it symbolized something about the double life I was trying to lead at Oxford. I use the words double life without any shame. To be sure, I had hoped to remake myself into a serious person and an ally of the working class, and was educating myself with that in view. But I also wanted to see a bit of life in the world and to shed the carapace of a sexually inhibited schoolboy. There was the Oxford of A.D. Lindsay's great anti-Munich and anti-Chamberlain and anti-Hitler election campaign in 1938, Lindsay having been head of my college. And then there was the Oxford of the great steaming and clanging car factories that had been founded by Lord Nuffield, one of the financiers of pre-war British fascism. But somewhere there was also the Oxford of Evelyn Waugh and Oscar Wilde and Max Beerbohm and punts and strawberries and enticing young ladies. Occasionally the two aspects overlapped. In the Victorian buildings of the Oxford Union Debating Society, which I joined on my first day, there were some faded pre-Raphaelite frescoes executed by the Eastheed, but the socialist Eastheed, William Morris. In any case, I was determined as far as I could to have it both ways. To do otherwise, it seemed, would have been to miss the point of being there. As the head of my college, we had Christopher Hill. Nobody ever thought of calling him Chris, who was arguably the most distinguished Marxist historian of his day, and certainly the man who had done the most to influence thinking about that English Civil War, or rather English Revolution, which had ended by separating the head of King Charles I from his shoulders in 1649. One could have Sherry with this amazing man who had called his daughter Fanny at a time when he thought that 18th century pornography was a rarefied pastime that would never catch up to him, and learn to negotiate his mild disarming stutter. Or, down the road a bit in Wadham College, there was Sir Maurice Barra, an inspired classicist around whom the aura of Brideshead still clung. He always had the look to me of a near-extinct but still smouldering volcano, on our first introduction, he gave me one of the most frankly appraising, once-over, up-and-down glances I've ever had. The joke about Wadham and Gomorrah, apparently, had been his own idea. My main tutor was Dr. Stephen Lukes, already famous for his study of Emil Durkheim and soon to be more celebrated still, for his book Power, A Radical View. Thanks to his kind interest in me, I was taken to a private seminar at Nuffield College, yes, named after that fascist sympathizing automobile tycoon, to talk with Noam Chomsky, who had come to deliver the John Locke lectures. And I was also invited to a small cocktail party to meet Sir Isaiah Berlin. I hope that by dropping these names I can convey something of the headiness of it. It might have been heady at any time, but in the 68 atmosphere it chanced to coincide with other ferments and intoxications as well. It's trite to say that each generation rebels, and I had already had the chance to get bored with the late 50s image of a rebel without a cause. But it so fell out that we, the so-called boomers, or at least the 68 portion of us, were rebels with a cause. Thus it happened that one evening in the Oxford Union dining room, when I was still not yet 20 and perhaps not even 19, I acted as host to Isaiah Berlin, our guest as an invited speaker on the subject of his very first published book, The Life and Thought of Karl Marx. The sponsor was the Oxford University Labour Club, which had not yet irretrievably split between the Socialists and the Social Democrats. And I had been listed on the club's card as secretary, Chris Hitchens, Bow. This rankled twice. Even the name of my ancient college, Balliol, had been pruned and cut back. Still, not much could spoil an evening where one was hosting an eyewitness of the Bolshevik Revolution in St. Petersburg. Still, the only such person I've ever met. I have to say that the evening was two kinds of shock to me. In the first place, Berlin's urbanity and magnetism were like nothing I'd ever met before, and vindicated, I remember thinking, the whole point of coming to Oxford in the first place. Cured me for life, cured me for life, he murmured authoritatively, about the experience of seeing a communist revolution at first hand. 
having had every opportunity to grow weary of undergraduate naivety and or enthusiasm, he betrayed no sign of it and managed to answer questions as if they were being put to him for the first time. This I understood as a great gift without being able to define it, just as I who knew nothing of food or wine somehow understood that the dinner we were offering him, a strain on our fiercely straitened socialist budget, was far inferior to the average he could have expected if dining at home or in college or indeed alone. I was later to find that George Orwell, invited by Philip Larkin in 1941 to address a joint meeting of the Labour Club and the English Club, had been given an inedible dinner because Larkin had earlier splurged all the hospitality fund on an ill-advised blowout for Dylan Thomas. The second shock came when we moved to the seminar room for the talk itself. Though he spoke with his customary plummy authority and leavened this with a good deal of irony and wit, Berlin clearly didn't know very much either about Marx or Marxism. He woodenly maintained that Marx was a historical determinist. It's true that the old boy sometimes spoke of history itself as an actor but he actually stressed human agency more than almost any other thinker. It came to me later as quite a confirmation to read in Berlin's biography that he had been commissioned to write a quickie book on Marx and had told the publishers how unqualified he felt to do it. This was another aspect of his famous insecurity about his own golden reputation, a self-doubt that he could never get his many disciples to take seriously. But at the time I was marooned between two almost equally subversive and exciting thoughts. Was it possible that the class of celebrated experts were all like this? That there was an academic kingdom of Oz where it was only pretended that the authorities were absolute? Or was I putting on airs and presuming to judge my betters? His very name seemed to exude authority. Old Testament conjoined to the brilliant but haunted capital. The only rival in nomenclature I can call to mind is my friend Pascal Bruckner. At the somewhat later cocktail party in Beaumont Street, Berlin again lived up to his billing by first remembering my name and the circumstances under which we had met, and second, remembering that I'd said that his talk had made my own Marxism a little more self-confident, and third, ignoring much more distinguished figures who wanted his company, and telling me quite a long story about Henry James and Winston Churchill. Having told you that much, how can I avoid retelling it to you? It seems that in the early days of the First World War, both James and Churchill had been invited to a lunch party near one of the Channel ports, James presumably because he lived at Rye, and Churchill because he was running the Admiralty. James was all enthusiasm, having applied to become a British citizen, and flushed with the zeal of the convert. Churchill, however, had no time for the old man's eager questions about the progress of the war, and rather snubbed him. When the coming statesman had left in his chauffeur-driven car to go back to London, the rest of the company turned to Henry James to see if he could be cheered up after being so crushed. But he brightened on his own account and said, It is strange with how, on even a hand, nature chooses to distribute her richest favours. Going on to add, But it rather bucks one up. In that way that was so characteristic of him, Berlin went on to repeat, Rather bucks one up, rather bucks one up, a couple of times. I had had a frisson of another sort, when seated in a small Nuffield seminar room with Noam Chomsky. Having attended those John Locke lectures in which he had galvanized the university by insisting on delivering one of the series solely on the question of Vietnam, I knew that he was a highly potent scholar and speaker. A large number of leftists in those days suddenly discovered a consuming interest in linguistics and the deep structures of generative grammar. But up close I realized that there was something toneless about him, something indeed almost mechanical, as if he were afraid to show any engagement with the emotions. He wasted, I remember, a huge amount of time on a banal question about the American Maoist sect, progressive labor. Through this and other experiences, I began to discern one of the elements of an education. Get as near to the supposed masters and commanders as you can and see what stuff they're really made of. As I watched famous scholars and professors flounder here and there, I also, in my career as a speaker at the Oxford Union, had a chance to meet senior ministers and parliamentarians up close and dine with them before as well as drink with them afterwards and be amazed once again at how ignorant and sometimes plain stupid were the people who claimed to run the country. This was an essential stage of my formation and one for which I am hugely grateful though I fear it must have made me much more insufferably cocky and sure of myself than I deserve to be. A consciousness of rectitude can be a terrible thing, and in those days I didn't just think I was right. I thought that we, 
our group of international socialists in particular, were being damn well proved right. If you have never yourself had the experience of feeling that you are yoked to the great steam engine of history, then allow me to inform you that the conviction is a very intoxicating one. In the early spring of 1968, we saw the valiant guerrillas of the Viet Cong carrying their fight to the very doorstep of the American embassy in Saigon. Not long after came the never-to-be-forgotten shots of the Capitol in Washington, shrouded in plumes of smoke and flame, as black America refused to sit still for the murder of the gentle Martin Luther King. In Poland, a so-called anti-Zionist purge proved that the Stalinist gerontocrats would stoop even to Hitlerite tactics to repress dissent and prolong their sterile and boring hold on power. The year began to gather pace and acquire a rhythm. In late April, on Hitler's birthday to be precise, Enoch Powell appeared to insult the memory of Dr. King by making a speech warning that coloured immigration in Britain would eventuate in bloodshed. He succeeded at any rate in igniting a bonfire of rubbishy racism among many elements of the British working class. A few weeks later, the French working class appeared to make a completely different point by joining a revolt against ten years of gaullism that had originally begun among Parisian students, and by not merely going on strike, but occupying the factories that warehoused them for the working day. Many of the Paris 68 slogans struck my cohort as absurd or quixotic or narcissistic. Take your desires for reality was one especially silly one. But I shall never forget how the workers at the Berlier factory rearranged the big letters of the company's name to read Liberté right over the factory gate. Suddenly it did truly seem possible that the revolutionary tradition of Europe was being revived. How was I to know that I was watching the end of a tradition rather than the resurrection of one? I kept that transistor radio by my bed, and almost every morning I would reach out and turn it on and be forced out of bed by some fresh crisis. Bobby Kennedy slain, the implosion of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, the mass mobilizations of American youth against the draft. When I was 18 and 19 and 20, there was no 18-year-old franchise, and the single deadliest and most telling line of Barry Maguire's then-famous song, Eve of Destruction, was, you're old enough to kill, but not for voting. It's sobering and depressing to reflect that Maguire, who'd mainly been influenced by the war in the Middle East the preceding year, is now one of those bards who still likes to sing about the end of days, because he is a millennialist and fundamentalist Christian. But by then, I had come to prefer even the hardline militant verses of Phil Oakes to the more lenient Bob Dylan. One was, to a certain degree, compelled to think in generational terms, and in these terms my whole arrival at Balliol, an outcome for which I'd worked so hard for so long, had been a disappointment. There were still petty rules and regulations covering one's movements, still a curfew by which time the college gate was locked and all female guests had to be out of one's room, still instructions about what to wear, and still the impression that one's new dons, like one's former teachers, were in loco parentis, or surrogate parents or guardians. In time, my generation was to change a lot of that too. But we of the international socialists thought that such alterations were incidental, indeed almost irrelevant when contrasted to the global struggle of which we quite genuinely believed ourselves to be a part. Let me give an example. I would once have said, let me give a concrete example. For some time, there had been mounting reports of a rising in Africa against Portuguese colonialism. The senescent dictator, Antonio Salazar, a dirty relic from the era of Mussolini and Hitler, held the people of Portugal itself in bondage, but also counted among his possessions the territories of Angola, Mozambique, and Guinea-Bissau. Angola and Mozambique, if you glance at a map, are like pillars or gates guarding the eastern and western approaches to Zimbabwe, then Rhodesia, and South Africa. Thus it seemed fairly obvious that a victory against Portuguese fascism would also spell the end, in not too much time, of apartheid. Picture then my pride and excitement when it was announced that Dr. Eduardo Monlane, the founder of the Mozambican movement for Elima, the front for the liberation of Mozambique, would be in England and had accepted an invitation from our modest little labor club to come and speak. We booked a big hall for him and a very small room, my own, inside the college because our resources were exhausted for a reception. Both events were full, and I shall not forget the immense pride with which I opened my door to this genial and eloquent and brave and modest man. In my lodgings that evening, as I think back on it, the guests, among them Robert Rescher, representative in London of Mandela's African National Congress, 
included the spokesmen for several movements that were later to become governments. After Mondlane's rafter-ringing speech, through which Michael Prest sat by the door determinedly holding a stout and sharp umbrella in case any local fascists tried any rough stuff, we all marched in torchlight procession to lay a wreath for those who had died to free their country. A few weeks later, Dr. Mondlane opened a parcel in his office in Tanzania and was murdered by an explosive charge that had been sent to him by the Portuguese secret police. I have since laid another wreath on his grave in a free Mozambique. I can't be as proud now as I was then of also hosting Nathan Shamirira, a spokesman for the black majority in white Rhodesia, for whom we arranged a meeting in the precincts of Rhodes House itself, one of the great imperialists' many endowments to Oxford. He spoke persuasively enough, but the next time I saw him in the flesh he was a minister in Robert Mugabe's unspeakable government. However, and in compensation, I can say that Nelson Mandela, then only at the beginning of his almost three decades of imprisonment, was made an honorary vice president of the Labour Club and had his name put on our membership cards. We wrote to him on Roman Island to inform him of this honour. Decades later, when I met him at the British Ambassador's house in Washington, I rather absurdly asked him if he had ever received the letter. With that room-warming smile of his, he replied that he had indeed received it, and that he remembered it brightening his day. I didn't really believe this charming pretense, but I did become voiceless for a minute or so. Just as Oxford allowed one to meet near legendary members of the establishment's firmament on nearly equal terms, so it enabled encounters with celebrated academic dissidents. One of the achievements of our year was to bring the students of Ruskin College, the Labour Movement Institute for Scholarship-Minded Workers, into the argument. All right, not to bring them, but to help them bridge the gap by, for example, demanding that they be made eligible to join the Oxford Union. At gatherings of the History Workshop, held on Ruskin's grounds and in nearby alehouses, I heard E.P. Thompson deliver an impromptu lecture on the enclosures of common land in the 18th and 19th centuries, in which he brought an otherwise unsentimental audience to tears with his recitation of the poems of John Clare. The gentle and humane spirit of the late Raphael Samuel was the animating force in this higher education. His democratic energy was boundless and his meek, Modest appearance always made him a special target for the rough attentions of the police. I can still see him being rudely shoved into a cell where I and others were already penned after a demonstration, his spectacles deliberately broken and his face and hands cut and bruised for all the world like some luckless Jewish scholar who'd been made a plaything by the brown comedians on Kristallnacht. Taking his seat on the bare floor and looking myopically and cheerfully about himself, he reconvened the last session of the history workshop and made us all recollect how even Edward Thompson had left a few things out of the account. Nowadays, the very word workshop is an intimation to me of boredom and dogma, and I shall never forget Raphael's honesty when he finally wrote in the 1980s that he didn't really desire to live in a socialist society, but his theatres of memory is still a potent and eloquent reminder of a braver time, the recollection of which I don't have the right to deny. All this was very much a part of the Chris half of my existence. The Chris who wore a donkey jacket and got himself beaten up by scabs in a punch-up on the picket line at French and Collett's non-union auto parts factory. Fenton swears that I even donned a beret to lead a demonstration. He's quite incapable of an untruth, but I'm sure I didn't do it more than once. This was all in a day's work, a day that might include leafleting or selling the socialist worker outside a car plant in the morning, then spray-painting pro viet Cong graffiti on the walls, and arguing vehemently with communists and social democrats or rival groups of Trotskyists long into the night. These latter battles were by far the most bitter and strenuous ones, and they often involved disputes that would have seemed ridiculously arcane to the outsider as to whether the Soviet system was a deformed or degenerated worker state, for example, as opposed to our indictment of it as state capitalist. However, a training in logic chopping and Talmudic-style micro-exegesis can come in handy in later life, as can a training in speaking with a bullhorn from an upturned milk crate outside a factory, and then later scrambling into a dinner jacket and addressing the Oxford Union Debating Society under the rules of parliamentary order. That last example was an instance of the Christopher side. It was through the Union, in fact, that I found myself becoming socially involved with an altogether different set. These were confident young men who owned fast cars, who had rooms rather than a room, 
who wore waistcoats and cravats and drank wine and liqueurs instead of beer. After I'd made some successful sally or other in a union debate, a group of these closed in on me as the proceedings were ending, and more or less challenged me to come and have a cocktail. I couldn't resist, anyway, I didn't want to. Here, I thought, might be the entree to that more gorgeous and seductive Oxford, of which I'd read so much and thus far experienced so little. Thereby, and perhaps not quite unlike poor dowdy Charles Ryder in War's Masterpiece, I found myself from time to time transported into the world of Christchurch and the Gridiron Club, and invited to dine in restaurants which featured tasseled menus and wine lists. This was wholly new to me, and potentially very embarrassing too, since I had virtually no money. The commander, when I turned eighteen, had taken me to the bank, opened an account in my name with fifty pounds in it, and told me, in effect, that that was my lot. However, without a word actually being spoken, it was subtly conveyed to me by my new friends that I wasn't expected to reciprocate. I was, instead, expected to sing for my supper. This could have been corrupting, but I justified it to myself by saying that I was learning from, and perhaps even teaching, the enemy camp. In the late sixties, it wasn't only we who thought there might be a revolution around the corner. Quite a good portion of the establishment was fairly rattled and apprehensive also, and the Tory press was full of material which, because it tended to exaggerate our influence and in numbers, made those of us on the hard left feel that perhaps we weren't wasting our time. The university authorities at one time seriously considered paving over the cobblestones in some of Oxford's older streets, lest they be dug up and employed as missiles, as had occurred in Paris. In case I may seem too opportunistic, let me say that I genuinely came to like some of these gilded and witty reactionaries. One of them, the late David Levy, later quite a celebrated conservative intellectual, was certainly the first proto-fascist I had ever met, and I would often almost literally pinch myself as he burbled gaily on about Charles Maurras and Action Francaise, about the beauties of Salazar's Portugal and Franco's Spain, and sang the words of the Mussolini anthem, Giovinezza. Gaily might chance to be the apt expression here, because there was a good deal of camp among these young men, and a certain amount of active bisexuality, though I don't think David himself ever even looked at a woman. It makes me blush a bit to say so, but I was still prized for my looks in those days, and from experience at my own much less glamorous boarding school, could read the signs and knew the ropes. Every now and then, even though I was by then fixed on the pursuit of young women, a mild and mildly enjoyable relapse would occur, and I suppose I can claim this, if that's the right word, of two young men who later became members of Margaret Thatcher's government. For this reason I can't really give any more names, but one oblique consequence was that I got myself invited to meet John Sparrow at All Souls. How to describe the warden, as he was universally known, and how to describe his college, a florid antique shop that admitted no students and guarded only the exalted privileges of its fellows, a den of iniquity to every egalitarian, and a place where silver candelabras and goblets adorned a nightly debauch of venison and port. Or so the tales ran. It was in this thick, rich atmosphere that the Munich Agreement had partly been hatched. There was a whole book, with the simple damning title, All Souls and Appeasement. I absolutely could not wait to see the place for myself. It was by no means a disappointment. Sparrow was hosting a small lunch. Luncheon might have been more than mot juste. And as he took my hand with both of his, he summoned a butler named Lane to inquire what I might desire by way of a drink. I had never seen a butler before and this one had the same name as Algy's manservant and the importance of being earnest. I had barely had time to adjust myself when lunch began, and I was overwhelmed by the variety and deliciousness of the food and wine, and the splendour of the silver and glass. Sparrow exerted himself to live up to everything one had ever heard about him. He declared that homosexuality ought to be punishable, gravely punishable, as he put it, with purring relish. Even though he hoped to remain a member of a sophisticated minority, that would be exempt from this very code. Since the law had only recently been changed, I recall myself guessing that there was an element of masochistic nostalgia in this. Sparrow had evidently done some hard thinking about buggery. He had contributed to the last great argument about literary censorship in England, arguing that in a very rugged passage of Lady Chatterley's lover, D. H. Lawrence had plainly intended to suggest that the gamekeeper had sodomized his boss's wife. 
I must say that I agree with this analysis, though what struck me most about the novel when I last read it was the way in which gruff Nottinghamshire miners say acts for ask in just the same manner that now marks off the speech of the black American ghetto. Some work here surely for a philologist, but not a project that would have especially amused Sparrow. Like Lord Marchman in Brideshead, Sparrow was everything that the socialists would have me be. His reactionary style was almost, if not in fact, a self-parody. He had engaged a photographer to walk around Oxford and take discreet photographs, not of the most beautiful and epicene young men, but of the most scrofulous and surly ones. This might have betrayed an interest in rough trade and was perhaps not unconnected to it, but when he showed me the resulting album, which contained snatched studies of quite a few of my more disaffected friends, he accompanied my turning of the pages with the reading of Walter Pater on the ephemerality and fragility of youth. I was by then a dinner guest and even an after-dinner guest over the candles and decanters as they reflected each other in the high polish of the table. One evening I was placed next to that great Cornish queen, Ale Rouse, who'd only recently unburdened himself of a new gay theory of the origin and dedication of Shakespeare's sonnets, but mainly wanted to tell me what I already knew, that Hitchens was a Cornish name, and positively demanded to be told whether the Mrs. Hitchens, who kept sending him such fervent and unwanted love letters, was by any chance my mother. He was so lost in conceit that he did not, I remember thinking, completely trust my denial. For all who try to lead a double life, there will eventually be a small but interesting revenge, as James Fenton later phrased it to me. Mine came when I was addressing a crowd of infuriated students from the steps of the Clarendon building and denouncing some official infraction of our rights to free sex and free association and free speech. Over the heads of the audience, as I was hitting my peroration, I saw the silvered and saturnine features of the warden, who must by then have been the most execrated figure on the Oxford left. A twitch at the corner of his lip betrayed his design, which I detected almost at the same instant. Making a discreet but determined path through the astonished protesters, he arrived just as I was concluding, and said, My dear Christopher, I'm so sorry to have missed most of your speech. I've, I've no doubt it was admirable, but I do hope you haven't forgotten that you promised to look in after dinner tonight. It was a moment of cockcrow. I could have pretended not to understand, but I replied instead that I was looking forward to it, and as he glided away with the sleek air of game set and match clinging to him, faced the slightly baffled faces of my comrades. I could have taken refuge in some know-your-enemy formulation, but something in me said that this would be ignoble. I didn't want a one-dimensional politicized life. I sympathized all the same with those who were effectively forced to live one. Again to cite James Fenton, who first pointed it out to me, you were compelled to notice something different about the American students. As the rest of us poured out of hall after dinner and had a smoke and a drink in the quad, they tended to draw aside and form a huddle as if hashing over some private matter or specific grief. We all knew what this was. Having been lucky enough to become Rhodes scholars, or in other ways be chosen as envoys of their country, they found themselves overseas at a time when the United States was conducting an imperialist war in Indochina and a holding action against the insistent demands of its own long-oppressed black minority at home. These things would have been bad enough by themselves, but in addition it was entirely possible that these young Americans could be compelled to take part in a war they mostly regarded as criminal. Hence those tight little circles on the lawn as the Oxford dusk came on. Should they defy the draft and become outlaws with the choice of prison or exile, or submit and become obedient and get on with their careers? It's been often said since that it was only the military draft that stoked anti-war feeling among the relatively privileged American students, and that once the system of conscription was abolished, the feeling of outrage about Vietnam was diminished in proportion. I was there, and I remember clearly, and I feel it a point of honor to give the lie to this sneer. The young Americans I knew were not afraid of being killed, or rather, they were very much more afraid that they would be forced to kill. I would never have guessed at the time that conscription would be abolished by Richard Nixon, and still less that he would appoint Milton Friedman and Alan Greenspan to the Presidential Commission on the subject. The two right-wing libertarians condemned the draft as involuntary servitude. Today, almost the only people who call for the return of the system are collectivists and liberals. I remember the address, 46 Leckford Road, where many of them shared a house. Frank Aller, for example, a brilliant and conscience-ridden young man, 
eventually took his own life because he could not bear the conflict between his love of his country and his hatred of the war. Another young man lodging at the same address was Bill Clinton. I don't recollect him so well, though my friend and contemporary Martin Walker, later to be one of Clinton's best biographers, swears that he remembers us being in the same room. The occasion was to become a famous one, since it was the very time when the habitual and professional liar Clinton later claimed that he didn't inhale. There's no mystery about this any more than there ever was about his later falsifications. He has always been allergic to smoke, and he preferred, like many another marijuana enthusiast, to take his dope in the form of large handfuls of cookies and brownies. Distributed around Oxford at the time were many young men, Strobe Talbot, Robert Reich, Ira Magaziner, who were later to become members of the Clinton administration. Of these I remember Magaziner, later the man to ruin American health care on behalf of Hillary Clinton, the best. He had been something of a leader of the anti-war movement at Brown University in Rhode Island. I had written Ring Ira on a pad by the telephone in a house I was then sharing. And when the police came calling on another matter to do with a public demonstration, they took a lot of persuading that this was not a sinister appointment with Irish republicanism. I didn't much like what little I knew of Clinton, and this may have had something to do with my suspicion that he too was trying to have things both ways. Someone was informing on the American anti-war students and reporting their activities to Mr. Cord Meyer and the CIA desk at the London Embassy in Grosvenor Square. We knew this because the fools once approached the wrong guy as a recruit and he blew the whistle. And I'm not the only person who has sometimes suspected that it was Clinton who was the snitch. On another Face Both Ways question, he and I both became peripherally involved, at different times I hasten to add, with a pair of Leckford Road girls who, principally sapphic in their interests, would arrange for sessions of group frolic. The men who flattered themselves that they were the desired objective would later discover that they were merely the goats tethered in the clearing, the better to magnetize more women into the trap. I have always thought that to be a deft and sinuous scheme and wish that I had understood its dynamics better at the time. But this is very much like the rest of life, where, as Kierkegaard so shrewdly observes, one is condemned to live it forward and review it backward. If you're going to sleep with Thatcher's future ministers and toy with a future president's lesbian girlfriend, in other words, you will not be able to savour it fully at the time, and will have to content yourself with recollecting it in some kind of tranquillity. I tried at the time and have even attempted retrospectively to pretend that I enjoyed Oxford more than I did. For example, my tutor in formal logic was Dr. Anthony Kenny, who was only then beginning to raise the vast architecture of his now magisterial history of philosophy. Descending the staircase from his room after a tutorial, I remember thinking that I had finally lodged in my mind the principles of Cartesian reasoning. Kenny had been a Catholic priest in a tough district of Liverpool before deciding that Thomas Aquinas's proofs of God's existence were unsatisfactory. He left the ministry and quite some time later got married, at which point the Catholic Church excommunicated him because he had violated his vows as a priest. Many people don't understand that the term lapsed Catholic entails the sinister implication that only the Church can decide who leaves it, and why, or when. I had already come across some extreme communist sects which would insist on expelling anyone who wished to resign. Anyway, on the evening of my Cartesian tutorial, I sat in my room listening to all the bells of Oxford chiming and tolling and telling myself, here you are, in a college that has been a great centre of learning since the medieval schoolmen. Outside your window is the very place where Bishops Cranmer and Latimer and Ridley were burned at the stake for their principles. You can be the inheritor of all this and more and give yourself to the life of the mind. Even as I tried to convince myself, I realized what I have often had to accept since, that if you have to try and persuade yourself of something, you are probably already very much inclined to doubt or distrust it. Did I really think that my examinations in logic and philosophy didn't matter much because a revolution was in progress, or at least in prospect? I did. Did I ignore my parents and my tutors when they said that my career prospects would suffer unless I applied myself more to my studies? Yes, again, and not so much with careless abandon as with the thought that such counter-inducements were somehow contemptible. Did I go to a vast demonstration in Grosvenor Square in London, outside the American Embassy, which turned into a pitched battle between ourselves and the mounted police, and wonder in advance how many people might actually be killed in such a confrontation? Yes, I did and I can still recall the way in which my throat and heart seemed to swell as the police were temporarily driven back and the advancing allies of the Vietnamese began to sing We Shall Overcome. I added to my police record for arrests, of all of which I am still reasonably proud. 
when a charge against me of incitement to riot was eventually dropped, I was slightly crestfallen because I had thought it a backhanded tribute to my abilities as an orator. I helped organise a sit-down outside an Oxford hairdresser's shop that refused black female customers. While still on bail for this pending offence, I sat down again on the pitch at a cricket match involving a segregated South African team. In court, I failed to amuse the magistrate when I complained of the brutal behaviour of the arresting police officer and gave the number that he'd worn on his uniform. How can you be so sure, snapped the man on the judicial bench, of that number? Merely because your honour, I responded sarcastically. The figures 1389 are the same as the date of the great peasant's revolt. The resulting heavy fine reflected the court's view of my impromptu contempt, as well as of my refusal to swear on the Bible when I took my oath. When found guilty, my comrades and I rose to our feet in the dock and sang the International, fists raised in the approved and defiant manner. I didn't have the money to pay the fine, but I had been told that there was every chance that John Lennon would shell out for all of us. I later vastly preferred Mick Jagger's Street Fighting Man, which had been written for my then friend Tarek Ali, to the Beatles' more conciliatory, you say you want a revolution, but in those days I would also have agreed with one of Vladimir Ilyich Lenin's favourite statements. Borrowed, as I now know, from the satirical juvenile, that pecunia non olet, or money has no smell. Anyway, I left the court in a hurry because on the following day I was due to board a charter flight that would take me across the Atlantic for the first time in my life and land me in revolutionary Cuba. Havana versus Prague. Within the revolution, everything. Outside the revolution, nothing. Fidel Castro. Ex ecclesia nulla salus. Outside the church, no salvation. Thomas Aquinas. At the risk of seeming ridiculous, the true revolutionary is moved by true feelings of love. Ernesto Che Guevara. Socialism with a human face. Alexander Dubček. The expedition to Cuba was the toughest exercise in double accounting that I'd so far undertaken. It was only a few months since Guevara had met his pathetic yet stirring demise in the highlands of Bolivia, and the Cuban government had announced that any young leftist who wanted to break the embargo and could get to the island would be a guest in a special camp for internationalists. This, with its chance to mingle with the revolutionaries from all over the globe, was an unmissable invitation but it was also an opportunity to see whether Cuba's claim to be an alternative model to Soviet state socialism possessed any staying power. It's difficult to remember today when Havana itself is run by a wrinkled oligarchy of old communist gargoyles, but in the 1960s there was a dramatic contrast between the waxworks in the Kremlin and the young, informal, spontaneous and even somewhat sexy leadership in Havana. Not that we of the international socialists who sent our own team of polemicists and dialecticians to the camp were much impressed by beard-sporting histrionic types either. It was revolution within the revolution again. Since I couldn't pay that fine, how had I paid for the flight? Easy. I had just been awarded a Kitchener scholarship, named for the man whose face adorned the World War I poster, admonishing all young Britons to remember that your country needs you. Available only to the sons of naval and military officers who were obliged to lead low-budget lives at university. This award required an interview with some red-faced old buffers who wanted mainly to reassure themselves about one's general soundness. I had a decent shave and put on a tie and played along. When asked what I did for extracurricular activity, I cited the Oxford Union. Didn't Her Majesty the Queen, one of the whiskery veterans, inquired, just recently attend a debate there? This was too good to miss. She had, in fact, shown up, and I had been technically a member of the committee that ran the debate. Modestly, I made the most of this fact, and knew in that moment that the scholarship named for the red-coated imperial hero of Khartoum would be mine, and would help finance a socialist incendiary. I think I may also have justified my duplicity by recalling the shameful way in which the Navy had treated my father over his pension. Yes, that's right, they owe us. What great self-persuaders we all are. At Gatwick Airport, I recognized quite a few of the brothers and sisters who turned up to board the scruffy... Czechoslovak charter aircraft that was to take us to Havana. And I submitted sullenly to the business of being pulled to one side while plain-clothed British policemen rudely grabbed my passport and wrote down all my details in a ledger before letting me proceed. Who cares, I thought angrily. Their rule won't last much longer. The belly of the beast was the expression 
commonly used for the United States in those days, and there seemed something gratifying in the way that our plane made only a brief touchdown in Newfoundland before embarking upon the second leg and setting course for Havana while avoiding the taint of Yankee airspace. Arrival at the Jose Marti airport with its blinding sunshine and crushing humidity was an excitement all of its own. We were greeted by smiling and good-looking young comrades who offered a tray of daiquiri rum cocktails. This first impression was as unlike the Berlin Wall version of official communism as one could wish. But there came at once a slight moment of awkwardness. After handing over my passport, I waited a while, and having by now heard a couple of rousing speeches of welcome, asked for it back. The hospitable internationalist grin on the face of the Cuban host contracted perhaps a millimetre or so. We look after it for you. You do? For how long? Until you leave our country. I felt an immediate sense of unease, but decided to get over it. I might perhaps have succeeded in getting over it, were it not for a couple of later developments. The scheme was for our plane load of mainly British internationalists to board the waiting buses that would take us to the Campamento Cinco de Mayo, a newly built work camp in the hilly, verdant province of Pinar del Rio. Here we would join our French, German, Italian, African and other compañeros and have dialogues with them in the evening while helping to plant much-needed coffee seedlings during the day. In this fashion we would build links between different insurgencies at the grassroots level while, at the seedling level, helping to rid Cuba of its notorious colonial dependency on the single crop, the infamous monoculture of sugar. What could be more agreeable? Not unlike the state of Kentucky, which subsists on bourbon, gambling, and tobacco, Cuba's economy rested almost entirely on the manufacture of agreeable toxins like rum and cigars, but even then its chief export was its own citizens. When I returned to Cuba some years later, there was no trace to be found of the coffee plantation, and in the era of Gorbachev's perestroika, which Castro was resisting, about a 50-50 chance of getting a cup of actual coffee, even in a Havana hotel. I didn't expect or want luxury at the camp, and I didn't get it. Canvas bunk beds, very early starts, communal showers and meals. These were no sweat and no problem for one who had survived English public school. Whereas, in contrast to my boarding school experience, the food was excellent and plentiful, and there were females with red scarves in their hair. I didn't especially like the way that uplifting music and hectoring speeches were played all the time on the camp's loudspeaker system, but I was much more alarmed when deciding on a hike one day to enjoy the surrounding scenery, I began to wave goodbye to the Cuban boys at the gate, and was ordered to hold it right there. Where did I think I was going? On a hike. Well, I was told, I couldn't. And why not? Because we say so. Now, I didn't speak much Spanish, and I didn't have a passport, it suddenly came back to me. And I would have had only a vague idea how to negotiate my way to a neighboring village, let alone to Havana. But the guards, as I now thought of them, pointed emphatically back up the trail to the camp. Once you have been told that you can't leave a place, its attractions may be many, but its charm will instantly be void. A cat may stay contentedly in one spot for hours at a time, but detain it in that spot by grasping its tail, and it will try to tear out its own tail by the roots. I wasn't free to move at all, and the Cubans who wanted to leave Cuba were only free, after a long process, to be expelled from their country of birth and never allowed to return. Naturally, this qualified my attitude to the camp itself, but then I had come with my fellow Trotskyists and Luxembourgists precisely to test the Cuban claim that this was a new revolution a brave departure from the grim grey pattern of Soviet socialism. Also, it had to be admitted, Cuba was helping the many rebel forces that were even then fighting so bravely on a Latin American continent that was dominated by cruel and backward military dictatorships. Factional arguments in the camp kept us joyously and passionately awake. Of course, we argued about everything, from the Spanish Civil War to the Paris Commune, but two critical questions were these. Had Che Guevara been right in proposing that moral incentives should replace material ones? And what line should be taken about the increasingly bitter split between the Russian and Czechoslovakian Communist parties? On the question of moral incentives and the idea of the new socialist man, I had nothing but doubts. At the close of his beautiful essay, Literature and Revolution, Trotsky had spoken lyrically of a future in which the average man will rise to the stature of an Aristotle, a Goethe, or a Marx in which his very physique would become more supple, muscular, and harmonious, and had closed by saying that beyond these hills, new peaks will rise. 
Myself, I could understand that political and economic conditions could make people very much worse, as in the case of Nazism, say. But I had too much English empirical schooling to believe that material circumstances on their own could make people all that much better. And surely, to be a materialist in the first place entailed the acceptance of mankind as a primate species. Karl Marx himself had admired and even hoped to emulate Charles Darwin. Anyway, here was my chance at witnessing a laboratory experiment. Was Cuba producing a more selfless and exemplary human type? I shan't easily forget the reply I received from a very sweet, if slightly slow-spoken, Communist Party official. Yes, he said. In fact, the new man is being evolved in the town of San Andres. As soon as I heard this, I demanded to visit this utopian commune, as did many of my comrades, but the trip to San Andres was always somehow being postponed while they ironed out the wrinkles in the new man, and one was forced to wonder why, in any case, it should only work in this particular isolated hamlet. As a consolation prize, perhaps, we were instead invited to see Fidel Castro speak in Santa Clara at a mass rally on the 26th of July, anniversary of the beginning of the revolution, in the very city that Che Guevara had personally wrested from the control of the old regime. Although Guevara's martyred cadaver had been displayed on televisions all around the world, looking more than slightly Christ-like in its defiant and bearded serenity, his actual resting place was, as with the Nazarene, indeed, unknown. He had in fact been secretly buried by the CIA under the tarmac of a Bolivian airstrip, and after having his hands amputated for fingerprinting purposes. But this grisly detail was not to be uncovered, or the whole reliquary returned to Havana until the 1990s. Thus the yell that Che Guevara no ha muerte, Che Guevara lives, had a sort of resonance, just as the innumerable images of his living visage possessed an iconic potency. The Cuban leadership declared 1968 to be the year of the heroic guerrilla, and issued a call to all the school children in the country that they should live their lives como el che, or in the manner of Guevara. It was the impossibility of following this directive that hit me first, even before the realization that the whole thing was borrowed from what Christians called the imitation of Christ. So there it was. Cuban socialism was too much like a boarding school in one way and too much like a church in another. Long lectures from the headmaster were another feature that the two setups had in common. That and a huge overemphasis on team games and competitive sports of every kind. I mustn't pretend that it was somewhat thrilling to have a front row seat and see the young Fidel Castro step up to the microphone and begin to stroke his beard in that way he once had. But after the first couple of hours and the first few standing ovations, I felt that I had begun to grasp the main points. Later, a couple of hours later, I was about to go and look for a cold beer. This commodity was actually easily come by and for free, and one cynic suggested to me that that's how so many of the audience had been recruited to the rally in the first place. What hit me even more in my midsection, though, was the astonishing availability of young hookers on the edge of the crowd. One of the claims of the Cuban Revolution was to have abolished prostitution, and though I had never personally believed this to be feasible, the withering away of the state being one thing, but the withering away of the penis quite another, the whore scene in Santa Clara was many times more lurid than anything to be imagined in a bourgeois society. The same thing went, by the way, for the regime's much more arrogant and nasty claim to have done away with that other bourgeois vice of homosexuality. In such working public laboratories as one could find, the slogan Libertad por los maricons, freedom for gays, was frequently chalked or scrawled to show that the Cuban gays were by no means willing to concur in their own abolition. As the macro address by the maximum leader showed signs of drawing to a close, the crowd began to disintegrate into its individual constituents of people hurrying home. The red scarf militants near the platform kept up a steady volley of cheers, but the masses were calling it a day. There was a distinct impression that more and better material incentives were what many workers and peasants would appreciate. I won't claim that I saw this all at once, and another part of me was still with the zealous Cubans who wanted to make sacrifices for Vietnam and Angola, and who didn't want a life of ease. These and other reflections inevitably raised the question, as we never tired of putting it, of Czechoslovakia. The Cuban leadership took no decided view on the increasingly public quarrel between Prague and Moscow. The Cuban Communist Party paper, Granma, later to be described by my Argentine anti-fascist friend Jacobo Timmerman 
as a degradation of the act of reading, was then printing the communiques from both communist capitals. This neutrality was not at all shared by the Cuban in the street, as I was to find out. Perhaps it had something to do with the natural bias in favour of a small country as against a superpower. Equally probably, as I was told, it had to do with the arrogant conduct of the many Russian advisers in Cuba. Certainly when you've had your European features greeted by little showers of pebble and dog shit and the taunt Sovietico from the street urchins of Havana, you've been granted a glimpse or a hint of that very useful thing, an unscripted public opinion. Moreover, the Czech crew of the charter plane that brought me to Cuba had issued an invitation. When we go back, they said, we stop in London to drop you off and we're not allowed to pick up any passengers. In other words, we fly on to Prague with an empty plane. If you care to stay on board, we can show you socialism with a human face for no extra charge. I had instantly signed on for this marvellous opportunity. Reporting to the Czechoslovak Airlines office in Havana to reconfirm my ticket, I found that the Czechs and Slovaks of the city had mounted their own demonstration on La Rampa, the city's main drag, and had been greeted by enthusiastic applause from average citizens on the sidewalk, another unfakeable test of popular emotion. Back in the camp, though, it seemed hard to imagine that party-mindedness would not emerge as the eventual victor. I can remember exactly how I came to realize this. Cuba was famous for its celebration of cinema and its lionization of its revolutionary directors like Tomás Gutiérrez Allaire, the great Teton, even if his best-known marquee title, Memories of Underdevelopment, was perhaps only rivaled in sheer balls-aching tedium of nomenclature by the Czechoslovak masterpiece, Closely Watched Trains. Almost every night we could sit on a hillside and watch dramatic movies projected onto a huge open-air screen. On one tense and humid evening I watched Ponte Corvo's Battle of Algiers, completely unaware, as were many first-time viewers, that the harsh, grainy sequences of street fighting were not taken from a documentary, and near intoxicated, despite my supposedly better ideological training, by the visceral sordid romance of the urban guerrilla. When it was over, I sat around, part hypnotized by the raw seduction of violence, until they showed it again. Several of the people I met in the Campamento Cinco de Mayo later showed up in the dock in Europe as members of the Angry Brigade, the Red Brigade, and kindred nihilist organizations. One of them I had known quite well. I attended his trial at the Old Bailey in the early 1970s, and as an early Angry Brigade communique, was read out by the prosecuting counsel, suddenly realized that it was almost word for word what I had heard young Kit actually saying under the palms of Pinar del Rio. At all events, to the camp one day, for a seminar on film and revolution, was brought the legendary Cuban director, Santiago Alvarez. I had seen some of his stuff and been more impressed by its pace and color than I should have been. I knew perfectly well that the hideous President Johnson had not ordered the murders of John Kennedy Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy, but in that frenzied year it was exciting to see a piece of throbbing filmic propaganda called LBJ, the letters standing for Luther, Bobby, and Jack, even though the order was weirdly wrong there, which blamed him for all three, and which additionally boasted a piercing soundtrack with the magnificent defiant wailings of Miriam Makiba, wife of the crazed but charismatic incendiary Stokely Carmichael. For all this lurid lapse into infantile pre-Oliver Stone leftism, old Alvarez then gave a reasonable enough talk, and so I put up my hand and asked him a question. How did he find it as an artist to be working in Cuba, a state that had official policies on the aesthetic? Alvarez had obviously expected something like this and replied that artistic and intellectual liberty was untrammeled. Were there, I inquired, no exceptions to this? Well, he said, almost laughing at the naivete of my question, it would not, of course, be possible or desirable to attempt any satires or attacks on the leader of the revolution himself. But otherwise, the freedom of conscience and creativity was absolute. I do not know if what I next said came from the left or right part of my brain, but I like to think I anticipated at least some of the huge cultural and literary defection that later cost Castro the allegiance of writers as diverse as Carlos Franqui, Heberto Padilla, Jorge Edwards, and many others. I made the mere observation that if the most salient figure in the state and society was immune from critical comment, then all the rest was detail. 
Ah, please never forget how useful the obvious can be, and how right it is that the image of the undraped emperor is such a keystone of our folklore. I don't think I've ever been so richly rewarded merely for saying the self-evident. There was quite an atmosphere until after Alvarez, whose reply, if any, I don't remember, had left. And then this atmosphere persisted while I took my metal tray and lined up in the dining hall. When I pretended to ask what was up, one of the Scottish comrades informed me, the Cuban brothers thought what you said and did was so obviously counter-revolutionary. I was both annoyed and delighted by this obloquy. I certainly considered myself a revolutionary, and would warmly have contested the right of anybody to deny me the title, but there was also the sheer pleasure of seeing cliché in action, almost as if one had been called an enemy of the people, or a capitalist hyena, or, back to school again, someone who had let the whole side down. You do not forget, even if you come from a free and humorous society, the first time that you are, with unsmiling seriousness, called a counter-revolutionary to your face. It cannot have been many mornings later when I was shaken awake and told, Get up, and get up now. The Russians have invaded Czechoslovakia. The person who was doing the shaking had bet me a trifling sum that this outcome would not occur. So it was nice of her to bring me the news of her own loss. I had already felt, in the course of the Annus Mirabilis of 1968, the sensation of being somehow involved in a historical moment or conjuncture. But at that instant in Cuba, I think I could have been forgiven the self-dramatization. For one thing, and merely because of the time zone, the terrible news from Eastern Europe came to us quite early in the morning. And, as I have said, the Castro leadership had as yet taken no public position on what was still an intercommunist quarrel. It was announced that Fidel would speak that night and give the line. I was quite sure that I knew what he was going to say, and indeed was frivolous enough to make a few more wages on the side. But meanwhile, one was in the almost unique position of being in a communist state, where for a whole day there was no official position on the most important item of international news. I was in Havana itself by then, because it was almost time to catch the charter plane home, or, in my case, to Prague. The Red Army's first action had been to seize and immobilize the main airports of Czechoslovakia, so our plane hadn't even been able to leave its base. I remember going to the campus of Havana University, where there were a surprising number of students willing to denounce the Russian action, without looking over their shoulders or lowering their voices. All dissent had to be couched in communist terms, so you heard it said that Che would never have supported such big power bullying. This I then half believed, but now doubt. The Chinese leadership in Beijing had lost no time in denouncing Soviet social imperialism, and there was a demonstration outside the Chinese embassy in support of this position, with people wearing little badges of Mao. I was told by somebody that if you went to call on the Chinese, they would ply you with cocktails and cigarettes while they explained their position. So I posed as an internationalist visitor and found the story to be true. The exquisite cigarettes, I remember, had the name Double Happiness. The politics weren't so sublime. A tiny diplomatic bureaucrat explained that China had been the first to call for Russian intervention in Hungary to stop counter-revolution in 1956, so had every right to denounce the latest move as counter-revolutionary in turn. The logic of this didn't seem exactly beautiful, and there was that unsettling term again. At lunchtime came the news that Ho Chi Minh and the Vietnamese communists had supported the Russians. This was enough to sway quite a number of Cubans. Then dusk began to draw in and the population mustered around the TV sets. I forget now where I watched the lengthy tirade in which Fidel Castro ended all utopian babble about Cuba following a different course from the sclerotic Stalinists in the Kremlin, but I think it was in the same pink facaded Hotel Nacional where Graham Greene's sadistic Captain Segura once received a cold blast of soda water in the face and shouted, Cogno, before he could stop himself. As the speech of the bearded one wore on, the faces of some of my comrades began to take on a startled and upset cold shower look as well. And by the end of it, as the routine standing ovation of the Central Committee was being shown, the argument in our ranks was already underway. Apart from those few who stubbornly thought that Castro had done and said the right thing by taking the Brezhnev line, the main division was between those who thought he'd acted under duress and those who felt he was expressing his real ideological kinship. 
I thought it could well be both. It was obvious that Cuban communism depended upon Soviet oil and weapons to survive. But even had this not been so, Castro in his speech had been frigidly unsympathetic to the desire of the Czechoslovaks to live a life that was more open to the market economy, more attuned to the culture of the United States, and more adapted to the open societies of Eastern Europe. Once more making the stern attempt to be dialectical about this, I think I concluded without actually admitting it to myself that Castroism might still have a point in Latin America and the Caribbean, where monstrously reactionary dictatorships like those of Brazil and Nicaragua and Haiti were still undergirded by cynical American power. However, in more advanced Europe, the impulses of a revolutionary left could and should be used to erode the Berlin Wall from both sides. There were a number of brave Trotskyists among the Czech resistance, after all, led by the heroic Peter Uhl. Anyway, I do not completely hate myself for attempting this book balancing. And I can say with some pride that our small international socialist contingent in Havana managed to receive a rolled-up tube of a special edition of Socialist Worker from London by way of the mail, and that this edition was headed in big, bold, black capitals, Russians get out of Czechoslovakia. To have handed this out in Cuba during a world crisis was for me a matter of socialist honor and gave me an irrepressible sense of participating in a genuinely historic moment. It seemed so clear that the ossified, torpid communist systems and parties had committed a kind of political and moral suicide by their panzer communismus, Ernst Fischer's acid phrase, conduct in Prague, yet this seemed to offer a chance that in France, in Poland and Czechoslovakia, and in the yet-to-be-liberated territories of the Third World, the brave Soissons Huitard were clearing the way for a real and authentic left to emerge at last. The long-delayed Czech charter flight almost failed to clear the palm trees at the fringe of Havana Airport, something to do with a wrong guess about the weight of the luggage, but the expressions of the crew conveyed a generally listless attitude. They were returning to a country where the state-decreed slogan was that of post-invasion normalization, one of the most casually ugly phrases of the whole 20th century. Once again, we had a stopover in Canada, and on the TV screens saw the Chicago police beating puddles of blood out of the demonstrators who were willing to pit themselves against a filthy war, a racist Democratic Party machine, and a fixed convention. Damn it, I remember thinking. I have missed Prague, and now I'm missing Chicago. Tourist of the Revolution was a phrase that was later used to ridicule those who went in search of socialist fatherlands. But I truly did not think of myself as a tourist. I simply and exhaustingly and fervently wished I could be in many places at once, so as to lean the uttermost of my slight weight onto the fulcrum. It was years later that I read Thomas Paine saying that to have played a part in two revolutions was to have lived to some purpose. This was the sort of eloquence that I wish I could have commanded at the time. However, I was still somewhat imprisoned within the jargon of left sectarianism. By the time our plane had landed in London with the Czechs continuing morosely homeward, and I myself being subjected to yet another police scrutiny of my passport and my person, the new post-Chicago headline of Socialist Worker read like this, East and West, tanks and cops defend freedom. To a point, I approved this moral equivalence. It was, at any rate, better than those who only moaned painlessly about Prague, which the West had not defended, or those who were moved only to protest about Vietnam. The verbal crudeness of the headline's phrasing bothered me less than it should have done. After all, as our plane had neared London, we had been told that one of our number might possibly be detained and even deported upon arrival. He was a South African exile. Nothing more needed to be said. We all knew that we would form a cluster around him, pile our luggage into the shape of a barricade, raise our fists and utter the most obvious chance of resistance until we could be sure that a proper left-wing lawyer had arrived. The risk of our own detention or blacklisting would have been nothing more than the payment of a duty. Had you then accused me of being sloganistic in my politics, I would have considered it no great insult. As 1968 began to ebb into 1969, however, and as anticlimax began to become a real word in my lexicon, another term began to obtrude itself. People began to intone the words, the personal is political. At the instant I first heard this deadly expression, I knew as one does from the utterance of any sinister bullshit that it was, cliché is arguably forgivable here, 
very bad news. From now on, it would be enough to be a member of a sex or gender or epidermal subdivision or even erotic preference to qualify as a revolutionary. In order to begin a speech or to ask a question from the floor, all that would be necessary by way of preface would be the words speaking as a, then could follow any self-loving description. I will have to say this much for the old hard left. We earned our claim to speak and intervene by right of experience and sacrifice and work. It would never have done for any of us to stand up and say that our sex or sexuality or pigmentation or disability were qualifications in themselves. There are many ways of dating the moment when the left lost, or I would prefer to say discarded, its moral advantage, but this was the first time that I was to see the sellout conducted so cheaply. Back in Oxford, I ran into the warden in the high street. He was very much his usual self, bustling and brimming and half-deferential, half-ironic. My dear Christopher, just the man I wanted to tell. We have a new fellow coming to the college, a new recruit, as you probably say, but a hero, absolute hero. Bit of a Marxist, I'm afraid, but it can't be helped. You must meet him. This was my introduction to Leszek Kolakowski, who was then not much known outside his native Poland. He had been one of the reformed communist intellectuals of the Polish Spring of 1956, a moment that had inaugurated a period of relative openness under the Gomułka regime. The reactionary and anti-Jewish crackdown of 1968, presaged by the arrest and imprisonment of Kuron and Modulewski, had put all this into reverse. Kolakowski had, like so many of the intellectual leadership of Eastern Europe, been partly deported and partly self-exiled. He had at first gone to teach philosophy at the University of California at Berkeley, a campus whose name was near sacred to those of us who felt we were breathing the pure air of the 60s, but had evidently tired of this already and was willing to come to all souls. While at Berkeley, he'd been handed a pamphlet that spoke of the contents of the university's library system as so much useless white knowledge. This had somewhat put him off the new left in its then Bay Area form, where I assure you it can still be met with. Kolakowski had missed his formal education because of the Nazi occupation of his country, but had more than made up for it by the hungry ingestion of books during the wartime underground years, during which time he had also become a consecrated communist. When we eventually met, I was first of all and perhaps rather foolishly impressed by how exactly he looked his part. Victor Laszlo in Casablanca simply seems too sleek and well-fed to have been a survivor of Nazi penal institutions. I still shudder when I think how nearly Ronald Reagan came to being cast as Rick in that movie. But Lejek had the ideally gaunt, austere appearance of the dissident, who has known what it is to suffer material as well as intellectual deprivation. I was later to find that as a youth he had contracted tuberculosis of the bones. His voice and manner also were appropriately ironic and sardonic, and he had, in effect, seen all the way through communism. In my boyish way I thought I had done the same, but, and I cannot tell you how much this argument used to matter, I would not concede that Leninism and Stalinism were the same thing, or that the second logically followed from the first. After much wrestling and juggling, Kolakowski had simply given up on the whole idea of reform communism, or was at any rate in the throes of doing so. I did not believe that Stalin's system could be reformed, but I was quite convinced that it could and would only be overturned by and from the left. Kolakowski was quite patient with me. At the time, and how embarrassing I now find it to say this, I thought that it was I who was being quite indulgent to him. The Polish ambassador to London a doltish apparatchik named Marian Dobroszewski, was invited to Oxford to give a talk, with the help of some Polish leftist friends, to act as translators for the Polish press on file at St. Anthony's College. I managed to draft and print a leaflet in Polish and English, telling the Stalinist envoy that he was not welcome. I asked Kolokowski if he'd come to the event and help to swell our protest. He declined saying rather dryly that there was little point in such commonplace encounters. We went ahead anyway and gave Ambassador Dobroszewski quite a bad time, and just as the evening was breaking up I saw a bony and quizzical visage peering from a dark corner at the very back of the hall. Lejek had not, after all, been able to assist showing up. At the time I thought that this was a small triumph for Trotskyism over mere anti-communism. In fact, 
Kolakowski was just beginning to erect the edifice of his astonishing trilogy, Main Currents of Marxism. I was fabulously lucky in having met him so early, but much too callow and overconfident to take full advantage of the chance I'd been given. Still, for almost the next two decades of my life, I carried on an argument with him and others like him about the nature of communism. Yes, the germ of Stalinism had been in Leninism to begin with, but had there not been other germs as well? And what historical conditions led to the dominance of which germs? I suppose I still hope to show that not everything about this debate was a complete waste of time. The remainder of my golden Oxford years slid by in this way, and though I was very oppressed at the time by a sense of waste, what my fellow Balliol man, Anthony Pohl, had called the crushing melancholy of the undergraduate condition, I do not believe that they were entirely squandered either. Let us say, one quarter of the time allotted to political confrontations and dramas, another devoted to reading books on any subject except the ones I was supposed to be studying, another quarter on seeking out intellectual heavyweights who commanded artillery superior to my own, with the residual 25% being consumed by the polymorphous perverse. It could have been worse. I made a minor discovery, which has been useful to me since in the analysis of some larger public figures like my contemporary Bill Clinton. If you can give a decent speech in public or cut any kind of figure on the podium, then you need never dine or sleep alone. I was actually a bit more confident on the platform than I was in the sack, and I can remember losing my virginity, a bit later than most of my peers, I suspect, with a girl who, inviting me to tea at one of the then segregated female colleges, allowed me to notice that her walls were covered with photographs taken of me by an unseen cameraman who'd followed my public career. Since apparently I could do no wrong with this young lady, there came also a day when the undergraduate weekly Charwell asked me if I would like to help write the John Evelyn gossip column. This was a prestige spot, disapproved of by some of my grimmer and less hedonistic comrades, but a perfect finesse of that problem offered itself at once. I was to be co-author of the column with Patrick Coburn, whose father Claude, a red veteran of the Spanish Civil War, had been one of the great guerrilla journalists of all time, had been, in the London offices of the great satirical magazine Private Eye, he still was a figure of immense authority. His oldest son Alexander had left Oxford to become one of the editors of the New Left Review, and his middle son, Andrew, an arrestingly handsome boy with a look reminiscent of the young T.S. Eliot, was another of my contemporaries. Anybody who knows anything about the later history of radical journalism will recognize these names, as they will that of the great documentary maker Christo Hurd, who became the third member of our John Evelyn team and helped us transform it from a mere chronicle of idle and gilded youth into something more mordant and investigative and swiftian, or so we like to think. Once again, that lure of printer's ink and the word pamphleteer. I had better confess before quitting this to a having-it-both-ways moment that gave me, even at the time, a twinge of remorse. When Richard Nixon and Henry Kissinger circumvented Congress and the Constitution and the strategic majority of Nixon's own cabinet in 1970 in order to conduct the invasion of Cambodia, I had already been invited to debate with the then Foreign Secretary Michael Stewart at the Oxford Union on the morality of the war in Indochina. The obscene images of the conflict as they were extended to yet another country, were so enraging that I banished all thoughts of scruple. I accepted the formal invitation to take part in the debate and to attend the dinner beforehand with the Foreign Secretary. Meanwhile, I intrigued with friends to make sure that there was a large clique of hardcore protesters stationed in the main hall and in the gallery. I made my speech from the dispatch box in the approved manner. It wasn't one of my best, but it made a fairly fierce and detailed case against the imperial incursion and then loudly insulted the government's guest of honour, deserted the other guests, and went to sit with and shout with the mob. At a given signal when Stuart rose to speak, the phalanx also rose and simply and repetitively yelled the one word murderer in his face. It was horribly gratifying to see the way in which such a leading member of Her Majesty's government turned so pale under the assault. At another signal, a noose was uncurled from the gallery and fell dangling within inches of the wretched Foreign Secretary's head. It was dropped by James Long, later to be a distinguished economics editor at the BBC. Nobody had ever attempted to abort a debate in these precincts before, 
and so the pitifully weak staff of the building was at a loss. We could have done almost anything we wanted, including at least roughing up, if not lynching, the Foreign Secretary. A sudden consciousness of exactly this ability, both intoxicating and nauseating, is probably what stalled us. We contented ourselves with further deafening insults and marched away. The official minute book of our little parliament still records that, for the first time in the 147 years of the Society's existence, the House voted to stand adjourned sine die on account of riot. The publicity was astounding. An editorial in the Times opined that our movement of protest was one of the nastiest political phenomena that Britain has experienced in this century, which I thought, when one considered only a few of the other phenomena, was plainly absurd. We had, in our own opinion, not silenced Mr. Stewart, whose views were well known and could easily be broadcast, so much as we had voiced the outrage that should properly be felt at the destruction of Cambodian society. I remember arguing with dexterous casuistry that we had compelled the establishment press to take notice and had thus, in a way, actually succeeded in enlarging the area of free speech. A nice try, I hope you will admit. But however one phrased the case, the only reason for mentioning free speech in the first place was that, however one looked at it, we had in fact shut down a public debate by force. I had a huge quarrel about it with Jack Straw, then the head of the National Union of Students and a strong opponent of the Vietnam War, who insisted that the right of free expression trumped all other considerations. It was years before we agreed on anything again, and by that time he was himself the Foreign Secretary for Tony Blair, and arguing at the United Nations for the removal of the intolerable Saddam Hussein tyranny from Iraq. I remember how we arrived at a higher synthesis, a final justification for our breach of the rules of civility, debate, and hospitality. After all, we had, did we not, a higher cause and a nobler purpose. It was even possible, given the huge media fuss generated by our action, that the people of Indochina would get to hear of it, and as a result take additional heart from the knowledge of our solidarity. As I write this, I realize that I then truly did believe it. After a mighty demonstration outside the American Embassy in Grosvenor Square, Michael Rosen had written a haunting poem published in the university's literary magazine Isis that hymned a then-famous poster of a Vietnamese woman in a paddy field with a gun slung over her shoulder. Please let it be, the poem had urged, that some of the news and pictures of our revolt will reach you and put a smile on your face. Next to this imperative, we felt, all lesser reservations were merely pallid and insipid. So, quite hardened as I was to insisting on this point against those who were more tentative, why was it that I could not quite repress the sense of having done something shabby? I have something to expiate, as D. H. Lawrence put it in his poem Snake. A pettiness. The Fenton Factor The friends thou hast and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. Hamlet, Act One, Scene Three. Of course, I knew about Fenton too when I took that first cocktail off him in the public bar of the King's Arms. He had already demonstrated extreme precocity in winning the Newdigate Poetry Prize for a sonnet sequence entitled Our Western Furniture, about Commodore Perry's historic opening of the Closed Island Society of Japan. It had a beauty and ominousness to it, which I shall try to catch by this brief extract. I saw the salmon flash caught in the net. It was the only light. It flicked the spray. An energy to spawn and procreate. The sudden poet's cry, its silver-gray, dagger-blade flash. A protest yet. I saw the ships in Nagasaki Bay. On the cover of the first published version was a paragraph from Commodore Perry's report to Congress in 1856, just one year before India rose in rebellion against the East India Company. It seems to me, opined the gallant Commodore, that the people of America will, in some form or another, extend their dominion and their power until they shall have placed the Saxon race upon the eastern shores of Asia. I think, too, that eastward and southward will her great rival in future aggrandizement, Russia, stretch forth her power to the coasts of China and Siam, and thus the Saxon and the Cossack will meet. Will it be in friendship, 
I fear not the antagonistic exponents of freedom and absolutism must thus meet at last, and then will be fought the mighty battle on which the world will look with breathless interest, for on its issue the freedom or the slavery of the world will depend. This seemed quite redolent of the huge drama then playing itself out in Indochina, a comparison to which James himself drew attention, but it came at the subject in a very different and much less propagandistic way than I had been doing. I take down my first edition of this poem, very finely bound by the Sycamore Press, a hand-set type operation, run out of the garage of the poet and tutor of Magdalen College, John Fuller. To Christopher Hitchens, from James Fenton, with much love, it says on the flyleaf, the inscription dated November 1969. When James's first collection of published poems, Terminal Moraine, came out in 1972, I have just noticed, to my irritation, it was inscribed to Chris, from the author, with lots of love. I hadn't before registered this qualitative degeneration. What I had noticed at the time was an observation by the great Roy Fuller, honoured laureate of the 1930s and father of John, at a party at the latter's house in Benson Place. You're a friend of young Fenton's, then, he said gruffly. I allowed as much. I rather think that he writes as well now, if not better, than Whiston did at his age. I knew this would please James, who had first been introduced to Auden and Coleman through some mutual friends in Florence, but I also knew it wouldn't go to his head. Ah, that head. Redmond O'Hanlon was later to compare it to an owl's egg. It certainly did have the most domed and sapient appearance, and, under the arc and curve of that skull, lay an extraordinary variety of elements and materials. The first of these was a sort of direct line to the tradition of English poetry. The second was a talent for burlesque and parody, often manifested with an almost manic glee. And the third was a buried seriousness that, as with his mentor, Auden, derived from a sort of post-Christianity, based on a form of English Protestantism. He also, broke as he was, and as we all were, invariably had the price of a drink or a smoke about his person, and I am glad that I loved and love him so, because it was he who awakened my thus far buried and dangerous lust for alcohol and nicotine. Friends, somebody said, are God's apology for relations. I was one of those who tended to think of friends at school as comrades or acquaintances or co-conspirators or cronies or sex partners, or an occasional salad of all four. Monastic school and college traditions, I will plead, made this less freakish and grotesque than it may now look on the page. I did have a friend, Michael Prest, my former rescuer from bullying and the only man I still knew from school. And I had a comrade, James Pettifer, who was a playwright and polymath and internationalist. It was so that we could all three find a fourth person to share the expenses of a house in the wastes of Cowley Road, that we were meeting Fenton in that pub. All of us, I'm sure, would still date our future moments from the one in which this encounter occurred. It isn't a matter of looking back and thinking this was when I met the finest English poet of his generation. I already knew, or at any rate believed, that he was the finest poet of his generation writing in English. The pressing question was, could he be induced to write a few stanzas that would be of immediate help to the cause of the Socialist Revolution? I knew that Auden had been inconvenienced by similar demands, but I also believed that I was more persuasive and subtle, and less dogmatic than those who had tried to induce him, too, into composing lines that could be employed as weaponry. James was absolutely ready to do anything he could in order to help the struggling people of Indochina. Indeed, in a quieter way, he was much more decided upon this than I was. But he thought there were other things in life as well. He liked long walks, and he loved the ancient buildings and antique trees and botany of Oxford. He liked to talk about Italy and Greece and all matters classical. He had a huge talent for rude songs and crude puns, rescued from vulgarity by a sort of innocence. He was tremendously impressed, as well as a bit put off, by the extreme seriousness of George Steiner, who had just published his imposing collection of essays, Language and Silence. In rather the same way as I had felt a bit overawed by Isaiah Berlin, James was unable to forget the embarrassment of an undergraduate dinner with Steiner, 
in which he'd overdone his own insouciance and had too languidly said that there were no great unifying causes left any more, no grand subject of the sort that had sent Auden to Spain or China. Steiner had snapped at this Fentonian display of the blasé and told him to take a hard look at what seemed to be happening in Vietnam. And this had certainly worked with James, who was swift on the uptake and who cringed to remember how smug he must have sounded. However, before this full confession could be registered, there was some other business to be done, as we tramped across Magdalen Bridge. The polishing of the rude songs. I am the king of China, and I like a tight vagina. It lets me show the things I know, like the prose style of George Steiner. James's King of China series, which had to follow the scheme laid out above, where the first line could not be changed at all, and the subsequent lines should be obscene, and if possible, failing in the above case, mildly homosexual, was obviously a minor key achievement for the times. However, I would defend it very strongly, and believe it has its place in the history of Auden-inspired, minor but useful, obscenity. The model verse ran like this, and all others had to observe the rules. I am the king of China, and my court is crammed with sages, but when I want a bit of bum, I ring around my yellow pages. I cannot be sure if the Sycamore Press's very limited and hand-printed and elegant edition of this collection of trivia yet survives, but if so, there's a sporting chance that my own contribution is still in print. I am the King of China, I'm a patron of the prize ring, and every time my man's on top, you can feel my boxer rising. I already knew, in principle, that word games, like limericks and acrostics and acronyms and crosswords, are good training in and of themselves. I could not then guess at the harvest of such marvels that lay ahead, but I did dimly appreciate that the Fenton factor was having the effect of making me somewhat less rigidly disapproving. In his copy of Steiner's Language and Silence, though, I found a thumbed-over dog-eared page that fell open at an essay entitled Trotsky and the Tragic Imagination and realized that my new chum had suggested to me a possible relationship, which was that of politics to literature, but this time beginning at the literary end, and not at the ideological one. James was a son of the church. His father was a leading Anglican divine, the principal of a theological training college in Durham, and author of a standard commentary on the Gospel of Luke. James's mother had died suddenly while he was at public school, Repton, and Canon Fenton had remarried in a reverse Murdstonish kind of way, a woman who could not bear to be reminded of his former life or former wife. This had led to an estrangement from the children, James had an older brother and younger sister, and to their being brought up by a pair of maiden aunts in Wales. This outwardly unlucky experience had made him rather a genius at handling personal relations and improvising surrogate families. The two aunts, for example, were named Eileen and Noel, Rather than have to call them either thing or to have to address them as aunt, James hit on the idea of naming them E and N, which worked brilliantly. In later years, E went back to her pre-war work as a teacher in Jerusalem and helped out at the Anglican school at St. George's Cathedral, where Edward Said had been a pupil. It used to satisfy me greatly when returning correspondents would tell me that they had run into Aunt E at the American Colony Hotel. Having a drink with her there myself one day, I heard her say wistfully that she wished she could have been called to the priesthood instead of being limited to being a glorified missionary. On principle, I could not care less who took holy orders or who did not, but it did hit me with terrific force what a wonderful minister she would have made. This talent of James's for hitting it off with people was immediately evident when we all moved into our digs. There were, in theory, four rooms, but one of them gave directly onto the kitchen, and it was obvious that whoever slept there would be effectively living in a corridor and at the mercy of the requirements of everyone else. "'I'll take that one,' said James at once, as if he'd preemptively bagged the best quarters for himself. I remember thinking that there was a sort of quasi-Christianity in this cheerful self-sacrifice, a thought that James would often give me cause to have again. It was additionally decent of him in that he was the only one of us who didn't at the time have a female companion. Incidentally, Pettifer's girlfriend and wife-to-be was called Sue Cumley. Michael Prest's was named Liz Horn. Mine was named Teresa Sweet. 
Later, James was to have a walkout with a Valkyrie lookalike named Elizabeth Whip, and it was he who first noticed, when we were all together, that the firm of Comley, Horn, Whip, and Sweet would make quite a sensational brothel management team. Apart from renewing the interest in poetry that I'd been in danger of letting lapse because of my political obsessions, and apart from getting me to smoke the deadly brand of Players Number no. 6, the tokens of which he collected in the hope, perhaps, of one day buying a gramophone or an electric kettle, as well as to imbibe teachers' scotch whisky, Fenton changed my life in two other ways. We were walking along Turl Street one day when he stopped to speak to a small, slightly pouting, yet rather stern-looking young blonde man, who had on his arm an even more blonde girl. The girl I slightly knew. Her name was Alexandra Wells, known throughout the university as the enticing Gully, and she was the stepdaughter of Sir A.J. Ayer, also known as Freddy, whose book Language, Truth and Logic had brought the work of the Viennese philosophers to England. A tireless and justly celebrated fornicator, Freddy was the patron of our labour club and one of the few senior academics who could be counted on to sign petitions from the insurgent left. He's brilliantly caricatured as Sir Roy van der Veen in Kingsley Amos's neglected masterpiece novel, Girl Twenty. I chatted to Gully, for whom I harboured a keen secret desire. She was later to say to me, on the sole occasion when I've heard the words used literally, not if you were the last man on earth. This declaration on her part was all the more striking for being preemptive, in view of the fact that I had never even dared to proposition her, and who was the only young woman on campus who had dared to try the latest fashion for wearing hot pants. James briefly made the introduction to her escort, whose hand I no less briefly took. As we passed on, I asked, Did he say his name was Amos? Yes, came the response. He's called Martin Amos. I inquired slightly indifferently, if he was any relation to the famous comic novelist who had notoriously signed a letter to the Times, along with Simon Raven and Robert Conquest and others, supporting the American war on Vietnam. It sometimes makes me whistle to think about this near miss. Martin had been born in the same year as Fenton and myself, but had arrived in Oxford a year later because of various disasters, later hilariously narrated in his memoir, Experience involving his poor schooling, his chaotic family, and his smoke-wreathed experiments with voyages of the imagination. So he was a year below me, and this is why he was lurking in the Turl, a member of Exeter College, alma mater of Richard Burton and Tariq Ali, as it may have been, this college was thought even by non-snobs to be a bit on the minor side, more for the boat club than the cognoscenti. Who knows how many blunders I might have made with Martin if we had chosen that, as our moment of first acquaintance. At the very least, I would probably have felt compelled to say something disobliging about Kingsley, and that might have been all that it took to cause a lifetime estrangement. At any rate, the danger passed, and I was safely out of the university, having almost failed to get a degree of any kind, when Martin stepped forward to get the best first in English of his year. Then one day, I can be sure it was in the fall of 1969, Fenton proposed a day off and a day out. The adventurous plan was to board the train to London, take a taxi to Chancery Lane, have a decent lunch with some interesting people, and then see what opportunities presented themselves for the evening. I was agog, but apprehensive. How, first of all, was this to be financed? James assured me that if I was willing to do a little carrying, all would be well. My role as bearer involved the toting of a big bag of books. Once arrived at Paddington Station, we indulged in the luxury of a cab, which let us off at a bookshop named Gaston's on Chancery Lane between Hoburn and Fleet Street. There, and with a practised air, James traded the books for crisp currency notes. While still an undergraduate, he had already become a reviewer for London papers and had learned a cardinal principle of the reviewer's trade, which was that Gaston's would give 50% of the cover price of a new volume, always assuming it to be in good condition. I was lost in wonder, both at the sophistication of this and at the largesse. I had never seen or smelled Fleet Street or Bloomsbury before, and these totemic names took on life and shape as the luxurious day drew on and became a misty autumnal one. Lunch was with Anthony Thwaite, in a wine bar with sawdust on the floor and to my fanciful thought, 
Dickensian and Johnsonian elements in its atmosphere. Thwaite, a diminutive figure with a big thatch of hair, was a poet who had formed part of the movement that comprised such elevated names as Philip Larkin and Robert Conquest. He was also the literary editor of The New Statesman, which at that time was certainly the most celebrated of London's intellectual weeklies. I considered myself to be miles to the left of it, of course, but still in awe of the review on which I'd cut my teeth as a schoolboy, and on whose stairway one might have met Bertrand Russell, say, or George Bernard Shaw. In one room was an old hat stand, draped with an ancient raincoat, said to have belonged to H.G. Wells. The law had it that if you donned this totemic Macintosh and ventured out in it, you would make a conquest of the very first woman you met. To be invited back to this famous office in Great Turnstile after lunch, and to climb that stairway to Thwaites Erie, was an uncovenanted bonus. To exit the building onto Lincoln's Inn Fields, clutching a couple of review copies of my own, we might like you to take a look at these for us. Surely there'd been a misunderstanding was to feel that one had drunk far more at that lunch than one actually had. I can't be sure where we dined or where we slept that night, but I do remember taking James, by way of return, as it were, to the Curzon Cinema to see Costa Gavras's film Z. The effect of it on both of us was electric. I was trying to recruit James to the International Socialists at the time, and so when he murmured something about how eye-opening a movie it was, I readily and militantly challenged him with a what-are-you-doing-about-it that was, when I think about it, a slightly poor return for the marvellous day he had shown me. Quite taking me at my own face value, however, something that always makes me uneasy, he replied evenly enough, oh, I am going to do something about it. By the end of that year, I had been published in The New Statesman with my review of Eric Hobsbawm's book on labour militancy in the Victorian epoch. Hitchens in The New Statesman? Hitchens on Eric Hobsbawm? Who is this callow youth? I can still hear these questions. And had been invited to the Christmas cocktail party given in the magazine's boardroom, where the cartoons and caricatures of Bloomsbury were on the very walls. There, I mentally bid farewell to Oxford and to the provinces in general. If ever anyone was hooked, it was me. The network of streets and lanes and squares, roughly between Blackfriars Bridge and Ludgate Circus, and Theobald's Road and Covent Garden, had me in thrall. So they do still, in their way. This was the district that stretched from the Marx Memorial Library on Clerkenwell Green to the British Museum reading room where the old boy had done his best work. Extending itself a bit to the north and colonising Charlotte Street up to Fitzroy Square, it became the area where Anthony Pohl had located some of his more louche scenes of pre- and post-war literary interpenetration. Looping around on itself and doubling back for our Shaftesbury Avenue, the neighbourhood might be said to take in Soho, with its little grid of streets and alleys, containing the offices of Private Eye and New Left Review, and then Gerrard Street, now Chinatown, in which Dr. Johnson's club of Burke, Gibbon, Reynolds and Garrick had met, and near the corner of which I was later to take my last glimpse of my mother. In these and other purlieus was manufactured the journalistic small arms ammunition that was to be hurled against the gigantic, but inaccurate and poorly commanded, batteries of Fleet Street's Tory newspaper establishment, located further east as a sort of bulwark to the City of London. The problem, as usual, was how to be able to play a decent hand on both sides of this street. Peter de Vries, one of my favourite minor novelists, he could make you laugh out loud, as in Mackerel Plaza, as well as weep, as with Blood of the Lamb, was once asked to name his ambitions as a writer. He replied that he wanted a mass audience for his books, one that would be large enough for his more elite audience to look down upon. I suspect that many authors, if they were honest, would admit to something like the same. My desire at that stage was to make a sufficient living at the business of Grub Street hackery, a refreshing term that the English use for the scribbling trade, so as to be able to toil more nobly in the evenings and weekends, both on my literary efforts and on my alliance with the working class. I wasn't by any means the first person to have thought of this scheme, nor to have run into some of its more immediate obstacles. In order to get a job in the media in those days, you had to be a member of a labour union. I thought that was fair enough, and indeed favoured the closed shop, and was anxious to join a union, if only so that I could start agitating as a union member. 
But then there was the difficulty that I couldn't join such a union unless I already had a job. This was a bar to entry, itself based on a double standard, that made one unashamed to play things both ways in one's own turn. One had somehow to get from being the second most famous person at Oxford to being a completely obscure but perhaps promising person in the metropolis. Once again, it was a lunch at all souls that supplied the answer. The London Times was starting a new supplement to be devoted to higher education. It needed a newly created staff, which in turn meant that a job could be awarded without a union ticket being required as a precondition. Thus did I become a social science correspondent on a paper that had yet to be printed, a Gogol-like ghost job, which I held for about six months before its editor said something to me that made it impossible to go on working for him. You're fired, were the exact words as I remember them. I sometimes wonder what might have become of me if I'd been good enough at that job to keep it. The paper could well have become my winding sheet. Still, I had at least managed to move myself to London, and I had become a member of the Journalists' Union. I had also managed to negotiate the slight but unmistakable political invigilation that used to be part of the scenery in those days. When applying for a trainee job at the BBC, I'd been asked by one member of the interviewing panel, Do you feel strongly about things? Strongly enough to... For example, sit down in Trafalgar Square? I wasn't stupid enough not to realise that he wouldn't have asked that question if he didn't already know the answer to it. I didn't get the job either, another defeat for which I am eternally grateful. And this now makes me old enough to remember a time when the BBC tried to exclude subversive and resentful types. A later interview for that Times job was more typical of British establishment reserve and understatement at its deadliest. Just a formality. Won't take a second. Need to ask you a few things before we have you on the strength. The interlocutor was a Mr. Grant, a slightly red-faced and portly chap with no special title. This was in the days when the offices of the Times were in the magnificently named Printing House Square, just opposite the old Blackfriars Station, where on the portico were still incised the names of ancient steam railway destinations like Darmstadt and St. Petersburg. It was redolent of the time when the young Graham Greene had been a sub-editor down the corridor. Mr. Grant asked me a few questions of such apparent innocuousness that I became suitably lulled. Then, interested in politics at all? I decided there could only be one answer to that. Good, good. Would you describe yourself as having any special affiliation? Again on the assumption that he knew the answer, as well as on the conviction that it would be shameful to conceal my stance, I replied, I'm a socialist. Fine, fine, my dear boy, don't look so defensive. More socialists on the Times than you'd probably guess. Some of our best people, too. I was just relaxing when he leaned forward slightly and asked, looking me directly in the eye, By the way, would the Labour Party allow you to join it? This, as he must have known, was the very question that I might have hoped to avoid. I was in the Labour movement, all right, but not at all of it. Let us go, then, you and I, to a meeting in a rather dingy and poorly lit union hall in Haringey, North London. The time, the mid-1970s. The place, a run-down but resilient district, with a high level of Irish and other immigrant population. I am the invited speaker, and the subject is Cyprus, the former British colony in the Mediterranean, which has recently been attacked and invaded by both Greek and Turkish NATO armies. Many refugees from this cruel bombardment and occupation have arrived in London to join the staunchly working-class and left-wing Cypriot community that's been here since the 1930s. My articles on the ongoing imperial crime have won me a certain audience. The brothers and sisters in Haringey aren't easily impressed by visiting talent, and it's unlikely that I'll even get the taciturn treasurer of the local branch to refund my tube fare from downtown. But I am used to this no-nonsense style and have even trained myself to approve of it. Before being exposed to my scintillating rhetoric, the audience will be subjected to a steady series of quotidian preliminaries. There will be an appeal for the strike fund at a neighbouring engineering factory, whose workforce has been out on the picket line for over a month. There will be an announcement about a regional meeting to discuss resolutions for the forthcoming annual Labour Party conference, scheduled for a distant and dismal seaside resort sometime in the fall. The lady who helps run social services for needy immigrants will make an appeal, couched in that amazing warmth in which some labour matriarchs specialise, 
urging Cypriots, who generally prize family values above all else and are leery of charity, to claim their entitlements as Commonwealth citizens. It is stressed that no distinction is to be made between Greek and Turkish Cypriots, none of whom have ever raised so much as a voice or a hand to each other in this old and fraternal borough. A veteran of the bus drivers union gets to his feet to make a sturdy ringing call for British workers to take their holidays in democratic and struggling Cyprus, instead of on the so-called touristic Costa Brava, that is part of the disgrace that is, still, after all those years, and in spite of all our efforts, General Franco's Spain. These are people who shun the gaudy display of supermarkets and spend their hard-earned wages at the co-op, with which many of them also bank their small savings. It's all gone now, or gone to pieces, but this was what we used to call the labor movement. Sometimes in elevated May Day rhetoric it was Tigmu, this great movement of ours, and sometimes it was Timor, the movement as a whole. But even as we mocked this stock speech, we felt a fierce pride at belonging to the ranks that it described. Men and women, warriors for the working day, who had survived mass unemployment and slum housing and bitter exploitation, stuck together to resist fascism at home and abroad, rebuilt the country after 1945, fought for independence for the colonies, and striven to remove the terrible fear of illness and penury and a Dickensian old age that had hag-ridden the British working class. In 1939, when it had once again become necessary to summon those workers back to the colours and the flag and the defence of the nation, mainly in consequence of the abysmal, shameful capitulations of the ruling class in the face of Nazism, the recruiting officers had been appalled at the human material that was presented to them. Men with crumbled teeth, failing eyesight, wheezing pigeon-like chests, bow-legged and balding, exhibiting symptoms of deficiency diseases like rickets and pellagra that would have shocked some of Britain's Indian and African subjects. As a child born after the war and in the first years of the National Health Service, itself always semi-reverently capitalized by the people as the NHS, I was a beneficiary of all this, despite my father's Toryism. Free black currant juice for vitamin C, making me pee purple, was available at school, as was free milk from which I first made the nauseating discovery of what's now called lactose intolerance. A district nurse called as a matter of course on any household that had registered the birth of a new baby. If I developed a squint or a toothache, my parents need not fear bankruptcy, but could take me to be fitted with spectacles or healed with a filling. The resulting work is not beautiful. I winced with recognition when I first read the expression British teeth in Gore Vidal's Judgment of Paris, but it is nonetheless real and tangible and available as a kind of right, and a hard-won right at that. Everybody in the hall is proud of the fact that the most elemental thing of all, human blood, is freely donated to the National Health Service, which never runs out of it and never pays a penny to those who line up to give it and expect nothing in return but a strong brown cup of serious proletarian tea. For me, this movement is everything. It contains within itself the germinal hope of a better future, where a thinking working class can acquire the faculties of a serious party of government and can extend these small early reformist gains into something more comprehensive all the while uniting with similar movements in other countries to repudiate the narrow nationalisms and chauvinisms that lead to wars and partitions. To be enrolled in its ranks is to be part of an alternative history as well as an alternative present and future. Official Britain may have its Valhalla of heroes and statesmen and conquerors and empire builders, but we know that the highest point ever reached by European civilization was in the city of Basel in 1912, when the leaders of the socialist parties of all countries met to coordinate an opposition to the coming world war. The names of real heroes, like Jean Juarez and Karl Liebknecht, make the figures of Asquith and Churchill and Lloyd George seem like pygmies. The violence and disruption of a socialist transformation in those years would have been infinitely less than the insane sacrifice of culture to barbarism and to the Nazism and Stalinism that ensued from it. This feeling seemed absolutely authentic to me at the time. As a matter of fact, it still does. The only two immediate difficulties with this idealism are that, first, this same movement is, at least for the time being, 
expressed politically by a very boring and compromised party known as the Labour Party, and second, that in the industry where I actually happen to work, the unions are the most hidebound and conservative force of all, which in the newspaper business is saying quite a good deal. In my efforts to live up to the Peter de Vries maxim, I took various mainstream jobs, from being a freelance researcher for the Insight team at Harold Evans's Sunday Times, then at its Zenith, to working at the newly formed London Weekend Television, to being a correspondent for the Daily Express and a part-time editorial or leader writer for the old Evening Standard. This makes me one of the last of those who can say that they worked for Beaverbrook newspapers, the famous old racket, half magic and half criminal, that was preserved forever in Evelyn Waugh's portrayal of the Daily Beast. Writing my own introduction to the Penguin edition of Scoop, I said of Waugh's Fleet Street masterpiece that it perfectly evoked both the fugitive glamour of the business, that pseudo-deco black glass palace on Fleet Street, from which one might take a taxi at short notice to the airport, clutching a brick of traveller's checks with an exotic visa in one's old blue-gold hardback British passport, the street of adventure, as well as its irredeemable squalor, the street of shame. Here is how war introduces a group of veteran British hacks, met in some dismal overseas bar. Shumble, Welper and Pig knew Corker. They had loitered of old on many a doorstep and forced an entry into many a stricken home. I once had a drink with an express veteran, his face richly veined and seamed with grog blossom, in the old punch tavern opposite the offices, while he explained to me the etiquette of stricken home violation. The bereaved generally liked to offer a cup of tea, he said, out of immemorial working-class courtesy. Thus, when extracting the maximum of tragedy from the relatives of a recent victim, be it of crime or fire or plane crash, it was always important to take along a colleague. He offers to help them out in the kitchen while they put the kettle on, and that gives you nice time to slip into the front room and collar the family photos from off the mantelpiece. Lest I seem to pretend to have been shocked by this, I freely admit that the unofficial motto of our foreign correspondent's desk was, when setting off to some scene of mass graves and riven societies, Anyone here been raped and speaks English? In Martin Amos's novel of Fleet Street, Yellow Dog, you might think that the contempt shown by the reporters for both their subjects and their readers is overdone, but you would be wrong. I appear in some obscure online dictionary of quotations for having said that I became a journalist partly so that I wouldn't ever have to rely on the press for my information. In many ways, journalism was the ideal profession for someone like myself who was drawn to the Janus-faced mode of life. Did I say profession? There is something about the craft and practice, better words for it, that is naturally two-faced. One has to pretend to be at least formally polite to the politicians one interviews. One has to be civil and smiling and curious when sitting with criminal, lunatic freedom fighters and crazed, aphasic dictators. I can give an example of this from the formative days of my own career, in the media racket. In the early 1970s, in what had once been called the Jew of Africa, there was a state-sponsored pogrom against Ugandans of Asian descent, who were first dispossessed and then deported. The man responsible was the almost pornographically wicked figure Idi Amin, later to become an exiled guest in Saudi Arabia as a heroic son of Islam. His bigotry and greed were two aspects of the same rampant disorder. He wanted the assets of the Asian business community as his political spoil, and he also wanted to be the man who Africanized his unhappy country by ethnic cleansing. Most of those Asians had British passports, though it had never been thought that they would employ them for the crassly, tactless purpose of, say, coming to live in the United Kingdom. When they did exercise this small legal privilege, there was quite a strong racist reaction to their arrival. One of those who was most demagogic on the point was Sir Oswald Mosley, an aging figure to whom there still clung the authentic stench of the 1930s, when he had been the black-shirted leader of the British Union of Fascists. Since the end of the Second World War, he had chosen to live in Paris. As it happened, my very amateur network of intelligence and information brought me the news that the old would-be dictator was in London and staying at the Ritz. I decided to see if he would come on the television show for which I was then a researcher and cub reporter. first part was easy. I established that he was indeed at the Ritz and that he was willing to be interviewed. 
the second bit was slightly more difficult. Was I not having to be civil to a man who had had Joseph Goebbels as the best man at his wedding to Lady Diana Mitford? With Adolf Hitler, who gave the happy couple a framed portrait of himself as a nuptial gift, in attendance as guest of honour. I decided that the problem could be resolved in the following way. The opportunity was too good to miss, but there the formalities ended. I would send him a car, and would greet him in the lobby, but would not extend my hand when he arrived. I rehearsed the moment many times, waking and sleeping, until the limousine drew up and the now silvered and bull-like figure of the old bastard began to emerge. Somehow I found I was putting out my own hand first and saying, Sir Oswald, how very good of you to come. In what seemed a volitionless state, I then conducted him to the hospitality suite and poured him a drink. I can justify this, if you like. It occurs to me now that I could also have justified it then, since Mosley was the model for Sir Roderick Spode, the brutish and ridiculous leader of the Black Shorts movement in P. G. Woodhouse's 1938 masterpiece, The Code of the Worcesters, and one doesn't get many chances to meet such an original. But I was far too solemn for that in those days. Instead, I justified myself tactically. From our ensuing chat, I learned that he had never dreaded the Marxist hecklers of the thirties who'd hurled rocks and vegetation at him. The most disconcerting tactic of the left, he informed me, had been to occupy the first few rows of seats in a town hall, and then, as he began speaking, to open newspapers and bury their faces in the pages. It's somehow very hard to whip up a crowd when the front row seats are thus otherwise engaged. He carried on in this urbane and confessional manner until it was time to put him on the set and begin the serious business. As soon as the studio lights came up and the camera's light began winking red, he seemed to shrug off his previous character and style and to become suddenly lean and hawk-like as of yore. The whole timbre of his voice altered, and to the interviewer's first question, on Ugandan Asian immigration, he returned a rasping, sneering answer that summoned all the old echoes of race and nation. Thus, green and untried as I was, I had the opportunity to notice in one hour what many members of the British upper class had been unable to bring themselves to see in the 1930s. There was one mostly who acted in a fairly civilized and even amusing way in the drawing rooms and country houses, and another whose relish it was to go down to the slums of the East End and get all dirtied up with those who were so base and stupid as to think that their lives would improve if they were not afflicted with Jewish neighbours. How I managed the conclusion of the thing I can't now recall. Perhaps I was proud and heroic enough to decline a handshake as Sir Oswald departed. Anyway, it taught me that the moral attitudes that one strikes are often devoid of any significance. This was perhaps not quite as true for my next confrontation with the old buzzer. In 1980, his wife, Lady Diana, estranged sister of my later friend Jessica Mitford, wrote a review of a book about the Goebbels family for the London sheet Books and Bookmen, an outlet to which I also occasionally contributed. Even had I not been appalled by her gushing praise for the delightful Joseph and Magda, I would have drawn the line at the metaphor she employed for their murder of their four children. This she called a Masada-like deed. I thought that crossed a line, and said so in The New Statesman, adding an unkind play on the name of the publisher of Books and Bookman, a man named Philip Doss. Mr. Doss, that week, committed suicide, and Auburn War accused me, in The Spectator, of having driven him to his death. I both liked and disliked, fortunately I disliked more, the notion that a polemic of mine could have had anything like this effect, by the time it was revealed to my relief that Mr. Doss had killed himself without having read my piece, and because of an impending collision with his creditors and the Inland Revenue, I had opened an envelope from the Chateau de la Gloire, the rather grotesque address outside Paris which I knew to be the lair of the Mosleys, and convenient for their friendship with their frightful neighbours, the Duke of Windsor and Mrs. Simpson. The enclosed letter was from Sir Oswald, complaining that, while he was fair game, it wasn't cricket to be attacking his dear wife. Since she had been a far more active Nazi than he, and had invited Hitler to her wedding, I thought this was weak stuff. Later, opening that day's London Times, I saw Sir Oswald's obituary notice, which means that it's quite thinkable that I was the recipient of the last missive he ever wrote. Lady Diana was to outlive him for some decades, never uttering 
a repentant remark about her Third Reich period. When I once asked Decker if she ever had any contact at all with her sister, she replied, Certainly not. I think I did bow slightly to her at dear Nancy's funeral, but otherwise it's been absolutely non-speakers since Munich. This was all in the 70s. When exactly did we begin to periodize by decades instead of, say, by reigns? Did people in the 30s know that they were going to be historically collectivized in that way? There were no noughts or tens in the 20th century, which went straight from Edwardian to the Great War. Hints of an idea of the 20s had been contained in the concept of the Jazz Age. In the spring of 1968, I do remember a revolutionary speaker on the pavement, outside the London School of Economics, referring to a year that might one day be matched with 1848 and 1917, and we did have a sort of consciousness of living in the 60s while they were still going on. But the 70s were only the 70s because they had to have a name. Nullity and anticlimax appeared to close in on all sides. And so did certain kinds of nastiness, often composed of or distilled from the worst of the 60s. The television HQ to which I had invited Mosley was situated in a new high-rise on the south bank of the Thames, with a commanding view of London. Looking out of one of its higher windows after lunch one day, I first saw and then heard a huge explosion. It seemed to be located somewhere near St. Paul's Cathedral. What I had just seen, and was to be seeing at street level within the hour, was the first Irish Republican Army car bomb to detonate on the British mainland. The target had been the Old Bailey, the country's Supreme Court. I had always been opposed to the partition of Ireland and a strong supporter of the civil rights movement against the orange sectarian mini-state that embodied the petrified stagnant outcomes of that old and cruel division. My outfit, the International Socialists, had been involved at an early stage in the non-sectarian protests and marches and strikes that had challenged the Ulster six-county rump system. Many was the evening, especially after the bloody Sunday massacre by British troops in Derry, and after Britain's imposition of internment, better known as imprisonment without trial, but with some torture, that I had spent in Irish pubs and clubs making speeches and organising protests. As a journalist also, I started visiting Belfast and Derry and Newry, and had my first experience of seeing shots fired in anger, as well as nail bombs thrown and gasoline bombs too. As one brought up inside the protective womb of the Royal Navy and its bases, it felt very strange to me to see the British Army patrolling streets that were at least constitutionally British, but while wearing the visors and helmets of occupying space aliens. That was one distinct oddity. The other, in a city like Belfast, where there had been almost no Commonwealth immigration, was that if one saw blackface, it was almost invariably the face of a British soldier. Some of the taunts from angry old ladies in Republican slum districts did not fail to make use of this striking contrast. "'What do you do with it then, soldier boy?' shrilled one banshee as a young squaddy from Barbados flourished a rubber bullet, a crowd-control device that resembled a Coke bottle sculpted in black. "'Post it to your fucking wife!' I never forgot the look of hurt on his face. With James Fenton who I had eventually succeeded in recruiting to the International Socialists. I made a few trips to Northern Ireland and collaborated on an article or two for the New Statesman. One of these carried our joint byline, something that still gives me great pride in retrospect. Our own polemics were, of course, staunchly non-sectarian, stressing the contribution of Irish Protestants like Wolfe Tone to the long tradition of republicanism and laying emphasis on historic Irish socialists like James Connolly and Jim Larkin. In the squalid and cramped back streets around the Belfast shipyards, it seemed to us, no better illustration could be found of the need for working people to forget their confessional and national differences and unite in a brotherly fashion. But to say that such appeals failed to achieve locomotive force among the masses would be to understate the case to an almost heroic degree. I eventually came to appreciate a feature of the situation that has since helped me to understand similar obduracy in Lebanon, Gaza, Cyprus, and several other spots. The local leaderships that are generated by the troubles in such places do not want there to be a solution. A solution would mean that they were no longer deferred to by visiting UN or American mediators, no longer invited to ritzy high-profile international conferences, no longer treated with deference by the mass media, and no longer able to make a second living 
by smuggling and protection racketeering. The power of this parasitic class was what protracted the fighting in Northern Ireland for years and years after it had become obvious to all that nobody, except the racketeers, could win. And when it was over, far too many of the racketeers became profiteers of the peace process as well. You know, what got people going in Belfast in the early 1970s was not humanism and solidarity, but rather violence, cruelty, conspiracy, bigotry, alcohol, and organized crime. The most witty and penetrating first-hand account of this morbid interlude is to be found in Kevin Myers' his memoir, Watching the Door. I did in fact make friends with a few Protestant workers in the Woodvale district, who showed some interest in crossing the divide and having speech with their Catholic brethren, but they developed a depressing tendency to wind up in the trunks of bullet-sprayed cars, or sometimes, I think of Ernie Elliott, to be bullet sprayed before being stuffed into the trunk. This was all brought home to me with singular force when James failed to turn up for a rendezvous that we'd made in Andersonstown, a grit-strewn housing estate dominated by the emerging provisional IRA. He had gone to the agreed pub and sat down to look at some documents about British Army roundups and internments in the area. This was a mistake, arguably a big one. Within minutes, a group had joined him and told him to put his hands on the table under which a gun was pointing at his midsection. Taken to a filthy house and told to lie on the floor, he was kept for several hours while his captors failed to reach the various people in London who could have vouched that he was indeed a reporter and not a spy or provocateur. But eventually they let him go, and he wrote quite an amusing account of his brush with terror. This was rendered much less risible a few days later when, in a villainous Belfast tavern, I chanced to introduce him to a local reporter with known Republican connections. "'Did you say, Fenton?' breathed this worthy gent. "'Did you know they took a vote about what to do with yous? "'It was just six to five against shooting you there and then.' That sort of vote was almost the only concept of democracy that some of the denizens of the city were ever able to form. The woman who had chaired the meeting, a haggard crone by the name of Moira Drum, was later shot in her hospital bed by some no less tender Ulster volunteer unionist riffraff who were prepared to cross the city's divide just for the chance to enjoy such an atrocity. A reprehensible temptation presented itself at once. In places like this, in contrast to the rather dreary precincts of the British urban and suburban and rural mainland, there was drama to be had, and for the asking. Every night and day there were bombs and gunshots and riots and roundups and it didn't take long to gain a little access to the bars and shabines where these things were discussed with a certain knowingness. One could do this as a political activist, or as a journalist, or, as in my case, an amateur combination of both. I have to admit that I sometimes found this double life more than just figuratively intoxicating. I was sufficiently furious, after the British Army massacre of demonstrators on Bloody Sunday, that I once shocked Fenton very much by saying that if an IRA man were to be on the run and needing no more than a bed for the night, and not a word spoken, I myself might be ready to furnish the needful. Of course I knew to beware of this vicarious identification with the authentic. I had acquired some of that wariness in Cuba, but I hadn't yet quite learned to stay clear of it consistently, and, to mention another expression that annoyed James so much that I often used it merely to tease him, these encounters on the dark side also supplied good copy. In the weirdly beautiful landscapes along the Irish border, most especially in Derry, with its haunting evening light along the waterside and the old walls, and in rainy Belfast, with its nineteenth-century slums and yet its permanent view of the lovely surrounding hills, I saw my first war without even needing a passport to travel to it. One is unlikely to forget the first time that one sees violent death or feels it graze one's own sleeve. The Europa Hotel in Belfast was, for me, the first of many journalistic resorts, from the Commodore in Beirut to Meikle's in Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, to the Holiday Inn in Sarajevo, where one was to find Mahogany Ridge, the hack shorthand for the scoop-like bar where so many war stories were told and written. Here was where one might go to meet surreptitious sources, to trade tales with rivals and exchange information with friends, to play poker with the employer's money, to rub shoulders and scrape acquaintance with the fringe elements of the demi-monde of terrorism and counterintelligence. 
One evening when, as it happens, I was sincerely entertaining some local trade union men to a non-sectarian supper, there came the crash of an explosion that was near enough to rattle the glasses. Hastening outside and into the warren of little streets across the road, one saw that a renowned local drink shop, named the Elbow Room, was no more. Named as much for its position at the junction of two narrow streets as for the bending of the relevant arm joint, it had taken the full force of a car bomb that had been parked in a confined space. The resulting blast had blown everything in, and then, it seemed by some evil backdraft, sucked everything out again. The mess of beer and whiskey and blood and glass was everywhere, as were some huddled objects that made me wince and flinch. I remember best a Belfast fireman, one of those seemingly seven-foot giants, in whom the province specialized, coming out from the ruins with a small figure wrapped in a tarpaulin in his arms. He then sat down on what was left of the steps and began to weep. I had that terrible inward feeling that I have had since, at bullfights and executions and war scenes, of wanting this to stop while simultaneously wishing it to go on, and wanting to look away while needing to look more closely. Deciding that the man must be cradling a murdered child, I was bizarrely taken aback to find that he was, in fact, sobbing over a hopelessly mangled dog, and a Belfast fireman must by then have been exposed to quite a lot. My own case was much less dramatic, but still very vivid to me. Coming back to the Europa one night from checking casualties at the Royal Victoria Hospital, I couldn't find a taxi, and decided to hoof it through some of the insurgent-run lanes of the Falls Road district. I hadn't reckoned with the speed of nightfall, and found myself alone in the gathering dark, a crepuscular gloom augmented by the local habit of shooting out all the streetlights. A very sudden bang convinced me that a nail bomb had been thrown at a British patrol, and I swiftly decided that the better part of valour was to drop into the gutter and make myself inconspicuous. Judging by the whistling and cracking of nearby volleys, this decision was shrewd enough as far as it went, and I remember thinking how awful it would be to end my career as the random victim of a ricochet. Instead, I nearly ended it as a bloody fool who tested the patience of the British Army. Rising too soon from my semi-recumbent posture, I found myself slammed against the wall by a squad of soldiers with blackened faces and asked various urgent questions that were larded with terse remarks about the many shortcomings of the Irish. Getting my breath back and managing a brief statement in my cut-glass Oxford tones, I was abruptly recognized as non-threatening, brusquely advised to fuck off, and off I duly and promptly fucked. Graham Greene writes somewhere about John Buchan that his thrillers, The Thirty-Nine Steps, being a salient example, achieve some of their effect by the imminence of death in otherwise normal situations, such as right beside the railings of Hyde Park. I wasn't exactly in Hyde Park, but I was still in my own country, and the telephone boxes were red, and the police uniforms were blue, and the awareness that the distinction between over here and over there, or between home and abroad, is often a false one, has never left me. So, here was how to get through the boring and constipated seventies. First, adopt the profession of journalism that allowed one to become a version of John Bunyan's Mr. Facing Both Ways. Northern Ireland was near perfect for polishing up this act, since in one day one might visit a Republican bar and a Unionist saloon before rounding off the night at an off-the-record dinner with a British intelligence officer. Second, keep travelling to exotic places that seem to preserve at least some of the waning promise of 1968. Third, maintain the double life in London as well. I would do my day jobs at various mainstream papers and magazines and TV stations where my title was Christopher Hitchens and then sneak down to the East End, where I was variously features editor of Socialist Worker and book review editor of the theoretical monthly International Socialism. On the masthead of the latter, my name stubbornly continued to appear as Chris, whereas at the New Statesman, I would always insist on it being rendered full out, even though on the cover, this sometimes meant that it was too long to be featured where I most wanted it. Of the agitational rags with which I've been involved, Socialist Worker was one of the best. I managed to conscript James Fenton as its film critic, an achievement which turned out a bit too rich for the digestive system of some of the sterner comrades. He contributed an almost lyrically Marxist notice of Pontecorvo's slave revolt movie, Quemada, before attracting annoyed letters for his slightly camp praise of a then-recent Carry On production. 
Working to improve these doer pages brought me into proper contact with Paul Foote, the scion of one of England's truly great radical families, and perhaps the person with whom it was hardest to identify the difference between the way he thought and felt and the principled matter in which he lived and behaved. When he later became gravely ill and was asked if he would like his hospital bed moved into a private room, he was incapable of speech but fully able to make an easy-to-recognize digital gesture. He was somewhat older than me, but his reaction to any injustice was as outraged and appalled as that of any young person who has just discovered that life is unfair. By this I do not at all want to make him sound naive. I resolved to try and resist in my own life the jaded reaction that makes one coarsen to the ugly habits of power. When Paul died, the organiser of his memorial meeting invited me to record a video tribute, which I gladly did. In a minor spasm of spite, the gargoyles, who by then ran the Socialist Workers' Party, prevented it from being shown at the event. But there were some giants on the left in those days. It was becoming reasonably obvious, however, that I wasn't going to be one of them. I knew that with half of myself I was supposed to be building up the labor movement, and then with another half of myself subverting and infiltrating it from the ultra-left, but then I came across that fatal phrase of Oscar Wilde's that says that the problem with socialism is that it wastes too many evenings on meetings. Boredom has always been my besetting vice in any case. Then I still wanted some sort of a good time, and that definition had to include a variety of acquaintances and a decent, if not sumptuous, menu. The central line on the underground could make the journey from the proletarian East End to the Oxford Circus Regent Street quarter very smooth. I remember dashing from the grimy offices of the worker to a job interview in the West End where I, rashly but successfully, tried to sell a freshly printed copy to John Burt, future boss of the BBC, member of the House of Lords and character in the play and movie Frost Nixon. He hired me anyway. The pages of the satirical review Private Eye record the early stages of this mutation. Early entries have me as handsome Christopher Robin Hitchens. Yet as the 70s go by, these soon give way to another staple reference, this time to the chubby Trotskyist defector. Such photographs as survive tend to confirm the same story. I mentioned that Fenton had introduced me at Oxford to some of the charms of alcohol and tobacco. This is to give you no idea of how much I improved upon his initiation ceremonies. I dare say this might have happened to me anyway, but the discovery that so much of London journalistic life took place in pubs and bars, and that anything absorbed there could be charged to an expense account, caused me to resemble the cat Webster in The Imperishable Story by P. G. Woodhouse. Webster sat crouched upon the floor beside the widening pool of whiskey. But it was not horror and disgust that had caused him to crouch. He was crouched because, crouching, he could get nearer to the stuff and obtain crisper action. His tongue was moving in and out like a piston. And Webster winked, too, a whole-hearted roguish wink that said, as plainly as if he'd spoken the words, How long has this been going on? Then, with a slight hiccup, he turned back to the task of getting his quick before it soaked into the floor. I soon made that fine cat look like the mere beginner that it was. The commander used to drink too much, and Yvonne was seldom without a lit cigarette. I lit another cigarette, says John Self in Martin Amos's Money, adding, unless I specifically inform you to the contrary, I am always lighting another cigarette. As a boy, I had disliked the smell of both habits, which I suppose adds to the strong case that genetic predisposition plays a role in these addictions. But my tolerance for alcohol was very much greater than my father's had been, indeed, than anyone I seemed to run into. It wasn't all that easy to get a reputation for boozing when he worked in and around Old Fleet Street, where the hardened hands would spill more, just getting the stuff to their lips, than most people imbibe in a week, but I managed it. I still have somewhere the memo from Bill Cater at the accounts office of Harry Evans's Sunday Times, for whom I'd done a story that eventually led to the imprisonment of a corrupt Labour mayor. I've passed your Dundee expenses, he wrote, but I couldn't help noticing that almost half the bills were for cocktails. I don't think any newspaper is entitled to this kind of loyalty. A figure from this period may illustrate how nearly I might have run completely to seed. Since redeemed from an unjust obscurity by Francis Wien's wonderful biography, Tom Dryberg in the last years of his life was still a true legend on the journalistic and cultural left. 
In youth, he had been an original member of Ivrin War's Brideshead set, while also maintaining good relations with the more radical forces clustered around W. H. Auden and Stephen Spender. He had indeed given the young Auden his first copy of The Wasteland and joined him in reading it aloud. Adopted by Edith Sitwell as the coming poet of her own generation, nominated by Alistair Crowley as the successor to his own satanic role as the Beast 666, friendly if not indeed intimate with Guy Burgess, the most calcified degenerate of those who had deserted British intelligence for the embrace of Moscow and the KGB, Tom, in his amoral and aloof elegance, breathed all of the dubious enchantments of the 1930s and was redolent, too, of all the byways of Bohemia. I knew him by reputation as a leading member of the left faction of the Labour Party in Parliament and as the author of some sparkling collections of journalism. Reporting from Vietnam in 1945, he may have been the first person to assert the extreme unwisdom of trying to restore French colonialism with British troops. Anyway... He was sometimes invited to contribute the Londoner's diary to the New Statesman, and one week issued an appeal to readers to help him complete an indecent limerick, the first line of which ran, The once was a man of Stoke Poges. This highly respectable town in Buckinghamshire seemed to cry out for the rhyme Poke Doges, which in turn meant that the remainder of the limerick would have to be Venetian in flavour. Fenton and I, assisted by our dear friend Anthony Holden, accepted the challenge and were duly invited to a lunch by old Tom, held at the Quo Vadis restaurant in Dean Street, above which Karl Marx had once kept his squalid lodgings. How we completed the task, I don't entirely remember. Entirely resolved to poke doges, so this elderly menace took steamship to Venice. But what was the last line? At all events, by the time the restaurant had finally insisted on throwing us out, this in the days when the pubs in London were not allowed to stay open in the afternoon, Tom simply took me down the street and up a flight of dingy stairs and made me a member of the infamous Colony Room Club, an off-hours drinking establishment run by a tyrannical sapphist named Muriel Belcher. Renowned to this day for its committed members, from Peter O'Toole to Francis Bacon, the joint at that epoch gave off an atmosphere of inspissated gloom, punctuated by moments of high insobriety and low camp. Muriel, arguably the rudest person in England, Shut up, cunty, and order some more champagne. Almost never left her perch at the corner of the bar and was committed to that form of humour that insists on referring to all gentlemen as ladies. Occasionally this routine was still funny. Yes, she would screech if someone mentioned the London Blitz. That's when we were all fighting that nasty Mrs. Hitler. O'Toole's favourite was a rejoinder she made when he described some ancient and absent member as a bit of a bore. He was a very brave lady insisted Muriel, in the First World War. This Pythonesque drag queenery was all very well in its way, and it was nice to have a boozy hideaway in the afternoons and late evenings. But there were times when it all felt a bit thin and sketchy, and as with some pubs in Fleet Street, there seemed to be too many people who were perhaps forty and looked perhaps sixty. Awful warnings, in fact, splashing their lives up against the porcelain. In time I took heed, and mainly confined my drinking to mealtimes, which was at least a start. Dryberg developed a fondness for me, which I don't think was especially sexual. He would try any male person at least once, on the principle that you never know your luck. But he preferred working-class tough guys, policemen and soldiers in a special treat. And all he really wished was to offer them his version of lip service. I once had to cancel a dinner engagement with him and being asked rather querulously why this was, replied that my girlfriend was in hospital for some tests and that I wanted to visit her after work. Ah, yes, said Tom, with every apparent effort at solicitude. There's a lot to go wrong with them, isn't there? I do so hope it isn't her clitoris or anything ghastly like that. Not all of this was by any means affectation. For Tom, the entire notion of heterosexual intercourse was gruesome to the last degree. That awful wound, my dear Christopher, I just don't see how you can. Forced into a marriage of convenience as the price of his early political ambitions, he was said to have accused his bride of attempting to rape him on their wedding night. In this he was like Noel Coward, who was once asked by Gorvidal if he'd ever even attempted anything with a woman. Certainly not, replied the master. Not even with Gertrude Lawrence, Gore inquired. Particularly not with Miss Lawrence, was Coward's return served to that. In something of the same manner, 
Chester Coleman would sometimes taunt Auden during domestic disputes with the fact that Whiston had admittedly slept with Erica Mann. At least I'm pure, dear, he would intone. Through Tom I was eventually to meet Gorvidal, and also to learn how, when in Rome, the two of them would hunt together and organize a proper division of labor. Rugged young men, recruited from the Via Veneto, would be taken from the rear by Gore and then thrust, with any luck, semi-erect, into the next-door room where Tom would suck them dry. It shows what few people understand even now, which is the variety of homosexual conduct. I do not want a penis anywhere near me, as Gore would put it in that terse and memorable way he once had. Incidentally, this double act also emphasized another distinction. Tom adored to give pleasure, while Gore has always liked to boast that he's never knowingly or intentionally gratified any of his partners, not even a sighing reach-around by the sound of it. I am necessarily telling the next story very slightly out of order, but there came a time when Kingsley Amis asked me if by any chance I could introduce him to Tom Dryberg. He understood that the old cocksucker had a trove of unpublished filthy poetry from W. H. Auden, Constant Lambert, and others, and he, Kingsley, had been commissioned to edit the new Oxford Book of Light Verse. Might Tom, in exchange for a good dinner, be induced to share his collection? If so, Kingsley handsomely offered to make a foursome of it at a good restaurant, and invite myself and Martin along for the fun. I telephoned Tom and asked him if he would say yes. I'd be most interested to meet the senior Amos, he murmured. But do tell me, is he by any chance as attractive as his lovely young son? To this absurd query from the ever-hopeful old cruiser, the best reply I could improvise was, Well, Tom, Kingsley is old enough to be his father. Martin My friendship with the Hitch has always been perfectly cloudless. It is a love whose month is ever May. Martin Amos, in The Independent, on January 15, 2007, as cited in the National Portrait Gallery catalogue that reported my death. Events only elicited the above tribute from Martin, when in our real lives it was mid-September, and when the press had been making the very most of a disagreement we'd been having in print about Stalin and Trotsky in the summer of 2001. Looking back, though, I'm inclined to date the burgeoning refulgence of our love to something more like the calendar equivalent of April. Still, it was actually in the gloomy autumn of 1973, around the time of the Yom Kippur-Ramadan war between Israel and Egypt, that we actually improperly met. To anchor the moment in time, Salvador Allende had just been murdered by Pinochet in Chile, W. H. Auden had died, James Fenton, the author of the most beautiful poems to come out of the Indochina War, had won the Eric Gregory Award for poetry and used the money to go off and live in Vietnam and Cambodia, and at the age of 24 I had been hired to fill at least some of the void that he left behind at the New Statesman. Peter Ackroyd, literary editor of the rival and raffishly Tory Spectator, was giving me a drink one evening after returning from a trip of his own to the Middle East and he said in that inimitable quacking and croaking and mirthful voice of his, I've got someone I think you should meet. When he told me the name, I rather offhandedly said that I believed we'd once met already with Fenton at Oxford. Anyway, it was agreed that we would make up a threesome on the following evening at the same sawdust-infested wine bar called the Bunghole, where my new statesman career had begun. Lovers often invest their first meetings with retrospective significance, as if to try and conjure the elements of the numinous out of the stubborn witness of the everyday. I can remember it all very well. Ackroyd doing his best to be a good host. It's a fearsome responsibility to promise two acquaintances that they'll be sure to get along well with one another. And Martin rather languid and understated. He did not, for example, even pretend to remember when I said we'd met before with our other mutual friend, Fenton. It's characteristic of Martin to have pointed out that Dickens's title, Our Mutual Friend, contains or is a solecism. One can have common friends, but not mutual ones. A verse letter to him from Clive James, published in Encounter at about this period, described Martin as resembling a stubby Jagger, and I remember this because of how very exact it seemed. He was more blond than Jagger, and indeed rather shorter, but his sensuous lower lip was a crucial feature. I didn't then know that he thought he was most vulnerable in the mouth, and there was no doubt that you would always know when he'd come into the room. 
His office performed, Ackroyd withdrew, and the remaining pair of us later played some desultory pinball in another bar. I noticed that Martin had the gift of mimicry. He could drop or raise his voice and alter his features and just simply be the person we were talking about. I cannot now remember who. He asked me which novelists I enjoyed, and I first mentioned Graham Greene. This answer palpably did not excite him with its adventurousness. In answer to my reciprocal question, he said he thought that one had to look for something between the twin peaks of Dickens and Nabokov. And it came back to me that Fenton had said to me how almost frighteningly assured all Martin's literary essays were turning out to be. I don't recollect how the evening ended. But some kind of mutuality had been stirred, and we soon enough had dinner with our respective girlfriends in some Cypriot taverna in Camden Town, where things went with a swing, and I can remember making him laugh. Then Yvonne died, and I vanished from London and from life for a bit, to discover on my return that Martin had taken the trouble to write me a brief, well-phrased, memorable note of condolence. A lesson for life. Always when in doubt, please do send letters of commiseration. At the very least, they will be appreciated, and at the best they may even succeed in their apparently futile ambition of lightening the burden of bereavement. The next I knew I was invited to a small party to celebrate the publication of Martin's first novel, The Rachel Papers. Chat about this literary debut had been in the wind for a while, and Martin had an editorial position at the Times Literary Supplement, as well as a mounting reputation as a reviewer and, which of course could be made to irk him, the same surname as one of the most famous novelists writing in English. Thus it seemed rather odd that he should be throwing his own book party, in his own small and shared flat, at his own expense. But I'm glad of it, because those of us who had the good luck and good taste to attend were later able to reminisce rather triumphantly. The 1973-74 apparel was absurd, of course. Cowboy boots and flared trousers for some of the men. Those ill-advised cross-hatched blue jeans designed to resemble armour, for me in particular. And Christ knows what for the girls. Sobriety and corduroy were supplied, however by Amos Senior and by his friend Robert Conquest, the great poet and even greater historian of Stalinism. In The International Socialists, we made his book on The Great Terror required reading, but that didn't mean I didn't suspect him, and Kingsley too, of pronounced reactionary tendencies. This was mainly because of the reprehensible line they'd both taken over Vietnam. Yet I was queasily aware that Kingsley's Girl Twenty, with its ridiculing of sixties morality and mentality, was rather hard to laugh off. Then there was Clive James, dressed as usual like someone who had assembled his wardrobe in the pitch dark, but always on, and always awash in cross-references and apt allusions. The presence of these few but gravity-donating figures, plus the climb up the stairs from Pont Street on the fringes of Chelsea, made me conserve my breath for a time. I had, in fact, met both Kingers and Conkers, as they were sometimes known before, but I was very aware that my roadworthiness Martin prefers the term seaworthiness, in real grown-up company was not to be assumed, at any rate not by me. The main event of my evening turned out in any case to take place at the opposite end of the age and gender scale. It suddenly seemed to me that Martin's sister Sally did not perhaps find me entirely repulsive. As the evening gently evaporated, I found myself taking her arm in the street and seeing, through quite a lot of fog, I now remember, the looming bulk of the Cadogan Hotel. Perhaps a little flown with wine, I suddenly and confusedly felt that it might be a fine thing to take her to the very place where Oscar Wilde had been arrested. I couldn't possibly afford it, but then, as I thought about it, I couldn't possibly afford not to do it once I had thought about it. The wild suite itself was not available, but we did procure a decent room, and things proceeded happily enough. Ghost of Oscar, or no ghost of Oscar, I did briefly allow myself to wonder if there was anything remotely subliminal or oblique in what I was doing. Sally had rather the same colouring as the brother I was beginning to adore, though not at all the same face. It was years until it was established that she was not Kingsley's daughter, but that's another tale altogether. I find now that I can more or less acquit myself on any charge of having desired Martin carnally. My own looks by then had in any case declined to the point where only women would go to bed with me. What eventuated instead was the most heterosexual relationship that one young man could conceivably have with another. As the days became weeks and the months became seasons, and as we fell happily into the habit of lunching and dining and party-going à deux, there began an inexhaustible conversation about womanhood in all its forms and varieties and permutations. 
that saw us through several episodes of sexual drought, as well as through some periods of embarrassment of riches. It was not, or not by any means all, the locker room talk that you may imagine, though any reader of Martin's novels will know how brilliantly inventive is his capacity for bawdry. I refuse to say obscenity, because the obscene is too easy, and besides, it's always either quite humorless or too dependent for its humour on the knowledge that mere infants have of the human anatomy. The crudest thing that comes to mind, because it is such a cliché element of male fantasy, was our word, annexed from something said by Clive James, for the possibility of enjoying two young ladies at the same time. The term for this remote but intriguing contingency, which I still think was at least partially redeemed by its inventiveness, was a car wash. Think about it, or forget it if you can. Incidentally, Kingsley's novel The Green Man contains the best ever depiction of one of the many ways that this much-rehearsed ideal can go badly wrong in practice. It might have been anyone, actually I'm sure it was our poet friend Craig Rain, who came up with the appalling yet unforgettable idea that there is a design flaw in the female form, and that the breasts and the buttocks really ought to be on the same side. But it was Martin who went to all the trouble with deadpan and dead-on acuity of arguing the respective merits of which side that ought to be. One doesn't necessarily want to see both features walking towards one, for example, but then again, it might be dispiriting to see them both simultaneously marching away. As for metaphors, everybody has at one point seen men standing in front of the pornography section in either a magazine store or a video emporium, but it was Martin who observed these swaying and muttering figures pulling out and then replacing the contents and compared it to the Wailing Wall. He had an instinctive understanding of the relationship between Eros and Thanatos, one winter he was suffering quite badly from flu and left the New Statesman office early to go home. I agreed to walk an abnormally subdued and muffled Martin down the gelid street to Hoban tube station. As we trudged along, there was a girl in front of us who looked as if she was walking on beautifully fluted stilts. How might it be, he murmured thoughtfully, with absolutely no leer or salacity. At once, it seemed, he'd brightened and straightened and ceased to snuffle. This was a tiny aspect of an elaborate and detailed investigation of the feminine mystique, a scrupulous weighing of evidence and comparing of notes. I would love to be able to give the impression that it was a relationship between equals, but if represented in cartoon form, the true picture would be closer to one of those great white sharks that evolution has fitted out with an accompanying but rather smaller fish. Picture my mixed emotions at appearing in Martin's novel The Pregnant Widow in the character of his elder brother. I would turn up at parties with Martin, to be sure, but with a rather resigned attitude. At one soiree in Holland Park he was introduced to a young woman with a result that was as close as made no difference to witnessing a lightning strike or a thunderbolt. His then-girlfriend was present at the party, as I think was the other young lady's husband, but what then happened in the adjoining room was unstoppable and seemed somehow foreordained. We both knew that the subsequent pregnancy was almost certainly also a consequent one. But so gentlemanly was the husband in the case that it was not until two decades later that Martin received the letter from his missing daughter, the lovely Delilah Seal, his bonding with whom, there doesn't seem to be another word for it, is one of the most affecting things I've ever chanced to see. And she, the offspring of that Thunderbolt moment, has now become the mother of Martin's first grandchild, another thought that gives me a reflective but piercingly sweet pang. Pasternak was not perhaps such a fool when he wrote in Dr. Zhivago that all conceptions are immaculate. As I write this, I have just read a round-up of authorial opinion printed by a London Sunday newspaper to coincide with Martin's 60th birthday. It's one of the most dispiriting things I've ever seen in print. With a few exceptions, the contributors seem provincial and resentful and sunk in their own mediocrity. After all this time, they're obsessed with Martin's supposed head start in having had a distinguished father, and with the question of whether or not he is a misogynist. On the first point, he's answered quite well for himself. Yes, it's just like taking over the family pub. And on the second, I have to reconcile myself with much annoyance to the fact that most people never saw him with his sister, will never see him with his daughters, or his legion of female friends, not by any means all of whom are former conquests. So far from being some jaded Casanova, Martin possesses the rare gift, enviable if potentially time-consuming, 
of being able to find something attractive in almost any woman. If this be misogyny, then give us increase of it. I could tell that Martin was fitted for glory in work as well as life, and when the Rachel Papers was a huge critical and commercial grand slam, I sent him a long telegram. It was a stave from F. Scott Fitzgerald's early success. Of course, in some ways, this was inappropriate. Scotty burned out and died at 44 and is buried along with poor mad Zelda, not far from me in Rockville, Maryland, but to us then, the age of 40 lay well over the horizon. It wasn't really true of Martin, as Fitzgerald had put it, that premature success gives one an almost mystical conception of destiny as opposed to willpower, at its worst the Napoleonic delusion. However, there was a paragraph that did seem to meet the case, and this I sent him. The compensation of a very early success is a conviction that life is a romantic matter. In the best sense, one stays young. When the primary objects of love and money could be taken for granted, and a shaky eminence had lost its fascination, I had fair years to waste, years that I can't honestly say I regret, in seeking the eternal carnival by the sea. Over the course of the next several years, we were still able to indulge in creative time-wasting by talking always with ardent respect, but always exhaustively until there was absolutely nothing left to say about women, different women, and sometimes the same woman. I remember being rather relieved when, of one of those women, it could be said that it was I who had featured with her, so to speak, first. It seemed only fair. And then the talk would turn to other things. Martin never let friendship take precedence over his first love, which was and is the English language. If one employed a lazy or stale phrase, it would be rubbed in. There, I've done it again. No, it would be incisively emphasized, with a curl of that mighty lip and an ironic gesture. If one committed the offense in print, I remember once saying, no mean achievement in an article, the rebuke might come in note form or by one's being handed a copy of the article with a penciled underlining. He could take this vigilance to almost parodic lengths. The words ruggedly handsome features appear on the first page of 1984, and for a while Martin declined to go any further into the book. The man can't write worth a damn. He was later to admit that the novel did improve a trifle after that. Years later, when I gave him the manuscript of my book on Orwell, he brought it to our next rendezvous at a Manhattan bistro and wordlessly handed it back. He had gone through it page by page, painstakingly correcting my pepper-shaker punctuation. He seemed to have read everything, and he had the rare faculty of being able to quote longish staves of prose from memory. A passage about Sir Lester Dedlock and Gout from Bleak House, a spine-tingling rendition of Humbert Humbert's last verbal duel with Quilty, a paragraph or two about Alexander Portnoy's mother, the latter perhaps not so astonishing now I think about it, in his Work as well as in his life, Martin has done the really hard thinking about hand jobs, and put us all very sincerely and gratefully in his debt. In this area, too, I felt myself the junior. It was he who got me to read Nabokov and to do so with care, as well as with awe, if only because I knew I would be asked questions. However, I was able to return the favour in a way which was to help change his life in turn, by pressing on him a copy of Humboldt's Gift. In 2008, when I finally had a bestseller hit of my own, it was from the pages of Bellow's great book that Martin sent me a sort of return compliment for my Fitzgerald telegram of 1974. It was my turn to be famous and to make money, to get heavy mail, to be recognized by influential people, to be dined at Sardi's and propositioned in padded booths by women who sprayed themselves with musk, to buy Sea Island cotton underpants and leather luggage, to live through the intolerable excitement of vindication. I was right all along. I experienced the high voltage of publicity. This, too, the Sea Island gear and the musky women, for example, was quite imperfect as an analogy while still conveying an atmosphere. Loved by women while also being adored by men, shall I say no mean achievement? Martin also has a way of attracting fathers. He once went to meet John Updike at the Massachusetts General Hospital and told me that when he'd said goodbye felt oddly as if waving farewell to a male parent. I happened to be interviewing Updike a year or so later, and mentioned that I knew his great admirer, the younger Amos. With an extraordinarily gentle expression on his face, Updike recalled the meeting at Mass Gen, and said, It was the strangest thing watching him walk away, almost as if he were my son. And nobody who has read Martin on Saul Bellow, let alone seen him in the company of the old man, 
can doubt for a second that his combination of admiring and protective feelings had eventually become fiercely filial. He said indignantly to me when I gave Bellows Ravelstein a slightly disobliging review, Don't cheek your elders. I waited for something else, some hint of the ironic, perhaps, but with perfectly emphatic gravity he repeated the admonition. This from the one-time enfant terrible could mean only one thing. There was also a time when he might have adopted Vladimir Nabokov, posthumously, as it were, as a proxy parent. He made himself master of the subject matter, got to know surviving members of the family, wrote an essay on Lolita that was frighteningly exact, did everything except take up Lepidoptera. But the more Martin absorbed himself in the man's work, the more it was borne in on him that the recurrent twelve-year-old girl theme in Nabokov's writing was something more alarming and disturbing than a daring literary one-off. C. For his morally inerrant notice of this disquieting business, The Guardian, of the 14th of November, 2009. But I was also lucky in meeting Martin when his relationship with his true father was at its absolute best. I remember envying the way in which the two of them could tell jokes without inhibition, discuss matters sexual, and compete only over minor differences about literature or politics. There had once been a bad time when Martin and his siblings and his mother had been abandoned by the old man, and there was to come a moment when that same old man metamorphosed into an elderly man, querulous and paranoid and devoid of wit, but in between there was a wonderful golden late summer. Dad, will you make some of your noises? It was easy to see when this invitation was taken up, where Martin had acquired his own gift for mimicry. Kingsley could do the sound of a brass band approaching on a foggy day. He could become the Metropolitan Line train entering Edgware Road Station. He could be four wrecked tramps coughing in a bus shelter. This was very demanding and once led to heart palpitations. To create the hiss and crackle of a wartime radio broadcast delivered by Franklin Delano Roosevelt was for him a scant problem. A tape of it, indeed, was played at his memorial meeting, where I was hugely honoured to be among the speakers. The pièce de résistance, an attempt by British soldiers to start up a frozen two-ton truck on a windy morning somewhere in Germany, was for special occasions only. One held one's breath as Kingsley emitted the first screech of the busted starting key. His only slightly lesser vocal achievement, of a motorbike yelling in mechanical agony, once caused a man who had just parked his own machine in the street to turn back anxiously and take a look. The old boy's imitation of an angry dog barking the words, Bug off! was note-perfect. I am aware at all times, gentle reader, of the perhaps-you-had-to-be-there element in a memoir. I strive to keep it permanently in mind. In the case of Kingsley, you don't absolutely have to have been there. Try this from one of his many wonderful letters to Philip Larkin. Amos is imitating the ingratiating announcer of the BBC's condescending weekly programme, Jazz Record Requests. Archie Shep at his most exhilarating. Now to remind us of Jazz's almost infinite variety. Back almost fifty years, the no-good deaf Poxy Sam and one-titted woman blues. Wah, 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 oh, I go, woman, she only go one-titted. Yeah, I go, woman, she only go one-titted. Wah, 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 boy, if she go another, she won't know where to put it. I was reading this late one night, several years after Kingsley's death, and once I'd tried it out loud a couple of times, I felt, through my hot tears of astonished laughter, that it was as if he were in the room, and he went to all this trouble for a private letter. Evenings at Kingsley's home in Flask Walk, the perfect address, were of Falstaffian proportions, with bulging sacks of takeaway food and continual raids on the rightly vaunted arsenal of his cellar. Hitch, he said to me once. You've been here before, and you know the rule of the house. If you don't have a drink in your hand, it's your own fault. Noises might or might not be part of the entertainment. He had a tendency to the gross, and evidently thought that a belch, say, was a terrible thing to waste. I remember his unscripted tromboneings and trumpetings, his cigars and his Macal and single malt, his limericks and his charades, just as I remember sitting quietly while he talked with authority about why Jane Austen was not all that good. The word good, in all its variations, see the blues in the footnote preceding, 
was almost all that this man of immense vocabulary required as a shorthand critical tool. I don't know whether the concept hailed from the Newspeak Dictionary in 1984, where the choices ranged from plus good to double plus ungood, but bloody good from Kingsley was authoritatively affirmative. Good was really pretty good. Some good wasn't at all bad. No good was applied very scathingly indeed, and a three-sentence, six-word pronouncement which I heard him render upon Graham Greene's then latest novel, The Human Factor, absolutely no, bloody good, at all, was conclusive. I write this in a week where I have been rereading Northanger Abbey and reflecting once again on the sheer justice of Kingsley's verdict on Miss Austen's inclination to take a long time over what is of minor importance and a short time over what is major. I shall try and be brief about the sorry way in which things ended up, after I'd left for America, Kingsley wrote a novel called Stanley and the Women. This failed to get itself published in New York, and word reached me that objections from feminists had prevented it from getting adopted by any major house. There were also those who claimed to find it anti-Semitic, though the only offensive remarks in its pages were made by a young man who was clearly out of his mind. I launched a campaign in my column in the Times Literary Supplement against what was just then becoming widely known as political correctness. I kept on being boring about this until, eventually, I received a letter from an editor, a Jewish woman, as it happened, who said, in effect, OK, you win. We'll save the honour of publishing by doing Stanley. Kingsley, whom I hadn't seen for years, invited me to a celebration of this small victory on my next visit to London. We were to meet at the Garrick Club, be joined by Martin, see a movie, and then have a lavish dinner. I still shrink from recalling it. As soon as I arrived at the Garrick's bar, he told me a joke I'd heard before and could obviously see that it hadn't worked. His choice of film was an Eddie Murphy insult that seemed to contradict his increasing contempt for American culture. He appeared genuinely offended that we thought so little of it. Martin and I kept nervously behaving as if he must somehow be joking. Flawless masterpiece, he kept energetically insisting. And this was a mistake. Not only was he not joking, he was in every other way failing to be amusing. In an alarming reversal of his earlier Falstaffianism, he also managed to look both corpulent and resentful. Surfeit swelled, to be sure, but quite without mirth. I think he may have managed one of his riffs about Nelson Mandela being a terrorist. Most painful of all, and somehow rendering rather pointless the original point of the evening, he had abandoned his old liking of the United States and passed the test of the true reactionary by becoming a sulfurous anti-American. Every modern American novelist, he ended up by telling Martin once, and subverting my defense of him, is either a Jew or a hick. I was never to see Kingers again, and when I was almost the only person given kindly treatment in his notorious memoirs, felt oddly discriminated against. That last evening of ours was the very definition of having no fun. We were no longer drawing on a common store of comic gags and literary illusions. I boldly assert, in fact, I think I know, that a lot of friendships and connections absolutely depend upon a sort of shared language or slang. Not necessarily designed to exclude others, these can establish a certain comedy and, even after a long absence, re-establish it in a second. Martin was, is, a genius at this sort of thing. It arose, arises, from his willingness to devote real time to the pitiless search for the apt resonance. I don't know quite why this lodges in my mind, but we once went to some grand black tie ball that had been slightly over-advertised and proved disappointing. The following morning he rang me. I found the way to describe the men at that horror show last evening. Tuxed fucks. As this will illustrate, he did not scorn the demotic or the American. In fact, he remains almost unique in the way that he can blend pub talk and mid-Atlantic idiom into paragraphs and pages that are also fully aware of Milton and Shakespeare. I am morally certain that it's this combination of the classical with the wised up and street smart, most conspicuously with Augie March, that made it a sure thing that he and Saul Bellow would one day take each other's hands. Martin had a period of relishing the Boston thug writer George V. Higgins, author of The Friends of Eddie Coyle. Higgins's characters had an infectious way of saying inner and honor, so Martin would say, for example, I think this lunch should be on a hitch, or I heard he wasn't that useful in a sack. Simple pleasures, you may say, but linguistic sinew is acquired in this fashion, and he would not dump a trope 
until he'd chewed all the flesh and pulp of it and was left only with pith and pips. Thus there arrived a day when Park Lane played host to a fancy new American hotel with the no less fancy name of The Inn on the Park, and he suggested a high-priced cocktail there for no better reason than that he could instruct the cab driver to park in an inn on a park. This near palindrome, as I now think of it, gave us much innocent pleasure. Not all of our pleasures were innocent. There came the day when we were both in New York and both beginning to feel the long, strong, gravitational pull of the great American planet, but where a slight chore, meanwhile, required itself to be performed. In the mid-term churnings of what was to become his breakout novel, Money, Martin required his character to visit a brothel or bordello. He even had one all picked out. Its front name was the Tahitia, a dire Polynesian-themed massage parlour on Lower Lexington Avenue. And you, he informed me, are fucking well coming with me. I was later rather startled, not to say impressed, when I learned that he had cleared all this research with his then wife, the fragrant and lofty Antonia. He telephoned her in London, and rather than temporise, informed her right away that I'm going to a hand job parlour with the hitch. I wanted to say something girlish like, have I ever refused you anything? But instead settled for something rather more masculine like, do we know the form at this joint? I could not possibly have felt less like any such expedition. I had a paint-stripping hangover and a sour mouth. But he had that look of set purpose on his face that I well knew, and also knew could not be gainsaid. How bad could it be? Pretty damn bad, as it turned out. Of the numerous regrettable elements that go to make up the unlawful carnal knowledge industry, I should single out for distinction the look of undisguised contempt that is often worn on the faces of its female staff. Some of the working hostesses may have to simulate delight or even interest, itself a pretty cock-shriveling thought. But when these same ladies do the negotiating, they can shrug off the fake charm as a snake discards an unwanted skin. I suppose they know or presume that they've already got the despised male client exactly where they want him. As it happens, this wasn't true in our case. I would gladly have paid not to have sex at this point. And Martin needed only to snap his fingers in order to enjoy female company. But the cynical little witches at the Tahitia were not to know that they were being conscripted into the service of literature. It was well said by Jean Tarou in The Plague, I think, that attendance at lectures in an unknown language will help to hone one's awareness of the exceedingly slow passage of time. I once had the experience of being waterboarded, and can now dimly appreciate how much every second counts in the experience of the torture victim, forced to go on enduring what is unendurable. But not even the lapse of time between then and now has numbed my recollection of how truly horrible it was to be faking interest in someone who was being paid, and paid rather more incidentally than I could afford, to feign a contemptuous interest in me. The multiplier effect of this mutual degradation gave me dry heaves and flop sweats, and I began to fear conveyed the entirely misleading impression of my being a customer who was convulsed by the hectic sickness of lust. The seconds went limping and dragging by on absolutely leaden feet. It was the cash question, though, that saved me. With some presence of mind, I had for once preempted Martin in the bar of the dump where the gruesome selection process began, by swiftly pointing to the prettiest and slenderest of those available, who also possessed one of the most vicious-looking smiles I have ever seen on a human face. Once removed to her sinister cubicle, we commenced to bargain, or rather in a sort of squalid reverse haggle. Every time I agreed to the price, she added some tax or impost or surcharge and bid me higher. Clad by now only in some sort of exiguous sarong, and equipped only with a dank Ziploc bag containing my credit cards and money, one was obliged to check everything else before entering the humid bar. I wearily started to count out the ever-steepening fee, which was the only thing in the room that showed any sign of enlarging itself. It turned out that, what with tips and percentages and what not, the avaricious bitch had contrived a figure that was not just more than I could afford, but more than I had on me. I was down to the quarters and nickels, and it showed. She had, I will say for her, more pride than that. A handful of change thrown in? No. No one can be expected to take this. So I took her cue of rage and stood up with about as much self-esteem as I could wrap around myself. Here was a two-faced coin of luck. I not only didn't have to go through with it, but I didn't have to shout out the dough either. I lurked torpidly in the recovery room, or whatever they call it, and was eventually joined by a rather reduced and chastened Martin. If you want to know what happened to him, 
the whole experience enriched and enhanced by what I confessed to him of what had happened to me, you must read pages 98 to 104 of the Penguin edition of Money, where John Self tries to get laid for pay under the bam, under the boo, at a perfectly foul establishment named The Happy Isles. There are many, many reasons why Money is the great English novel of the 1980s, to which I am able to add this ensuing insight. Out of our grim little encounter, where he, poor bastard, actually had to part with the cash and endure a sexual fiasco, came several paragraphs of pure reality-based fantasy that make me twist and snarl with laughter every time. And no, you most definitely did not have to have been there. We went off to recuperate at a lunch with Jane Bonham Carter and Ian Lafrenet, at which I remember using hot Japanese sake, by no means for the first time, as an expedient solvent for my still-clinging hangover. Seldom can a mid-morning have been so ill-spent yet, which perhaps goes to show, seldom can such rank dissipation have yielded so many dividends on the page. In all of Martin's fiction, one finds the same keen relish for and appreciation of the multiple uses of embarrassment. The bite of his wit redeems this from being mere farce or humiliation. When fused with his high seriousness about language, the effect is truly formidable. He once rebuked some pedantic antagonist by saying that the man lacked any sense of humour, but added that by this accusation he really intended to impugn his want of seriousness. In a completely other incarnation, I have often thought that he would have made a terrifying barrister. Once decided on mastering a brief, whether it be in his work on nuclear weapons, the final solution, or the gulag, he would go off and positively saturate himself in the literature, and you could always tell that there was a work in progress when all his conversation began to orient itself to the master theme. In this, he strangely resembled Perry Anderson, the theoretician of New Left Review, with whom I also became friendly at about this time. Perry's encyclopedism extended well beyond ideology. He introduced me to the great social comedy of Anthony Pohl's dance sequence, of which he possesses a matchless understanding. Like Perry, Martin contrived to do this without becoming monomaniacal or ancient mariner-like. There was a time when he wouldn't have known the difference between Bukharin and Bakunin, and his later writing on Marxism gets quite a few things wrong, including some things about me and about James Fenton. Uncharacteristically for Martin, his labour on the great subject of communism is also highly deficient in lacking a tragic sense. But he still passed the greatest of all tests in being a pleasure to argue with. Back to my point about shared language, this gradual thickening of mutual experience became its own patois, as money shows. Only recently I found myself smirking in a foolish manner, as a New York Times profile of Martin referred to the words rug for hairdo and sock for loathsomely inadequate bachelor accommodations that he'd popularized for a generation. I played my own small part in this, with sock, as I recall, as also with the then overused word rethink, to describe any wearisomely necessary and repetitive activity, such as a haircut or a bathroom trip. But it was not until Martin had put it into circulation that a coinage of this sort could hope to acquire any real currency. The only time that he ever seemed at all literal to me was in his absorption with soccer games. He would even buy tabloid newspapers on the following day to read accounts of previously played football matches, as I tried discouragingly to put it. From him I learned to accept, as I have since learned to accept from my son and my godson Jacob Amis and their friends, that there are men to whom the outcome of such sporting engagements is emotionally important. This is a test of masculinity, like some straight men's fascination with lesbianism, which I simply cannot seem to pass. Something should be said of the Friday lunch that has now become the potential stuff of a new Bloomsbury legend. I find I want to try and limit myself on this subject, because the temptation to be in ought to be resisted, and also because in this instance you probably did indeed have to be there. I also bear in mind what Fenton once told me about the first Bloomsbury. In the early days of tape recording, it was decided to make a secret tape of the brilliant conversation of Raymond Mortimer and others. All who were in on the plan were later agreed that Mortimer and the others had been at their most scintillating on the afternoon concerned, but when replayed, the tape was as dull as rain. So the first thing to say about this luncheon circle was that, like Topsy in the old folk story, it just growed. There was never the intention or design that it become a set or a circle, and of course if there had been any such intention the thing would have been abortive. The Friday lunch began to simply occur in the mid-1970s and persisted into the early 1980s, 
and is now cemented in place in several memoirs and biographies. Let me try and tell you something of how it was. It began largely at Martin's initiation as a sort of end-of-the-week clearinghouse for gossip and jokes, based on the then proximity of various literary magazines and newspapers. Reliable founding attendees included the Australian poets Clive James and Peter Porter, Craig Rain, T.S. Eliot's successor as poetry editor at Faber and Faber, the Observer's literary editor Terry Kilmartin, the retranslator of Scott Moncrief's version of Marcel Proust, and the only man alive trusted by Gore Vidal to edit his copy without further permission, the cartoonist and rake and dandy Mark Boxer, whose illustrations then graced for once the word is quite apt, all the best book covers as well as the Times' op-ed page. Among those book covers were the dozen volumes of Anthony Pohl's masterwork and, among Mark's aesthetic and social verdicts, the one I remember being delivered with the most authority was his decided and long-meditated conclusion that it's the height of bad manners to sleep with somebody less than three times. Once planning a party with Martin and myself, he'd completed the formal task of inviting all those who simply had to be asked, and exclaimed with relief and delight, From now on, we should go on the basis of looks alone. The critic Russell Davis, the then-rising novelists Ian McEwan and Julian Barnes, James Fenton and Robert Conquest when they were in England, Kingsley when he wasn't otherwise engaged with yet more lavish and extensive lunches, and your humble servant helped to complete this dramatist personae. There were no women, or no regular ones, and nothing was ever said or explicitly resolved about this fact. Between us we were believed to control a lot of the reviewing space in London, and much envious and paranoid comment was made then, and has been made since, to the effect that we vindicated or confirmed Dr. F. R. Lewis's nightmare of a conspiratorial London literary establishment. But I can only remember one occasion when a book was brought along to lunch, to be given to me, so that I could fill in for some reviewer who'd failed at the last moment, and I truly don't think that this counts. Time spent on recollecting our little Bohemia confirms three related but contrasting things for me. The first was the pervasive cultural influence of Philip Larkin. The second was the importance of word games and the long, exhaustive process that makes them both live and become worthwhile. The third was the gradual but ineluctable rise of Margaret Thatcher and her transatlantic counterpart Ronald Reagan. These, then, will be my excuses and pretexts for letting in daylight upon magic, as Walter Badgett phrased it. Unspoken in our circle was quite a deep divide between left and, if not exactly right, yet increasingly anti-left. Fenton and I were still quite Marxist in our own way, even if our cohort was of the heterodox type that I tried to describe earlier. Kingsley had become increasingly vocally right-wing, it often seeming to outsiders that he was confusing the state of the country with the condition of his own liver. But please see his diaries of the time to notice how cogent he often still was. Clive and Martin had been hugely impressed, as who indeed had not, by the emergence of Alexander Solzhenitsyn as a moral and historical titan, witnessing for truth against the state-sponsored lie. In between, men like Terry and Mark found it difficult to repudiate their dislike for a Tory party that had been the main enemy in their youth. Robert Conquest was, and still is, the most distinguished and authoritative anti-communist and ex-communist writing in English. But if this subject was excluded, his politics tended towards something fairly equably social-democratic in temper. He and I agreed that the Moscow Olympics should be boycotted after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and of course... It was he who noticed that some of the aquatic events were being held in the Baltic states, the Russian annexation of which had never been recognized by the post-Yalta agreements that defined the Cold War. At the last lunch I ever attended before emigrating for the United States, a toast was raised to Bob's impending fourth or was it fifth marriage. Well, he replied modestly, I thought perhaps one for the road. Philip Larkin wrote gloomily to Kingsley that the new Texan spouse would probably make their old friend move permanently to America, as yank bags do, and so indeed it proved. Elizabeth, or Liddy, is a bit more than the other half. She's a great scholar in her own person and the anchor of one of the most successful late marriages on record. Once Martin and I had also married Americans, she printed a T-shirt for all concerned that read, Yank Bags Club. I learned appreciably from registering the cross-currents that underlay this apparently light but really quite serious lunch. 
Our common admiration for Larkin as a poet, if not as a man, arose from the bleak honesty with which he confronted the fucked up, the expression must be allowed, condition of the country in those years. It was his use of that phrase, they fuck you up, your mum and dad, as the opening line of his masterly, this be the verse, that put him outside the pale of the family values community. At one of my first encounters with Martin, when we discovered a common affinity for the man, I put my own main emphasis on his poem, Going, Going, which was a non-lacrimose elegy for the seaside and countryside of England, increasingly vandalised and paved and polluted by a combination of plebeian little-outs and polluting capitalists. The poem had actually been commissioned by the Tory government of Edward Heath to accompany the publication of a white paper on the environment, but had then been censored because of a verse about the greedy businessmen who filled the estuaries with effluent. Larkin's innate pessimism, his loyalty to the gritty northern town of Hull, where lay the provincial university that employed him, and his hilarious interest in filth of all kinds, were attractive to all of us, likewise his very moving, deliberate refusal of the false consolations of religion, beautifully captured by his obard and church-going, on which not even Kingsley disagreed. However, Larkin's pungent loathing for the left, for immigrants, for striking workers, for foreigners, and indeed abroad, and for London, show that you couldn't have everything. From Larkin's own emphatic use of it, a common enough idiom, that of the fool, was also evolved, so as to try and make it as capacious as Kingsley's variation on the ordinary word good. Thus there were, of course, and as ever in English, plain fools and damn fools. But trying extra hard to be stupid could get you bloody fool, and real excellence and application in the willful led to the summa of fucking fool. This last title corresponded to Orwell's definition of something so simultaneously dumb and sinister that only an intellectual could be capable of uttering it. One lunchtime attempt to draw up a fucking fool's first eleven of current greats attracted various nominations, John Berger being unanimously chosen as captain. As for the word games, just bear with me if you would. Try first turning the word house into sock. Okay. Bleak sock. Heartbreak sock. The fall of the sock of Usher. The sock of Atreus. The sock of the Seven Gables. The sock of the Rising Sun. This can take time, as can the substitution, a very common English vulgarism, of the word cunt for the word man. Thus, a cunt for all seasons. A cunt's a cunt for all that. He was a cunt, take him for all in all. The cunt who shot Liberty Valance. Bat cunt, super cunt, I know, I know, but one must keep the pot boiling, and then, all right, a shift to the only hardly less coarse word prong, as in the prong with the golden gun, our prong in Havana, prongs without women, those magnificent prongs in their flying machines, and so forth. These and other similarly gruelling routines had to be rolled around the palate and the tongue many a time before Clive James suddenly exclaimed, a Shropshire cunt, by A.E. Sock Prong. This symbiosis seemed somehow to make the long interludes of puerility worthwhile. Clive was in some ways the chief whip of the lunch and would often ring round to make sure that there was a quorum, though I noticed that whenever Martin was away, his enthusiasm waned a bit, as did everyone else's. He needed an audience and damn well deserved one. He beautifully illustrated my Peter de Vries point by having an absolutely massive following on television, while slaving until dawn in Cambridge to produce gem-like essays for no-readership magazines like The New Review or, as his later anthologies of criticism and poetry have amazingly proven, for no immediate audience except himself, a fairly exacting one at that. His authority with the hyperbolic metaphor is, I think, unchallenged. Arnold Schwarzenegger in Pumping Iron resembled a brown condom stuffed with walnuts. Of an encounter with some bore with famous halitosis, Clive once announced, By this time his breath was undoing my tie. I well remember the day when he delivered his review of Leonid Brezhnev's memoirs to the New Statesman, and Martin read its opening paragraphs out loud. Here is a book so dull that a whirling dervish could read himself to sleep with it. If it were to be read in the open air, birds would fall stunned from the sky. One could hear his twanging, marsupial tones in his scorn for this world-class drone and bully whose work was being published by the ever-servile and mercenary tycoon Robert Maxwell, one of the Labour Party's many sources of shame. Clive had given up alcohol after a long period of enjoying a master-servant relationship with it, in which, unfortunately, the role of the booze had been played by Dirk Bogard. 
He thus threw in money only for the food part of the bill, until one day he noticed how much the restaurant charged for awful muck such as bitter lemon and tonic water. At this he moaned with theatrical remorse, I owe you all several hundred pounds. But not all was geniality and verve. The only rift in the Friday loot came when Clive took huge exception to Fenton's review of his actually quite bad verse play about the rise of Prince Charles. The expression complained of, I seem to recall, was, this is the worst poem of the twentieth century. The ensuing chill went on for a bit. Egil Gluckstein, the theoretical guru of the International Socialists, whose party name was Tony Cliff, used to tell an anecdote that I came to regard as an analogy for this sort of wordplay. Rosa Luxemburg, our heroine in the struggle against German imperialism, and the woman who had told Lenin that the right to free expression was meaningless, unless it was the right of the person who thinks differently, had once satirized the overcautious work of the German reformists and trade unionists as the labor of Sisyphus. Whenever she approached the podium of the Social Democratic Conventions before 1914, and before they proved her right by siding with the filthy Kaiser on the crucial vote for war, she would be jeered at as she moved her lamed body towards the platform and catcalled as Sisyphus by the Union hacks. So maybe Sisyphus was wasting his time, Gluckstein would say, hesitating for emphasis. But maybe from this he still got some good muscles. If this historico-materialist point could be adapted for literary weight-training purposes, I would feel compelled to place on record the marginal question of the Tupper family. Everything depended in this otherwise undistinguished imaginary dynasty on your nickname. Thus you might be an over-eager salesman known to his colleagues as Pushy Tupper. You might even be a pedantic and donish fellow saddled with the tag of Stuffy Tupper. The opium addict Poppy was about as far as most of us were prepared to last on this short-lived expedition. But Robert Conquest, the king of the limerick, and the dragon slayer of the Stalinoid apologists, always thought that if a job was worth doing, it was worth doing well. He went off and brooded and came back with Whirly Tupper, the helicopter pioneer, as well as the two hopeless boozers, Whiskey and indeed Rye Tupper. Ought one to blush and to admit that some of these went straight into print as the questions and answers of the New Statesman weekend competition? Well, so did other things no less trivial that are now the stuff of New Yorker profiles, such as new equivalents for the old phrase, cruising for a bruising, angling for a mangling, aiming for a maiming, strolling for a rolling, and, my own favourite, thirsting for a worsting. There was also the time that competitors were asked to submit a paragraph of a Graham Greene parody, Green himself entered under a pseudonym and placed third. More demanding still was the restless quest, again chiefly led by conquest, to inscribe the names of obscure and lowly, unenviable, and ultimately poorly rewarded occupations. Thus, one employed as a disciplinarian of last resort in the turbulent kitchen, Cooksacker, as a disciplinarian of last resort in an ill-run lunatic asylum, Cooksocker, as the man in the bottling plant who keeps things moist, Cork soaker, as a sectarian pyromaniac in the Scots Wars of Religion, Kirk Sacker, as one who has the lonely task of interrupting boat races by leaning over the bridge to snatch up the steersman with rod and line, Cox Hooker. Simple versified filth, Amos Senior's crushing condemnation of most popular limericks, was not allowed. Indeed, Insistence upon the capacious subtleties of the limerick was something of a hallmark. Once again, conquest takes the palm. His condensation of the seven ages of man shows how much force can be compressed into the deceptively slight five-line frame. Thus, seven ages, first puking and mewling, then very pissed off with your schooling, then fucks and then fights, next judging chaps' rights, then sitting in slippers, then drooling. This is not the only example of conquest's genius for compression. The history of the Bolshevik experiment in five lines? Barely a problem. There was an old bastard named Lenin who did two or three million men in. That's a lot to have done in. But where he did one in, that old bastard Stalin did ten in. One of Kingsley's letters from this period may show the way things were tending, and certainly makes me remember the atmosphere as it then was. He's writing to Robert Conquest on April 7, 1977. The swing to the right here is putting the wind up the lefties. At the Friday lunch the other day, they, chiefly Hitchens and Fenton, were saying that chaps were getting fed up about stuff that may not be Labour's fault, but is associated with them rather than the Tories. 
Horn and permissiveness generally, comprehensivization, TUC bosses, terrorism, and the defense rundown. In cultural political terms, that's much as I remember it myself. An expiring post-war labor consensus, increasingly dependent upon tax-funded statism, yet actually run by the union-based old line right wing of the Labour Party machine. A Weimar without the sex, as I once tried to phrase it at the time. Except that in the rest of society there was sex aplenty, with the hedonism of the 60s almost officially instated as dogma, and the slow, surreptitious growth of this consensus to the then unguessed at status of correctness. There could have been no bad time to meet him, but this, in retrospect, seems to have been the perfect moment to become acquainted with Ian McEwan. It was Martin who brought us together, Ian having succeeded him as the winner of the Somerset Maugham Award. By then, everyone had been mesmerized by Ian's early collections of short stories, First Love, Last Rites, and In Between the Sheets. Met in person, he seemed at first to possess some of the same vaguely unsettling qualities as his tales. He never raised his voice, surveyed the world in a very level and almost affectless fashion through moon-shaped granny glasses, wore his hair in a fringe, was rail-thin, showed an interest in what Martin used to call hippieish pursuits, and when I met him, was choosing to live on the fringes of the then weed-infested front-line black ghetto in Brixton. What he wrote, you could see, as Clive James put it when using Ian's character in a novel. And when it came to fiction, he seemed to have contact with other remoter spheres. He could and still can, for example, write about childhood and youth with an almost eerie ability to think and feel his way back into it, a faculty that many superb writers are unable to recruit in themselves. I was sitting at my new statesman desk one afternoon when the telephone rang and a strange voice asked for me by name. After I had confirmed that it was indeed me, or I, the voice said, This is Thomas Pynchon speaking. I am glad that I did not say what I first thought of saying, because he was soon enough able to demonstrate that it was him, and that a mutual friend, make that a common friend, named Ian McEwan, had suggested that he call. The book of still another friend, Larry Kramer's ultra-homosexual effort, Faggots, had been seized by the British Customs and Excise, and all the impounded copies were in danger of being destroyed. Mr. Pynchon was somewhere in England, and was mightily distressed by this. What could be done? Could I raise an outcry, as Pynchon had been assured by Ian I could? I told him that one could protest hoarsely and long, but that Britain had no law protecting free speech or forbidding state censorship. We chatted a bit longer. I artlessly offered to call him back. He laughingly declined this transparent try-on, and faded back into the world where only McEwen could find him. Ian seemed to be able to manage this sort of thing without ever boasting of it. He also formed a friendship with the almost impossible to find Milan Kundera. From this you may surmise that Ian was not part of any pronounced drift to the political or cultural right, but nor was he someone who'd stopped reflecting at approximately the time of Woodstock. His father had been a regular officer in a Scottish regiment. He had a serious working knowledge of military history. His love of the natural world and of wildlife, leading to the arduously contemplative hikes about which we teased him, was matched by an interest in the hard sciences. I think that he did at one stage in his life dabble a bit in what's loosely called the New Age, but in the end it was the rigorous side that won out, and his novels are almost always patrolling some difficult frontier between the speculative and the unseen and the ways in which material reality reimposes itself. When not talking with penetration about literature and music, he was in himself an acute register of the stresses, cultural and moral, that were remaking the old British political divide. One day, or actually one night, I made another saunter across the bridge of that divide in order to test the temperature and conditions on the other side. The circumstances could hardly have been more propitious for me. The Tories were having a reception in the Rosebury Room of the House of Lords in order to launch a crusty old book by a crusty old peer named Lord Butler, and there was a rumour that the newly elected female leader of the Conservative Party would be among those present for the cocktails. I had written a longish article for the New York Times magazine, saying in effect that if Labour could not revolutionise British society, then the task might well fall to the right. I had also written a shorter piece for the New Statesman, reporting from the Conservative Party conference, and saying in passing that I thought Mrs. Thatcher was surprisingly sexy. 
To this day, I've never had so much anger mail, saying, in effect, how could you? I felt immune to Mrs. Thatcher in most other ways, since for all her glib, free market advocacy on one front, she seemed to be an emotional ally of the authoritarian and protectionist white settler regime in Rhodesia, and it was this very thing that afforded me the opportunity to grapple with her so early in her career. At the party was Sir Peregrine Worsthorne, a poised and engaging chap, with whom I'd had many debates in Rhodesia itself, both at the celebrated colonial bar of Meikle's Hotel and in other more rugged locations. I'd even taken him to meet Sir Roy Walensky, the tough old right-wing white trade unionist and former Prime Minister of Rhodesia, who had broken with the treasonous pro-apartheid riffraff around Ian Smith. It's always seemed perfectly simple to me, Mr. Versthorn, this old bulldog growled in the unmistakable accent of the region. If you don't like Blickmin, then don't come and live in Africa. Perry had granted the justice of this, as how could he not, and now felt that he owed me a small service in return. Care to meet the new leader? Who could refuse? Within moments, Margaret Thatcher and I were face to face. Within moments, too, I had turned away and was showing her my buttocks. I suppose that I must give some sort of explanation for this. Almost as soon as we shook hands on immediate introduction, I felt that she knew my name and had perhaps connected it to the Socialist Weekly that had recently called her rather sexy. While she struggled adorably with this moment of pretty confusion, I felt obliged to seek controversy, and picked a fight with her on a detail of Rhodesia's Zimbabwe policy. She took me up on it. I was, as it chances, right, on the small point of fact, and she was wrong. But she maintained her wrongness with such adamantine strength that I eventually conceded the point, and even bowed slightly to emphasize my acknowledgement. No, she said, bow lower. Smiling agreeably, I bent forward a bit further. No, no, she trilled, much lower. By this time, a little group of interested bystanders was gathering. I again bent forward, this time much more self-consciously. Stepping around behind me, she unmasked her batteries and smote me on the rear with the parliamentary order paper that she had been rolling into a cylinder behind her back. I regained the vertical with some awkwardness. As she walked away, she looked back over her shoulder and gave an almost imperceptibly slight roll of the hip while mouthing the words, Naughty boy. I had and have eyewitnesses to this. At the time, though, I hardly believed it myself. It's only from a later perspective, looking back on the manner in which she slaughtered and cowed all the former male leadership of her party and replaced them with pliant tools, that I appreciate the premonitory glimpse of what someone in another context once called the smack of firm government that I had been afforded. Even at the time, as I left that party, I knew I had met someone rather impressive. And the worst of Thatcherism, as I was beginning by degrees to discover, was the rodent slowly stirring in my viscera, the uneasy but unbanishable feeling that on some essential matters she might be right. Portugal to Poland In retrospect, it seems to have been more conscious on my part than perhaps it was at the time, but there came a stage where I took refuge in travel. To adapt what Cavafy says about the barbarians, this was a solution of various kinds. It removed me from a London that was often dank and second-rate. It kindled in me a resolution which I have tried to keep ever since, to spend at least once every year a little time in a country less fortunate than my own. If this doesn't stop you getting fat, it can at least help prevent you from getting too soft. And, in the period I'm writing about, it allowed me to continue seeing the left as a force that was still struggling for first principles against the traditional foes. I would be indignant if anyone were to describe this as romantic, a term that we were especially educated to despise in the international socialists, even though I do now think that there may be more reprehensible words. But if you exempt a solidarity trip that I took to express support for the Icelandic socialists who were fighting to stop British trawlers from hoovering up all their fish, and Iceland is an exotic locale all of its own, with its moonscape interior and geyser-supplied hot water with the ever-present diabolical whiff of sulphur, it is true that the impulse generally led me to the south and to the Mediterranean and to the Levant. One of the many great hopes of 1968 had been to complete the unfinished business of the Second World War, 
and cleanse Spain and Portugal of their antique fascist regimes. Not only had this ambition not been realized, but another dictatorship of the right had been imposed on Greece and then spread with calamitous results to the independent Republic of Cyprus. The drama extended across both sides of the Pillars of Hercules. Franco's Spain made a free gift of its Western Sahara colonial possession to the absolutist monarchy in Morocco, leaving the population voiceless in its own destiny. It also extended to the extreme opposite end of the Mediterranean, where an Israeli-Jewish opposition to the occupation of Palestinian land was beginning to take shape, and where in Lebanon an alliance of secular and Palestinian forces was emerging to challenge the old confession-based hierarchy. A whole anthology of images survives vividly in my mind from this time. A spontaneous riot on the broad Ramblas of Barcelona, after the last ever use of the hideous medieval garrote for the judicial murder of a Catalan anarchist named Salvador Puigantich, the illegal Catalan flag proudly flown, and a shower of gasoline bombs falling on Franco's military police. A journey to Guernica, a place name that I could hardly believe corresponded to an actual living town, to rendezvous with Basque activists. A weekend in the Latin Quarter in Paris, complete with telephone passwords and anonymous handshakes in corner zinc bars, so that I could meet a Portuguese resistance leader named Palma Inácio, who was engaged in organizing an armed battle against the dictatorship in Lisbon. Some long, hot and fragrant days in Tyre and Sidon and points south of Beirut, meeting with militants of the Democratic Front who, over lunch in the olive groves, would patiently explain to me that Jews and Arabs were brothers under the skin, and that only imperialism was really the problem, standing in Freedom Square in Nicosia among a roaring crowd of demonstrators, many of whom had recently fought with gun in hand against the Greek junta's attempt to annex Cyprus, but whose voices could also be heard over the impermeable wall that the invading Turkish army had built right across a free city. I liked all this for its elemental headiness. It seemed to go so well with different blends of wine and raki, but also for its seriousness, politics in these latitudes being a game played for keeps, and for its immediate and intense connection to history. I felt I knew the Ramblers from Orwell's homage to Catalonia. In Algiers, after returning from an expedition with the Polisario guerrillas fighting in the Sahara, I thought I also had at least a vicarious glimpse of the continuation of an old struggle for the soul of North Africa that had once involved Camus and Sartre. As for Cyprus, where I fell so hard in love with the island and the people, and with the very place names, Famagusta, Larnaca, Limassol, Kyrenia, and with one very dramatic and life-altering Cypriot, was not the Philhellenic tradition the very one that had helped revive British radicalism more than a century before? Today I want to puke when I hear the word radical applied so slothfully and stupidly to Islamist murderers, the most plainly reactionary people in the world. The alteration of perspective was the most useful thing. In Northern Europe, it was, roughly speaking, a case of the free West versus the satellite states of the East. In Cyprus, though, the illegal occupying power was a member of NATO. In Portugal, the fascist regime itself was a member of NATO, likewise in the case of Greece. In Spain, the main external relationship of the system was with Washington. Thus, it was possible to meet communists who, in these special circumstances, not only made sense but had heroic records and were respected popular figures. In Cyprus, at a very red flag rally where I was among the platform speakers, I had the distinct honor of shaking the hand of Manolis Gledzos, who had given the signal for revolt in Athens in 1944 by climbing up the Parthenon and tearing the swastika flag from the pediment. Not a bad day's work, I think you'll agree. A comparable, if not equivalent, consideration sometimes applied in the other case. For all his indomitable moral courage, Solzhenitsyn, had already begun to show signs of being an extreme Russian nationalist and partisan of religious orthodoxy. The synthesis for which one aimed was the Orwellian one of evolving a consistent and integral anti-totalitarianism. However, of Comrade Glezos, it also had to be said that he had once run a bookstore in Athens that largely featured the work of Enver Hodge of Albania, possibly the most Aztec-like of all Europe's remaining Stalinists. And I hadn't forgotten the second great promise of 1968, which was that of solidarity with the forces of dissent in the other Europe, the nations of the East and the Baltic, who had been stranded and frozen in time ever since the Yalta Agreement permitted the partition of the continent.
Thus, for me, the three most important episodes from this epoch are the stirrings of revolution in Portugal and in Poland, and the experience of counter-revolution in Argentina. Lusitania Mediterranean though it can feel, Portugal is the only European country that has the Atlantic Ocean lapping around the inner harbour of its capital city. Its amazing mariners took its oddly inflected language as far away as East Timor and Macau, though King Henry, the navigator, probably never actually boarded a ship. As soon as I could manage it after the revolution of April 1974, I arrived ordinarily enough by air and was then told to wait in the customs area. Was I perhaps on some list of undesirables, as I had found myself to be at other airports? A lanky, white-haired official, proffering a card that proclaimed his name to be Vieira da Fonseca, just like the delicious port wine, extended a hand. He was to escort me to a hotel. It appeared that I was an honoured guest. For the first time in my life, I was on a list of desirables. When the files of the former secret police of the salazar Caetano dictatorship had been broken open, it was found that I was listed as a particular foe of the Ancien Régime. Having imagined myself dossing down happily with my comrades on the floor of some left-wing slum apartment, I was promoted to a fairly elevated floor of the Tivoli Hotel on the Avenida Libertad, with a view of the city's captivating harbour. It all seemed too much as if one had suddenly received the profits and dividends of an investment that had barely been made. I formed a private resolution not to become too used to it. But the fall of fascism in Lisbon in April 1974 was the occasion for an almost perfect storm of radical desires. The overthrow of the Caetano dictatorship was not only part of the long-postponed business of cleansing Europe of pre-1939 fascism, it was also a sort of revenge for the destruction in the preceding autumn, on 11th September to be precise, of the Allende government in Chile. There were other happy convergences at work also. With the old gang removed, the grip of Portugal on its African colonies was broken, and this meant not only the emancipation of Angola and Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau, but also an acceleration of the process that would eventually terminate racist rule in Rhodesia and South Africa. Other revolutionary ripple effects might be expected in Portuguese-speaking Brazil, the largest and in some ways the most vicious of the authoritarian military regimes of the southern cone of the Americas, while the effect on neighbouring Spain surely had to be a demoralising one, from the viewpoint of Franco's military and religious allies. A whole series of fault lines radiated away from this Lisbon earthquake, all of them shivering the structures of traditional order, and this was simply to speak politically. The cultural element made it seem as if the best of 1968 was still relevant. One of the precipitating pre-revolutionary moments had been the publication of a feminist manifesto by three women, all of whom were named Maria, and the three Marias became an exciting example of what womanhood could do when faced with a theocratic oligarchy that had treated them as breeding machines not far advanced above the level of chattel. Sex, long repressed, was to be scented very strongly on the wind. I remember in particular the only partly satirical Movimiento da Esquerda Libidinosa, or Movement of the Libidinous Left, with its slogan, Somos un Partido Sexocratico, whose evident objective was the frantic making up of lost time. The best revolutionary poster I saw, perhaps the best I have ever seen, expressed this same thought in a rather less erotic way. It showed a modest Portuguese family in traditional dress, being introduced to a receiving line of new friends who included Socrates, Einstein, Beethoven, Spinoza, Shakespeare, Charlie Chaplin, Louis Armstrong, Karl Marx and Sigmund Freud. There are many people in much richer countries who are still putting off this rendezvous. As well as being a colonial power, Portugal under fascism had managed also to let itself become a semi-colony, whose main export was cheap labour to the rest of Europe, and whose illiteracy rate was about 30%. The resulting division of the country between the boss class and the officer class and the rank and file was very striking. The astounding thing in the mass demonstrations that thronged the Avenida Libertad and the Rossio Square was to see the squads of uniformed young sailors and soldiers joining in with the workers and the students. To my eyes, an almost literal replay of the scenes from Battleship Potemkin or the storming of the Winter Palace. And, once I'd cleared my eyes by drying them, I noticed that the parallel with St. Petersburg could be drawn in other ways too. In 1968, the ferment of revolution had taken the ossified French Communist Party completely aback, forcing it in effect to line up with de Gaulle. 
This it had done partly to protect its position as the party of order, and partly to obey Soviet instructions that the anti-NATO and anti-American regime of the Gaullists be left as far as possible unmolested. In Portugal, no such inhibitions were in play, because the old order had irretrievably vanished like breath off a razor blade, and there was a good old-fashioned power vacuum, or, as we used to say in factional meetings, a situation of dual power. Workers' committees were forming embryo Soviets. Soldiers' and sailors' collectives had whole ships and regiments under their temporary command. Landless workers in the countryside were taking over abandoned farms and properties. There were two things to notice about this. One was that hardly a shot was fired. The Portuguese may have exported a good deal of their violence overseas to Africa, but in the country itself the rhythms were, when compared to neighboring Spain, say, remarkably gentle. As a possible metaphor, in Portuguese bullfights the bull is not tortured or killed. The matador tests only his own agility and bravery against the noble beast. The second thing to absorb was that behind all the spontaneity and eroticism and generalized festival of the oppressed merrymaking, a grim-faced communist apparat was making preparations for an end to the revels and a serious seizure of the state. The USSR is the sun in our universe, proclaimed Alvaro Cunhal, leader of the Portuguese Stalinists, who'd returned from exile in Moscow to direct operations. The tactics were more those of 1948 in Prague than St. Petersburg in 1917, consisting of the slow acquisition of positions in the army and the police, and the application of what used to be called salami tactics against other parties. The Portuguese Socialist Party enjoyed the support of a majority of the people, so it was not by coincidence that one of its main newspapers, La Repubblica, became the target of a spontaneous takeover by the print workers, which their communist union bosses endorsed as if butter would not melt in their mouths. Nor was it by coincidence that the Chemical Workers' Union, which had a latent socialist majority among its membership, found some of its communist officials oddly reluctant to hold a ballot. The emergency nationalization of the banks meant opportunities in a state that had formerly been corporatist and monopolistic. For the bureaucratic new class to become the owners of large tracts of Africa, and the proprietors of seats on the boards of newspapers and television stations. The leader of the Socialist Party, Mario Suarez, a man who I would normally have regarded as a pallid and compromising social democrat, summarized the situation with some pith. I still have the question he put to me, double underlined in my notebook from Lisbon. If the army officers are so much on the side of the people, why do they not put on civilian clothes? It was a question not just for that moment. I began to be extremely downcast by the failure, or was it refusal, of my international socialist comrades to see what was staring them right in the face. Intoxicated by the admittedly very moving attempts at personal liberation and social self-management, they could not or would not appreciate how much of this was being manipulated by a dreary conformist sect with an ultimate loyalty to Russia. Thus I found myself one evening in late March 1975 at a huge rally in the Campo Pequeño bullring in Lisbon, organized by the distinctly cautious Socialist Party, but with the invigorating slogan, Socialismo si, dictatura now. The whole arena was a mass of red flags, and the other chants echoed the original one. There were calls for the right of chemical workers to vote, a banner that read down with social fascism, and another that expressed my own views almost perfectly in respect of foreign intervention in Portugal, Nem Kishinger, Nem Brezhnev. I took my old friend Colin McCabe along to this event. For his numberless sins, he was at the time a member of the Communist Party, and at first employed an old Maoist catchphrase, waving the red flag to oppose the red flag, to dismiss what he was seeing. But gradually he became more impressed, and as the evening began to crystallize, he unbent so far as to say, sometimes the wrong people can have the right line. I thought then that he'd said more than he intended, and myself experienced the remark as a sort of emancipation from the worry which did still occasionally nag at me, that by taking up some out-of-line position, I would find myself in bed with, as the saying went, unsavory elements. It's good to throw off this sort of moral blackmail and mind-forged manacle as early in life as one can. Colin, who went on to become a distinguished author of books on James Joyce and Jean-Luc Godard, years later called me from China, where Deng Xiaoping had just announced that his reforms would mean that all would get richer, but some would get richer than others. So, it looks as if your pal Orwell was onto something after all. I thought that was a handsome enough concession. It was rather a poor return when his friend, the grim and fraudulent Stalinist philosopher, 
Louis Althusser was convicted of murdering his wife. For me to say, I see Comrade Althusser has been awarded the electric chair of philosophy at the École Abnormale. The sequel takes very little time to tell. The communists and their ultra-left allies hopelessly overplayed their hand by trying for a barracks-based coup. The more traditional and rural and religious elements of Portuguese society rose in an indignant counter-revolution. A sort of equilibrium was restored and... E finita la comedia. The young radicals who'd come from all over Europe to a feast of sex and sunshine and anti-politics folded their tents and doffed their motley and went home. It was the last fall of the curtain on the last act of the 68 style, with its take-your-desires-for-reality wall posters and its concept of work as play. For me, it was also the end of the line with my old group of skill. I had developed other disagreements too, as the old and open-minded international socialists began to mutate into a more party-line sect. But Portugal had broken the mainspring for me, because it had caused me to understand that I thought democracy and pluralism were good things in themselves, and ends in themselves at that, rather than means to another end. In his superb collection of essays, Writers and Politics, which influenced me enormously when I first found it in a public library in Devonshire in 1967, Conor Cruz O'Brien had phrased it better than I could then hope to do. Are you a socialist? asked the African leader. I said, yes. He looked me in the eye. People have been telling me, he said, lightly, that you are a liberal. The statement in its context invited a denial. I said nothing. And yet, as I drove home from my interview with the leader, I had to realize that a liberal, incurably, was what I was. Whatever I might argue, I was more profoundly attached to liberal concepts of freedom, freedom of speech and of the press, academic freedom, independent judgment and independent judges, than I was to the idea of a disciplined party mobilizing all the forces of society for the creation of a social order, guaranteeing more real freedom for all, instead of just for a few. The revolutionary idea struck me as more immediately relevant for most of humanity than were the liberal concepts. But it was the liberal concepts and their long-term importance, though not the name of liberal, that held my allegiance. One can read such things and understand and even appreciate them, and one can undergo experiences that recall one to the original text as if in confirmation. I cite O'Brien, not as an argument from authority, for I was to have many disputes with him down the years, but as a man of considerable mind, who brilliantly summarized the contradictions with which I had been living, and with which in many ways I was condemned to go on coexisting for some time to come. O'Brien's definition of liberalism as a position that made the rich world yawn and the poor world sick is a phrasing that older readers may remember, if only because of Phil Oakes's bitingly satirical song, Love Me, I'm a Liberal. Arrested once in Oxford for disrupting a cricket match with an apartheid South African cricket team, I was able to get myself acquitted of the police frame-up because a bystander came forward and offered himself as an impartial witness. He was a highly respectable citizen and cricket watcher and treasurer of the local Liberal Party. Attending the trial and after giving his testimony, he saw me refuse to take my oath on the Bible and heard me tell the bench as my reason that I was an atheist and a Marxist. After the hearing was over, he came up to me and said that if he had known that I was that kind of person, he would never have volunteered to testify. For many years, this well-meaning but invertebrate figure was my ideal type of the liberal mentality, and he still comes back to me at odd moments. Liberté à la Polonaise I was to have the same contrasts emphasized for me in a different way at the opposite end of Europe over the Christmas of 1976. The previous summer, I had been very intrigued by reports of a small-scale but suggestive workers' revolt in communist Poland, where party property and several stretches of railway line had been extensively damaged in rioting against a sudden announcement from on high of a steep rise in the price of food. Some protesters had been killed and the rest dispersed and several put on trial. Nothing exceptional in that, but a new element had intruded itself. Petitions had been circulating in Warsaw, soliciting money for a legal defense of the accused workers. Voices had been raised, demanding an inquiry into the conduct of the police and militia during the disturbances. Was it possible that, twenty years after the Polish Spring of 1956, the germinal of another movement from below was underway? Interviewing one of the former leaders of the Portuguese fascist system, Dr. Franco Nogueira, in his office at the amazingly titled Banco Spiritu Santo e Comercial, Bank of the Holy Spirit and Commerce, its grotesque moniker partly explained by a family name, 
I had been informed by him that it was relatively easy to keep Portugal and its people contained and under control, because the country was peculiar in Europe in only having one land frontier. Poland's problem is the exact opposite. It is condemned by geography to live between Germany and Russia, and has been repeatedly invaded, occupied, and partitioned. Not an entirely blameless country, its forces took part in the dismemberment of Czechoslovakia after the British sellout in Munich. In 1939, it was attacked and overrun by both Hitler and Stalin, acting in concert. Its borders were redrawn again after 1945. I was late in life to discover that those frontier territories had been the home of my mother's ancestors. And in 1976, the eventual results of the Hitler-Stalin rapacity could be seen in a dingy Russian-backed communist bureaucracy sitting atop a sullen and strongly Catholic people who perhaps only agreed with their rulers in distrusting federal Germany. An old national chestnut asks the question, if the Russians and Germans both attack again, who do you shoot first? Answer, the Germans, business before pleasure. You can also deduce something about a Pole who answers this question the other way around. My business, however, was not with the communists or the nationalists, but with the democrats and the internationalists. At the time, these seemed to be about ten or twenty in number, barely enough to constitute a minion had they been Jewish, which a few of them, however secular and non-Zionist, actually were. The one I most wished to meet was Jacek Kuron, author of the Trotskyist Manifesto Against the Regime that I'd so eagerly hawked around Oxford. He was still going, and strongly at that, in a tiny apartment much invigilated by the Ube, or Polish secret police. Out of this cell of an apartment and other cells like it, was to come a replicating system, the Workers' Defense Committee, Komitet Obrodny Robotnikov, or KOR, which would eventually multiply and divide and evolve, perhaps paradoxically, into something more basic and simple, the elementary word and movement Solidarność, or Solidarity. Rabbi Tarfon says somewhere that the task can never be quite completed, yet one has no right to give it up. Of the comrades I met that bleak winter, many of them veterans of the extremely nasty Polish prison system, none really expected to make more than a small dent in the regime. Yet to an outsider like myself there did seem to be a faint nimbus of optimism, visible on the very edge of a dark and cold star. It was, to put it another way, quite astonishing to see how much, and to what an extent, the party state depended on lies. Small lies and big lies, petty lies hardly worth telling, that would shame a nose-picking, whining, guilty child, and huge lies that would cause a hardened blackmailer and perjurer to blush a bit. To give an example of the paltry sort, the Chilean communist leader Luis Corvalan had recently been swapped in a piece of overt Cold War horse trading for the Soviet dissident Vladimir Bukowski. No evident disgrace in that, perhaps, but the Polish communist press insisted only on reporting the release of Corvalan, and only as the outcome of a campaign of international proletarian solidarity. In a time of BBC and other broadcasts, and with many Poles having family overseas, the chances of such a falsification being believed were exactly nil. Yet such crass falsification was the everyday currency of the Polish media. On the macro scale, it was still officially true that the mass graves of Katyn across the Belarus border, in which the corpses of tens of thousands of Polish officers had been hastily interred in the 1940s, were the responsibility of the Nazis, but there simply wasn't a single person in the whole of Poland who credited this disgusting untruth. Not even those paid to spread it believed it. The British Foreign Office may be an exception here. Its bureaucrats continued to spout the lie, born of the wartime alliance with Stalin, until the Soviet Union beat them to it under Mikhail Gorbachev and officially accepted responsibility for Katyn in 1990. My American Trotskyist girlfriend and I had been told by friends that the thing to take to Warsaw was blue jeans, which had totemic value on the black market. We accordingly packed several old, patched, worn-out pairs. We scrounged a bed from my old Oxford comrade Christopher Babinski, who was just then beginning his stellar career as a reporter from his homeland. As an interpreter, he provided us with the lovely Barbara Kopech, who held down a daytime job in the Palace of Culture that dominated the main square of the city. It had been built as a personal gift from Joseph Stalin to the people of Poland, and in its form and shape expressed all the good taste and goodwill that such benevolence might have implied. It wasn't much fun working inside the building, as Barbara remarked, but at least it meant she didn't have to look at the damn thing. 
When we went to meet Yatsa Kuron in his tiny and cluttered apartment, this tough and stocky fellow punctured one of my illusions right away by saying that he no longer had any illusions about Trotskyism. The real terrain of struggle was for democratic liberties and the rule of law. And even as we spoke, we were continually reminded of the distance to be travelled toward that goal. At regular intervals, Huron's phone would ring, and he would be subjected to spontaneous abuse. In an effort to spook him, a death threat had been anonymously delivered with a countdown of a hundred days. It stood at sixty-five to go on the day of our visit. And the besetting sin of Polish public life, anti-Semitism, was in evidence as well. He showed and read me a violently Jew-hating letter, sent to him by registered mail. The sender had then delivered another letter, this time by hand, confessing that the first missive had been dictated to him in a police station. This showed a real sickness in the communist system, not just because of the use of bigotry as a provocation, but because anti-Semitism had historically always been used by the Polish right wing against the Reds. It took real calcified cynicism to employ such a weapon of reaction against dissent. It would have been even nastier if Jacek Kuren had actually been Jewish, but the fact is that he wasn't. Polish and other Jew baiters have been known to operate without possessing the raw material of any actual Jews to work with. In their pedantic way, the post-war communists had tried to rebuild Warsaw as an exact replica of its pre-war self. Some of this was soulless and dull, but there was heavy snow that Christmas, and I found the icy city rather hypnotizing. We went to the nearby township of Kazimierz, once a center of Jewish life before the nearly clean sweep that had been made of Polish Jewry. We attended a midnight mass in Vilanov, where the congregation was so densely packed that it spilled out of doors, with worshippers kneeling in the drifts. I could not understand much of the sermon, but it didn't seem to be delivered in the emetic, emollient tones of the Second Vatican Council. Polish Catholicism, often a historic ally of extremist politics, also had its collaborationist side, with a semi-official group known as Pax Christi, sitting in the rubber stamp parliament. But that Christmas, Cardinal Wyszynski gave a rather decent and spirited sermon, making quite strong statements about the repression of strikers. Everybody got to hear about it, but the official press didn't report a single line of the homily, thus underlining yet again the self-defeating character of lying and censorship. Self-sabotaging might be a better term. One of the strikes in the port city of Stettin had been provoked when the shipyard workers read in the Communist Party paper that they had all volunteered to work longer hours in the interests of production. One of the leaders of that strike, a man named Edmund Baluka, later told me that he'd been sent as a soldier into Czechoslovakia during the Warsaw Pact aggression of August 1968. He had been told, and had believed, that he was going to repel a West German invasion of Prague. Discovering a complete absence of Germans in the country, except for East German soldiers who were also taking part in the Russian-sponsored occupation, had destroyed his entire faith in anything the party ever said. Baluka, too, was for some time to associate himself with Trotskyism. Our young friends in the KOR invited us for a Christmas Eve feast in a cold but cheery apartment. There was a great deal to eat and drink, but I suddenly noticed with an inner qualm that everything, every loaf and sausage and cheese and bottle, was the last third or quarter of itself. It was clear that in the interests of hospitality, all the odds and ends and saved up leftovers were being deployed. I was glad to be able to produce the parcel of blue jeans. And I don't remember a gift ever going over so well. Are you sure you can spare all of these, we were asked, as if we were parting with a fortune? On the black market, this can raise a huge amount for the committee. There was also the eagerly discussed hope that KOR could start an underground publishing house to print, among other things, the works of George Orwell. This did later happen with the Samizdat imprint called Nova. Even so, and keen as I was on the latter idea especially, I urged them to keep back at least something of our gift for themselves. They remained self-denyingly serious, though I think it was decided that Barbara should have a pair of her very own, if only to show off a bit of style in the Stalinist wedding cake that was her office building. In later years, as the strikes burgeoned and spread, and as the Polish working class outlived both the Polish Communist Party and, as in Portugal, the attempt of that party to stay in power by using the army, I like to imagine those blue jeans as having acted as one of the pebbles that began the historical avalanche. My ability to carry my liquor was very useful on that trip, as it has been on several other voyages. The hearteningly jovial and inspiring evening ended with a drinking bout challenge to me from a young comrade named Witold. Two lines of shot glasses were ranged down each side of the dining table, 
and filled to the brim with different flavors of Polish vodka, including my then-favorite Zubrovka, tinted a palish green by the buffalo grass that grows in the east of the country. The last man to the finish line was a sissy. I do not actually remember whether I beat Vitold or whether it was a dead heat, but I remember a rush of pride at his fraternal embrace, and also his exclaiming, Christophe, tu es un vrai Polonais. It was a title of honor. This trip was also to yield me another of those life-altering aperçus. It came from Adam Miknik, one of the founders of the KOR, and later one of the chief intellectuals of Solidarność, and later still, and to this day, a leading figure in the academic and publishing life of his country. When I met him, he was already a veteran of numerous victimizations and imprisonments. His troubles had begun in 1966 when he was expelled from the university for organizing a seminar for Professor Leszek Kolakowski. Having a Jewish father but not a Jewish mother, he could easily have passed but preferred to describe himself as a Pole of Jewish descent. He was then definitely of the secular left and had been impressed by the way that in Franco Spain, Civil society had been able to build up parallel institutions that could gradually and organically replace a deliquescent absolutist state. This was very much the model that many of Poland's oppositionists were to follow. I mentioned to him at our first meeting that Jacek Kuron thought the next wave of protests wouldn't be very socialistic, because the word had been so much discredited by communist rule. Miknik wasn't so sure. After all, he said, freedom and democracy are words that have been discredited by governments as well, but we do not abandon them for that reason. The real struggle for us is for the citizen to cease to be the property of the state. I knew as I wrote it down and underlined it that that last sentence was a pregnant one, that its implications for all political positions were enormous, and that in order to stay true to the principle, once again the principle of consistent anti-totalitarianism, one might have to expose oneself to steadily mounting contradictions. I was to see Adam Miknik on and off through the long transformation of Poland and watch him emerge as an honored historian and politician as well as the editor of perhaps the country's most respected newspaper, Gazeta Wyborska, which had begun life as an illegal strike sheet. One of the juiciest pleasures of life is to be able to salute and embrace as elected leaders and honored representatives, people who you first met when they were on the run or in exile or, like Adam, in and out of jail. I was to have this experience again, and I hope to have it many more times in the future. It sometimes allows me to feel that life is full of point. Argentina. Death and Disappearance and an Infinite Library. At a lunchtime reception for the diplomatic corps in Washington, given the day before the inauguration of Barack Obama as president, I was approached by a good-looking man who extended his hand. We once met many years ago, he said, and you knew and befriended my father. My mind emptied, as so often happens on such occasions. I had to inform him that he had the advantage of me. My name is Hector Timmerman. I am the ambassador of Argentina. In my above album of things that seem to make life pointful and worthwhile, and that even occasionally suggest in Dr. King's phrase, as often cited by President Obama, that there could be a long arc in the moral universe that slowly eventually bends towards justice, this would constitute an exceptional entry. It was also something more than a nudge to my memory. There was a time when the name of Jacobo Timmerman, the kidnapped and tortured editor of the newspaper La Opinion in Buenos Aires, was a talismanic one. The mere mention of it was enough to elicit moans of obscene pleasure from every fascist south of the Rio Grande. Finally, in Argentina, there was a strict new order that would stamp hard upon the international communist Jewish collusion. A little later, the mention of Timmerman's case was enough to derail the nomination of Ronald Reagan's first nominee as Undersecretary for Human Rights, a man who didn't seem to have grasped the point that neo-Nazism was a problem for American values. And Timmerman's memoir, Prisoner Without a Name, Cell Without a Number, was the book above all that clothed in living, hurting flesh the necessarily abstract idea of the desaparecido, the disappeared one, or to invest it with the more sinister and grisly past participle with which it came into the world, the one who has been disappeared. In the nuances of that past participle, many, many people vanished into a void that is still unimaginable. It became one of the key words, along with Esquadrone de la Muerte, or death squads, of another arc, this time of radical evil, that spanned a whole subcontinent. Do you know why General Jorge Rafael Videla of Argentina was eventually sentenced? Well, do you? 
because he sold the children of the tortured rape victims who were held in his private prison. I could italicize every second word in that last sentence without making it any more heart-stopping. And this subhuman character was boasted of as a personal friend and genial host, even after he'd been removed from the office he had defiled, by none other than Henry Kissinger. So there was an almost hygienic effect in meeting in a new Washington as an envoy of an elected government, the son of the brave man who had both survived and exposed the Vidal tyranny. I had four ambitions when I disembarked in the extravagantly lovely city of Buenos Aires in December of 1977. The first was to see if I could discover what had happened to Jacobo Timmerman. The second was to interview the president, who was then General Videla. The third was to see the Pampas, and the fourth was to meet my literary hero, Jorge Luis Borges. I failed, though not completely, with the first, and I succeeded with the other three, though not in quite the ways I had anticipated. Clichés as the late William Sapphire was fond of saying, should be avoided like the plague. Yet one stale journalistic standby, the pall of fear hanging over the city, seemed to be warranted. People spoke to foreigners with an averted gaze, and everybody seemed to know somebody who had just vanished. The rumours of what had happened to them were fantastic and bizarre, though, as it turned out, they were only an understatement of the real thing. Before going to see General Videla in Peron's old pink presidential palace at the Casa Rosada, I went to deliver some letters from Amnesty International to a local human rights group and also to check in with Los Madres, the black-draped mothers who paraded every week with pictures of their missing loved ones in the Plaza Mayor. Todo mi familia, as one elderly lady kept telling me imploringly as she flourished their photographs. Todo mi familia. From these and from other relatives and friends I got a line of questioning to put to the general. I would be told by him, they forewarned me, that people disappeared all the time, either because of traffic accidents and family quarrels or, in the dire civil war circumstances of Argentina, because of the wish to drop out of a gang and the need to avoid one's former associates. But this was a cover story. Most of those who disappeared were openly taken away in the unmarked Ford Falcon cars of the Buenos Aires military police. I should inquire of the general what precisely had happened to Claudia Inez Grunberg, a paraplegic who was unable to move on her own, but who had last been seen in the hands of his ever-vigilant armed forces. Escorted into Videla's presence, I justified my politeness and formality by telling myself that I wasn't there to make points, but to elicit facts. I possess a picture of the encounter that still makes me want to spew. There stands the killer and torturer and rape profiteer, as if to illustrate some seminar on the banality of evil. Bony, thin, and mediocre in appearance, with a scrubby moustache, he looks for all the world like a cretin impersonating a toothbrush. I am gripping his hand in a much too unctuous manner and smiling as if genuinely delighted at the introduction. Aching to expunge this humiliation, I waited while he went almost pedantically through the predicted script, waving away the rumoured but doubtless regrettable dematerializations that were said to be afflicting his fellow Argentines. And then I asked him about Senorita Grunberg. He replied that if what I had said was true, then I should remember that Terrorism is not just killing with a bomb, but activating ideas. Maybe that's why she's detained. I expressed astonishment at this reply, and evidently thinking that I hadn't understood him the first time, Videla enlarged on the theme. We consider it a great crime to work against the Western and Christian style of life. It is not just the bomber, but the ideologist who is the danger. Behind him I could see one or two of his brighter staff officers looking at me with stark hostility, as they realized that the general, El Presidente, had made a mistake by speaking so candidly. I was later to find that I was being followed around the city, which caused me many a fearful moment. In response to a follow-up question, Videla crassly denied rotondamente, roundly denied, holding Jacobo Timmerman as either a journalist or a Jew. While we were having this surreal exchange, here is what Timmerman was being told by his taunting tormentors. Argentina has three main enemies, Karl Marx because he tried to destroy the Christian concept of society. Sigmund Freud, because he tried to destroy the Christian concept of the family, and Albert Einstein, because he tried to destroy the Christian concept of time and space. Punctuated by thrusts of the cattle prod, it wasn't difficult to determine the direction that such a clerical fascist interrogation was taking. And Senorita Grunberg, too, was a Jew. We later discovered what happened to the majority of those who had been held and tortured in the secret prisons of the regime. According to a Navy captain named Adolfo Silingo, who published a book of confessions, 
These broken victims were often destroyed as evidence by being flown out way over the wastes of the South Atlantic and flung from airplanes into the freezing water below. Imagine the fun element when there's the surprise bonus of a Jewish female prisoner in a wheelchair to be disposed of. We slide open the door, get ready to roll her, and then it's one, two, three, go. Many governments employ torture, but this was the first time that the element of Saturnalia and pornography in the process had been made so clear to me. If you care to imagine what any inadequate or cruel man might do given unlimited power over a woman, then anything that you can bring yourself to suspect was what became routine in ESMA, the Navy Mechanics School that became the headquarters of the business. I talked to Dr. Emilio Mignone, a distinguished physician whose daughter Monica had disappeared into the precincts of that hellish place. What do you find to say to a doctor and a humanitarian who's been gutted by the image of a starving rat being introduced to his daughter's genitalia? Like hell itself, the school was endorsed and blessed by priests in case any stray consciences needed to be stilled. The Catholic chaplain of ESMA, Father Christian von Wernick, was three decades later convicted of direct complicity in murder, torture, and abduction. The papal nuncio, later to become Cardinal Pio Laghi, was the sleek tennis partner of Admiral Emilio Massera, the supervising member of the Argentine Navy's whole sadistic enterprise. Here's Timmerman again on the details and elaborations of his own electric shock torture. Now they're really amused and burst into laughter. Someone tries a variation while still clapping hands. Clip prick, clip prick whereupon they begin alternating while clapping their hands. Jew, clip-prick, Jew, clip-prick. It seems they're no longer angry, merely having a good time. I keep bouncing in the chair and moaning as the electric shocks penetrate. And here he is again, on a truly ingenious element of the inferno, when suspects are brought in and tortured en famille, and where the entire affective world, constructed over the years with utmost difficulty, collapses with a kick in the father's genitals a smack on the mother's face, an obscene insult to the sister or the sexual violation of a daughter. Suddenly an entire culture based on familial love, devotion, the capacity for mutual sacrifice, collapses. Nothing is possible in such a universe, and that is precisely what the torturers know. From my cell I'd hear the whispered voices of children trying to learn what was happening to their parents, and I'd witness the efforts of daughters to win over a guard, to arouse a feeling of tenderness in him, to incite the hope of some lovely future relationship between them, in order to learn what was happening to her mother, to get an orange sent to her, to get permission for her to go to the bathroom. I borrow Jacobo's words here because they're crystalline, authentic, and because my own would be no good. Flaubert was right when he said that our use of language is like a cracked kettle on which we bang out tunes for bears to dance to, while all the time we need to move the very stars to pity. For all its outwardly easy Latin charm, Buenos Aires was making me feel sick and upset, so I did take that trip to the Great Plains, where the gaucho epics had been written, and I did manage to eat a couple of the famous asados, the Argentine barbecue fiesta, once summarized by Martin Amos's John Self as a sort of triple mixed grill swaddled in steaks, with its slavish propitiation of the sizzling gods of cholesterol. Yet even this was spoiled for me. My hosts did their own slaughtering and the smell of drying blood from the abattoir became too much for some reason. I actually went off stake for a good few years after this trip. Then, from the intrepid Robert Cox of the Buenos Aires Herald, I learned another jaunty fascist colloquialism. Before the South Atlantic dumping method was adopted, the secret cremation of maimed and tortured bodies at the Navy School had been called an asado. In my youth I was quite often accused, and perhaps not unfairly, of being too politicized and of trying to import politics into all discussions. I would reply that it wasn't my fault if politics kept on invading the private sphere, and in the case of Argentina at any rate, I think I was right. The miasma of the dictatorship pervaded absolutely everything, not excluding the imperatives and the main course. It even made its sickening way into the bookish, secluded atmosphere of apartment 6B on Calle Maipu 994, just off the Plaza San Martin, where lived Jorge Luis Borges. I was extremely shy of approaching my hero, but he, as I found out, was sorely in need of company. By then almost completely blind, he was claustrated and even a little confused, and this may help explain the rather shocking attitude that he took to the blunt trauma that was being inflicted in the streets and squares around him. This was my country and it might be yet, he intoned to me when the topic first came up, as it had to. But something came between it and the sun. This couplet, 
he claimed, I have never been able to locate it, was from Edmund Blunden, whose gnarled hand I had been so excited to shake all those years ago. But it was not the Videla Junta that Borges meant by the illusion. It was the pre-existing rule of Juan Perón, which he felt had depraved and corrupted Argentine society. I didn't disagree with this at all, and Perón had victimized Borges's mother and sister, as well as having Borges himself fired from his job at the National Library. But it was nonetheless sad to hear the old man saying that he heartily preferred the new uniformed regime as being one of gentlemen as opposed to pimps. This was a touch like listening to Evelyn War, his most liverish and bufferish. It was also partly redeemed by a piece of learned philology or etymology concerning the Buenos Aires dockside slang for pimp, canfin flero. A canfin fire, you see, said Borges with perfect composure, is a pussy, or more exactly a cunt. So a canfin flero is a trafficker in cunt in Anglo-Saxon, we might say a cunter. Had not the very tango itself been evolved in a brothel in 1880? Borges could talk indefinitely about this sort of thing, perhaps in revenge for having had an over-solicitous mother who tyrannized him all his life. He wanted me to read aloud to him, and this I gladly did. I most remember his request for Kipling's Harp Song of the Dane Women, a poem that employs mainly Anglo-Saxon and Norse words. Borges's own talk was spiced with terms like folk and kin, and which opens so beautifully and hauntingly with the Viking wives as they are keening, what is a woman that you forsake her, and the hearth fire, and the homemaker, to go with that old grey widow maker? For every author and topic, Borges had a crisp summation. G. K. Chesterton, such a pity he became a Catholic. Kipling, unappreciated because too many of his peers were socialists. It's a shame we have to choose between two such second rate countries as the USA and the USSR. The hours I spent in this anachronistic bibliophile, anglophile retreat were in surreal contrast to the shrieking horror show that was being enacted in the rest of the city. I never felt this more acutely than when, having manoeuvred the old boy down the spiral staircase for a rare out-of-doors lunch the next day, terrified of letting him slip and tumble, I got him back upstairs again. He invited me back for even more readings the following morning, but I had to decline. I pleaded truthfully that I was booked on a plane for Chile. I am so sorry, said this courteous old genius, but may I then offer you a gift in return for your company? I naturally protested, with all the energy of an English middle-class upbringing. Couldn't hear of such a thing. Pleasure and privilege all mine. No question of accepting any present. He stilled my burblings with an upraised finger. You will remember, he said, the lines I will now speak. You will always remember them. And he then recited the following. What man has bent o'er his son's sleep to brood? How that face shall watch his when cold it lies? Or thought, as his own mother kissed his eyes, of what her kiss was when his father wooed. The title, Sonnet 29 of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Inclusiveness, may sound a trifle sickly, but the enfolded thought recurred to me more than once after I became a father, and Borges was quite right. I've never had to remind myself of the words. I was mumbling my thanks when he said, again with utter composure, While you were in Chile, do you plan to call on General Pinochet? I replied with what I hoped was equivalent to Plom, that I had no such intention. A pity, came the response. He is a true gentleman. He was recently kind enough to award me a literary prize. It wasn't the ideal note on which to bid Borges farewell, but it was an excellent illustration of something else I was becoming used to noticing, that in contrast or corollary to what Colin McCabe had said to me in Lisbon, sometimes it was also the right people who took the wrong line. In justice to Borges, it has to be added that a few years later he came to realize that he had been duped by the junta and did sign a rather courageous petition about the desaparecidos. Men like him often, and in spite of their inclinations, have a natural gold standard when it comes to questions of principle. Two small sequels complete this episode in my life, which turned out to be a sort of hinge. After returning to London via Chile, I wrote a longish report for the New Statesman about the American-backed dictatorships of the Southern Cone. This drew two invitations. The first came from Kai Bird, writing on behalf of Victor Navasky, the new editor of The Nation magazine in New York. My article was much admired at their office. Might I consider writing for them in the future? Dear Ms. Bird, I ignorantly wrote back to the future Pulitzer Prize historian and biographer, readily accepting his offer. The second invitation was from my old comrade, Denis Matyashek, 
by now renamed McShane because the BBC wouldn't let him use an unpronounceable Polish name on the air, and also by then the leader of the National Union of Journalists. Would I speak with him at a public meeting to enlighten all the reporters who'd be covering the upcoming Soccer World Cup in Argentina and to encourage them to make inquiries about the human rights situation? Naturally I would, I replied to Tony Blair's future Deputy Foreign Minister. If there was one thing of which my Argentine experience had convinced me, it was that for all its hackery and cynicism, the profession of journalism did still have its aspect of nobility. Jacobo Timmerman, some time after his release, was to praise Robert Cox of the English language Buenos Aires Herald as a natural English gentleman. Timmerman himself struck me as a vivid example of the great tradition of secular Jewish descent. Both had testified to the health of the written word and its salutary effect upon diseased and disordered societies. I was renewed in believing in what I wanted to do. The McShane-sponsored Solidarity Evening came. I made my pitch and told my tales. The turnout was good. The questions were of a fairly high standard, and then up got a man in a three-piece suit who, in a very plummy accent, identified himself with a double-barreled name. Here it comes, I thought. There's always some bleeding Tory trying to put a veneer on military rule. The gentleman proceeded to give high praise to my speech. He underlined the fascistic nature of the junta and went on to call attention to its aggressive design on the Falkland Islands, where lived an ancient community of British farmers and fishermen. In 1978, this didn't seem to be a geopolitical detail of any consuming interest, but I do remember agreeing with him that when challenged about its own depredations, the Argentine right invariably tried to change the subject to the injustice of British possession of the Falklands, or Las Malvinas, as they were known locally. As a consequence, I was invited to an evening event thrown by the Falkland Alliance Committee in the garden of Lincoln's Inn. I asked if I might bring my father, who had himself briefly been stationed on this desolate archipelago. The reception was a distinct success, if somehow quaint in its almost antique Englishness. I've often noticed that nationalism is at its strongest at the periphery. Hitler was Austrian, Bonaparte Corsican. In post-war Greece and Turkey, the two most prominent ultra-right nationalists had both been born in Cyprus. The most extreme Irish Republicans are in Belfast and Derry, and Boston and New York. Sun Yat-sen, father of Chinese nationalism, was from Hong Kong. The Serbian extremists Milosevic and Karadzic were from Montenegro, and their most incendiary Croat counterparts in the Ustasha tended to hail from the frontier lands of Western Herzegovina. Falkland's nationalism was too mild to stand comparison with any of these toxic movements, but the loyalist atmosphere on the lawn that night, with a navy band playing and ancient settler families inquiring after one another's descendants, was of an unquestioning and profound and rooted kind that one almost never encountered in the rest of a declining and anxious Britain. It was a bit much even for Commander Hitchens, who privately thought the islands slightly absurd and probably undefendable. When the time came when his old Royal Navy was sinking and shattering the Argentine fleet, the cadet school of which was a training camp for torture and rape, I was one of the very few socialists to support Mrs. Thatcher, and he was one of the very few Tories to doubt the wisdom of the enterprise. So it goes. I may seem to be getting ahead of my story here. It can happen, to the best and the worst raconteur. But in fact, the remaining short time of my life in England was becoming more and more overshadowed by that same Iron Lady. I didn't really like anything about her except, that is, for the most important thing about her, which was that she was a conviction politician. In the Labour Party, this sort of principled character had effectively ceased to exist. The closing years of old Labour in Britain were years laced with corruption, cynicism, emollience and drift. I tried my best to maintain my old commitment, but the effort was too much. In the area where I did my actual work, the printing trade unions were not much better than a protection racket for a privileged guild. In the rest of the country, Labour had become a status quo party, hostile to the union with Europe, suspicious of technological innovation, inward-looking and envious. Striking workers were too easily emboldened because they were inconveniencing not the capitalist and the owner and the scab, but the vulnerable remainder of the working public. My last-ditch moment, though, was the official defence of torture in Northern Ireland. Labour's responsible minister in the province, a bullying dwarf named Roy Mason, had both denied and excused, perhaps you notice how the denial is so often the preface to the justification, the use of atrocious methods. Everybody knows the creepy excuses that are always involved here. Terrorism must be stopped, lives are at stake, the ticking bomb must be intercepted. That after so many years of unhappy engagement with Ireland, 
we should imagine that torture should be given another try, and that I should know people in the government who would defend it. I had a friend losing a tearful dinner with a brilliant young junior minister who would not repudiate methods that were bursting the eardrums and fracturing the limbs of Irish prisoners. In the election campaign of 1979, I wrote as much as I could about this for the New Statesman. The election itself had been precipitated by a vote of confidence in the House of Commons when the Irish left and Republican members had furiously refused to vote to keep Labour in office. To this day, I find many habitual Labour supporters have succeeded in forgetting that shame. I was in the press gallery that night, and I remember thinking that it would be a long time before there was another Labour government, and that if it came to that, I didn't really care. Decades earlier, in some essays boldly titled Origins of the Present Crisis, that had been one of the founding documents of the New Left, Perry Anderson and Tom Nairn had anatomized the British disease as that of an intransigent ancien regime, whose pathologies were as much institutional as economic. A stringently Marxist conclusion from this would have been that if Labour and the Left could not or would not confront the ossification of the past, then the historic task would fall to a newly dynamic right. Christopher Hill was later to say to me, half admiringly, that Mrs. Thatcher had not just chosen to face down the outmoded syndicalism of the trade unions, but had also taken on corporate state ideas among business people and picked fights with the House of Lords, the ancient universities, the traditional Conservative Party, the Church of England, and even the House of Windsor. Moreover, in the two most hidebound areas of old-style British authority, Northern Ireland and Southern Rhodesia, she was also able to enforce some of the constitutional revolutions that old Labour had been too cowardly and too deferential to impose. She went balmy in the end and even attempted to keep the Berlin Wall as a part of the status quo, but at the time she made me suffer from the same Odai et Amo complex that I'd begun to develop on the night of the spanking. It took me years to admit it to anybody, but when the election day came, I deliberately did not vote to keep Labour in office. I had various private excuses. I lived in a part of London where Labour didn't need my franchise because it had long held the district as a rotten borough. Then, why should I swallow my vomit when Jerry Fitt and Frank McManus, the Irish MPs who'd made the difference in Parliament, had been unable to swallow theirs? On and on I went in my own mind, increasingly expert in self-persuasion. But in truth, I secretly knew quite well that I wasn't merely registering an abstention. I was, in effect, voting for Mrs. Thatcher, and I was secretly guiltily glad to see her terminating the long reign of mediocrity and torpor. On top of this, I was becoming increasingly aware that that other old Tory, Dr. Samuel Johnson, had been quite wrong when he pronounced that a man who was tired of London was tired of life. With me, it was, if anything, the reverse. If I was ever going, it was time for me to go.'